This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. And for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. GreenKRI.com. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. The Author's Preface. In which it is proved that, notwithstanding their names ending in O.S. and I.S., the heroes of the story which we are about to have the honour to relate to our readers have nothing mythological about them. A short time ago, while making researches in the Royal Library for my history of Louis the Fourteenth, I stumbled by chance upon the memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan, printed, as were most of the works of that period in which authors could not tell the truth without the risk of a residence more or less long in the Bastille, at Amsterdam by Pierre Rouge. The title attracted me. I took them home with me, with the permission of the guardian, and devoured them. It is not my intention here to enter into an analysis of this curious work, and I shall satisfy myself with referring such of my readers as appreciate the pictures of the period to its pages. They will therein find portraits penciled by the hand of a master, and although these squibs may be, for the most part, traced upon the doors of barracks and the walls of cabarets, they will not find the likenesses of Louis the Thirteenth, Anne of Austria, Richelieu, Mazarin, and the courtiers of the period, less faithful than in the history of Monsieur Anquety. But it is well known, what strikes the capricious mind of the poet is not always what affects the mass of readers. Now, while admiring, as others doubtless will admire, the details we have to relate, our main preoccupation concerned a matter to which no one before ourselves had given a thought. D'Artagnan relates that on his first visit to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the King's Musketeers, he met in the antechamber three young men, serving in the illustrious corps into which he was soliciting the honour of being received bearing the names of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. We must confess these three strange names struck us, and it immediately occurred to us that they were but pseudonyms under which D'Artagnan had disguised names, perhaps illustrious, or else that the bearers of these borrowed names had themselves chosen them on the day in which, from caprice, discontent, or want of fortune, they had donned the simple musketeer's uniform. From the moment we had no rest till we could find some trace in contemporary works of these extraordinary names which had so strongly awakened our curiosity. The catalogue alone of the books we read with this object would fill a whole chapter, which, although it might be very instructive, would certainly afford our readers but little amusement. It will suffice, then, to tell them that at the moment at which— discouraged by so many fruitless investigations, we were about to abandon our search, we at length found, guided by the counsels of our illustrious friend Paulin Paris, a manuscript in folio, endorsed 4,772, or 4,773, we do not recollect which, having for title Memoirs of the Comte de la Fere, touching some events which passed in France toward the end of the reign of King Louis the Thirteenth, and the commencement of the reign of King Louis the Fourteenth, It may be easily imagined how great was our joy when, in turning over this manuscript, our last hope, we found at the twentieth page the name of Athos, at the twenty-seventh the name of Porthos, and at the thirty-first the name of Aramis. The discovery of a completely unknown manuscript at a period in which historical science is carried to such a high degree appeared almost miraculous. We hastened, therefore, to obtain permission to print it, with the view of presenting ourselves some day with the pack of others at the doors of the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres. If we should not succeed, a very probable thing, by the by, in gaining admission to the Académie Française with our own proper pack. This permission, we feel bound to say, was graciously granted, 
which compels us here to give a public contradiction to the slanderers who pretend that we live under a government but moderately indulgent to men of letters. Now, this is the first part of this precious manuscript which we offer to our readers, restoring it to the title which belongs to it, and entering into an engagement that if, of which we have no doubt, this first part should obtain the success it merits. We will publish the second immediately. In the meanwhile, as the godfather is a second father, we beg the reader to lay to our account, and not to that of the Comte de la Fere, the pleasure, or the ennui, he may experience. This being understood, let us proceed with our history. End of the Author's Preface Chapter One of The Three Musketeers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter One The Three Presents of D'Artagnan the Elder. On the first Monday of the month of April, 1625, the market-town of Myung, in which the author of Romance of the Rose was born, appeared to be in as perfect a state of revolution as if the Huguenots had just made a second La Rochelle of it. Many citizens, seeing the women flying toward the high street, leaving their children crying at the open doors, hastened to don the cuirass, and supporting their somewhat uncertain courage with a musket or a partisan, directed their steps toward the hostelry of the jolly miller, before which was gathered, increasing every minute, a compact group, vociferous and full of curiosity. In those times panics were common, and few days passed without some city or other registering in its archives an event of this kind. There were nobles, who made war against each other. There was the king, who made war against the cardinal. There was Spain, which made war against the king. Then, in addition to these concealed or public, secret or open wars, there were robbers, mendicants, Huguenots, wolves, and scoundrels, who made war upon everybody. The citizens always took up arms readily against thieves, wolves, or scoundrels, often against nobles or Huguenots, sometimes against the king, but never against Cardinal or Spain. It resulted, then, from this habit that on the said first Monday of April, 1625, the citizens, on hearing the clamour, and seeing neither the red and yellow standard nor the livery of the Duc de Richelieu, rushed towards the hostel of the Jolly Miller. When arrived there, the cause of the hubbub was apparent to all. A young man, we can sketch his portrait at a dash. Imagine to yourself a Don Quixote of eighteen a Don Quixote without his corslet, without his coat of mail, without his cuisses, a Don Quixote clothed in a woollen doublet, the blue colour of which had faded into a nameless shade between lees of wine and a heavenly azure. Face long and brown, high cheekbones, a sign of sagacity. The maxillary muscles enormously developed an infallible sign by which a Gascon may always be detected, even without his cap. And our young man wore a cap, set off with a sort of feather. The eye open and intelligent, the nose hooked but finely chiselled, too big for a youth, too small for a grown man, an experienced eye might have taken him for a farmer's son upon a journey, had it not been for the long sword which, dangling from a leather baldric, hit against the calves of its owner as he walked, and against the rough side of his steed when he was on horseback. For our young man had a steed which was the observed of all observers. It was a barren pony, from twelve to fourteen years old, yellow in its hide, without a hair in its tail, but not without wind-galls on his legs, which, though going with his head lower than his knees, rendering a martingale quite unnecessary, contrived nevertheless to perform his eight leagues a day. 
Unfortunately, the qualities of this horse were so well concealed under his strange-coloured hide and his unaccountable gait, that at a time when everybody was a connoisseur in horse-flesh, the appearance of the aforesaid pony at Myung, which place he had entered about a quarter of an hour before by the gate of Beaugency, produced an unfavourable feeling, which extended to his rider. And this feeling had been more painfully perceived by young D'Artagnan, for so was the Don Quixote of this second Rosinante named, from his not being able to conceal from himself the ridiculous appearance that such a steed gave him, good horseman as he was. He had sighed deeply, therefore, when accepting the gift of the pony from Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder. He was not ignorant that such a beast was worth at least twenty livres, and the words which had accompanied the present were above all price. "'My son,' said the old Gascon gentleman, in that pure barren patois of which Henry the Fourth could never rid himself, "'this horse was born in the house of your father about thirteen years ago, and has remained in it ever since, which ought to make you love it. Never sell it. Allow it to die tranquilly and honourably of old age, and if you make a campaign with it, take as much care of it as you would of an old servant. At court, provided you have ever the honour to go there, continued Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder, an honour to which, remember, your ancient nobility gives you the right. Sustain worthily your name of gentleman, which has been worthily borne by your ancestors for five hundred years, both for your own sake and the sake of those who belong to you. By the latter I mean your relatives and friends. Endure nothing from any one except Monsieur the Cardinal and the King. It is by his courage, please observe, by his courage alone, that a gentleman can make his way nowadays. Whoever hesitates for a second perhaps allows the bait to escape which during that exact second fortune held out to him. You are young. You ought to be brave for two reasons. The first is that you are a Gascon, and the second is that you are my son. Never fear quarrels, but seek adventures. I have taught you how to handle a sword. You have thews of iron, a wrist of steel. Fight on all occasions. Fight the more for duels being forbidden, since consequently there is twice as much courage in fighting. I have nothing to give you, my son, but fifteen crowns, my horse, and the counsels you have just heard. Your mother will add to them a recipe for a certain balsam, which she had from a bohemian, and which has the miraculous virtue of curing all wounds that do not reach the heart. Take advantage of all, and live happily and long. I have but one word to add, and that is to propose an example to you. Not mine for I myself have never appeared at court, and have only taken part in religious wars as a volunteer. I speak of Monsieur de Treville, who was formerly my neighbour, and who had the honour to be, as a child, the playfellow of our King, Louis the Thirteenth, whom God preserve. Sometimes their play degenerated into battles, and in these battles the king was not always the stronger. The blows which he received increased greatly his esteem and friendship for Monsieur de Treville. Afterward, Monsieur de Treville fought with others. In his first journey to Paris, five times, from the death of the late king till the young one came of age, without reckoning wars and sieges, seven times and from that date up to the present day, a hundred times, perhaps. So that, in spite of edicts, ordinances, and decrees, there he is, captain of the musketeers, that is to say, chief of a legion of Caesars, whom the king holds in great esteem, and whom the cardinal dreads. 
he who dreads nothing as it is said still further monsieur de treville gains ten thousand crowns a year he is therefore a great noble he began as you begin go to him with this letter and make him your model in order that you may do as he has done upon which monsieur d'artagnan the elder girded his own sword round his son kissed him tenderly on both cheeks and gave him his benediction on leaving the paternal chamber the young man found his mother who was waiting for him with the famous recipe of which the counsels we have just repeated would necessitate frequent employment the adieu were on this side longer and more tender than they had been on the other not that m d'artagnan did not love his son who was his only offspring but m d'artagnan was a man and he would have considered it unworthy of a man to give away to his feelings whereas madame d'artagnan was a woman and still more a mother she wept abundantly and let us speak it to the praise of m d'artagnan the younger notwithstanding the efforts he made to remain firm as a future musketeer ought nature prevailed and he shed many tears of which he succumbed with great difficulty in concealing the half the same day the young man set forward on his journey furnished with the three paternal gifts which consisted as we have said of fifteen crowns the horse and the letter from m de treville the counsels being thrown into the bargain with such a vade mecum d'artagnan was morally and physically an exact copy of the hero of cervantes to whom we so happily compared him when our duty of an historian placed us under the necessity of sketching his portrait don quixote took windmills for giants and sheep for armies d'artagnan took every smile for an insult and every look as a provocation whence it resulted that from tarbes to Myung his fist was constantly doubled or his hand on the hilt of his sword and yet the fist did not descend upon any jaw nor did the sword issue from its scabbard it was not that the sight of the wretched pony did not excite numerous smiles on the countenances of passers-by but as against the side of this pony rattled a sword of respectable length and as over this sword gleamed an eye rather ferocious than haughty these passers-by repressed their hilarity or if hilarity prevailed over prudence they endeavoured to laugh only on one side like the masks of the ancients d'artagnan then remained majestic and intact in his susceptibility till he came to this unlucky city of myung but there as he was alighting from his horse at the gate of the jolly miller without any one host waiter or hostler coming to hold his stirrup or take his horse d'artagnan spied through an open window on the ground floor a gentleman well made and of good carriage although of rather a stern countenance talking with two persons who appeared to listen to him with respect d'artagnan fancied quite naturally according to his custom that he must be the object of their conversation and listened this time d'artagnan was only in part mistaken he himself was not in question but his horse was the gentleman appeared to be enumerating all his qualities to his auditors and as i have said the auditors seemed to have great deference for the narrator they every moment burst into fits of laughter now as a half smile was sufficient to awaken the irascibility of the young man the effect produced upon him by this vociferous mirth may be easily imagined nevertheless d'artagnan was desirous of examining the appearance of this impertinent personage who ridiculed him he fixed his haughty eye upon the stranger and perceived a man of from forty to forty-five years of age with black and piercing eyes pale complexion a strongly marked nose and a black and well-shaped moustache he was dressed in a doublet and hose of a violet colour with aiguillettes of the same colour without any other ornaments than the customary slashes through which the shirt appeared this doublet and hose though new were creased like travelling clothes for a long time packed in a portmanteau 
D'Artagnan made all these remarks with the rapidity of a most minute observer, and doubtless from an instinctive feeling that this stranger was destined to have a great influence over his future life. Now, as at the moment in which D'Artagnan fixed his eyes upon the gentleman in the violet doublet, the gentleman made one of his most knowing and profound remarks respecting the Bayonneer's pony. His two auditors laughed even louder than before, and he himself, though contrary to his custom, allowed a pale smile, if I may be allowed to use such an expression, to stray over his countenance. This time there could be no doubt d'artagnan was really insulted full then of this conviction he pulled his cap down over his eyes and endeavouring to copy some of the court airs he had picked up in gascony among young travelling nobles he advanced with one hand on the hilt of his sword and the other resting on his hip unfortunately as he advanced his anger increased at every step and instead of the proper and lofty speech he had prepared as a prelude to his challenge, he found nothing at the tip of his tongue but a gross personality which he accompanied with a furious gesture. "'I say, sir, you, sir, who are hiding yourself behind that shutter, yes, you, sir, tell me what you are laughing at, and we will laugh together.' The gentleman raised his eyes slowly from the nag to his cavalier, as if he required some time to ascertain whether it could be to him that such strange reproaches were addressed. Then, when he could not possibly entertain any doubt of the matter, his eyebrows slightly bent, and with an accent of irony and insolence impossible to be described, he replied to D'Artagnan, "'I was not speaking to you, sir.' "'But I am speaking to you,' replied the young man, additionally exasperated with this mixture of insolence and good manners, of politeness and scorn. The stranger looked at him again with a slight smile, and, retiring from the window, came out of the hostelry with a slow step, and placed himself before the horse, within two paces of D'Artagnan. His quiet manner and the ironical expression of his countenance redoubled the mirth of the persons with whom he had been talking and who still remained at the window. D'Artagnan, seeing him approach, drew his sword a foot out of the scabbard. "'This horse is decidedly, or rather has been in his youth, a buttercup,' resumed the stranger, continuing the remarks he had begun, and addressing himself to his auditors at the window, without paying the least attention to the exasperation of D'Artagnan, who, however, placed himself between him and them. It is a color very well known in botany, but till the present time very rare among horses. There are people who laugh at the horse that would not dare to laugh at the master, cried the young emulator of the furious Treville. I do not often laugh, sir, replied the stranger, as you may perceive by the expression of my countenance, but nevertheless I retain the privilege of laughing when I please. "'And I,' cried D'Artagnan, "'will allow no man to laugh when it displeases me.' "'Indeed, sir,' continued the stranger, more calm than ever, "'well, that is perfectly right.' And turning on his heel, was about to re-enter the hostelry by the front gate, beneath which D'Artagnan on arriving had observed a saddled horse. But D'Artagnan was not of a character to allow a man to escape him thus who had the insolence to ridicule him. He drew his sword entirely from the scabbard, and followed him, crying, "'Turn, turn, Master Joker, lest I strike you behind!' "'Strike me,' said the other, turning on his heels, and surveying the young man with as much astonishment as contempt. "'Why, my good fellow, you must be mad then, in a suppressed tone, as if speaking to himself. "'This is annoying,' continued he. "'What a godsend this would be for His Majesty, who is seeking everywhere for brave fellows to recruit for his musketeers.' He had scarcely finished, when D'Artagnan made such a furious lunge at him, that if he had not sprung nimbly backward it is probable he would have jested for the last time. The stranger, then perceiving that the matter went beyond raillery, drew his sword, 
saluted his adversary, and seriously placed himself on guard. But at the same moment his two auditors, accompanied by the host, fell upon D'Artagnan with sticks, shovels, and tongs. This caused so rapid and complete a diversion from the attack that D'Artagnan's adversary, while the latter turned round to face this shower of blows, sheathed his sword with the same precision, and instead of an actor, which he had nearly been, became a spectator of the fight, a part in which he acquitted himself with his usual impassiveness, muttering nevertheless, A plague upon these Gascons! Replace him on his orange horse, and let him be gone. "'Not before I have killed you, poltroon!' cried D'Artagnan, making the best face possible, and never retreating one step before his three assailants, who continued to shower blows upon him. "'Another Gasconade!' murmured the gentleman. "'By my honour these Gascons are incorrigible. Keep up the dance, then, since he will have it so. When he is tired he will perhaps tell us that he has had enough of it.' But the stranger knew not the headstrong personage he had to do with. D'Artagnan was not the man ever to cry for quarter. The fight was therefore prolonged for some seconds, but at length D'Artagnan dropped his sword, which was broken in two pieces by the blow of a stick. Another blow full upon his forehead at the same moment brought him to the ground, covered with blood and almost fainting. It was at this moment that people came flocking to the scene of action from all sides. The host, fearful of consequences, with the help of his servants carried the wounded man into the kitchen, where some trifling attentions were bestowed upon him. As to the gentleman, he resumed his place at the window, and surveyed the crowd with a certain impatience, evidently annoyed by their remaining undispersed. "'Well, how is it with this madman?' exclaimed he, turning round as the noise of the door announced the entrance of the host who came in to inquire if he was unhurt. "'Your Excellency is safe and sound?' asked the host. "'Oh, yes, perfectly safe and sound, my good host, and I wish to know what has become of our young man.' "'He is better,' said the host. "'He fainted quite away.' "'Indeed,' said the gentleman. "'But before he fainted he collected all his strength to challenge you, and to defy you while challenging you.' "'Why, this fellow must be the devil in person!' cried the stranger. "'Oh, no, Your Excellency, he is not the devil,' replied the host, with a grin of contempt. "'For during his fainting we rummaged his valise, and found nothing but a clean shirt and eleven crowns, which, however, did not prevent his saying, as he was fainting, that if such a thing had happened in Paris you should have caused to repent of it at a later period.' "'Then,' said the stranger coolly, he must be some prince in disguise. "'I have told you this, good sir,' resumed the host, "'in order that you may be on your guard.' "'Did he name no one in his passion?' "'Yes, he struck his pocket, and said, "'We shall see what Monsieur de Treville will think of this insult offered to his protégé.' "'Monsieur de Treville,' said the stranger, becoming attentive. He put his hand upon his pocket while pronouncing the name of Monsieur de Treville. Now, my dear host, while your young man was insensible, you did not fail, I am quite sure, to ascertain what that pocket contained. What was there in it? A letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the musketeers. Indeed! Exactly as I have the honour to tell your excellency. The host, who was not endowed with great perspicacity, did not observe the expression which his words had given to the physiognomy of the stranger. The latter rose from the front of the window, upon the sill of which he had leaned with his elbow, and knitted his brow like a man disquieted. "'The devil!' murmured he, between his teeth. "'Can Treville have set this Gascon upon me? He is very young.' but a sword-thrust is a sword-thrust, whatever be the age of him who gives it, and a youth is less to be suspected than an older man." And the stranger fell into a reverie which lasted some minutes. A weak obstacle is sometimes sufficient to overthrow a great design. "'Host,' said he, "'could you not contrive to get rid of this frantic boy for me? In conscience I cannot kill him 
and yet added he with a coldly menacing expression he annoys me where is he in my wife's chamber on the first flight where they are dressing his wounds his things and his bag are with him has he taken off his doublet on the contrary everything is in the kitchen but if he annoys you this young fool to be sure he does he causes a disturbance in your hostelry which respectable people cannot put up with go make out my bill and notify my servant what monsieur will you leave us so soon you know that very well as i gave my order to saddle my horse have they not obeyed me it is done as your excellency may have observed your horse is in the great gateway already saddled for your departure that is well do as i have directed you then what the devil said the host to himself can he be afraid of this boy but an imperious glance from the stranger stopped him short he bowed humbly and retired it is not necessary for milady to be seen by this fellow continued the stranger now here a footnote we are well aware that this term milady is only properly used when followed by a family name but we find it thus in the manuscript and we do not choose to take upon ourselves to alter it end of the footnote she will soon pass she is already late i had better get on horseback and go and meet her i should like however to know what this letter addressed to treville contains and the stranger muttering to himself directed his steps toward the kitchen in the meantime the host who entertained no doubt that it was the presence of the young man that drove the stranger from his hostelry reascended to his wife's chamber and found d'artagnan just recovering his senses giving him to understand that the police would deal with him pretty severely for having sought a quarrel with a great lord for the opinion of the host the stranger could be nothing less than a great lord he insisted that notwithstanding his weakness d'artagnan should get up and depart as quickly as possible d'artagnan half stupefied without his doublet and with his head bound up in a linen cloth arose then and urged by the host began to descend the stairs but on arriving at the kitchen the first thing he saw was his antagonist talking calmly at the step of a heavy carriage drawn by two large norman horses his interlocutor whose head appeared through the carriage window was a woman of from twenty to two and twenty years we have already observed with what rapidity d'artagnan sees the expression of a countenance he perceived then at a glance that this woman was young and beautiful and her style of beauty struck him more forcibly from its being totally different from that of the southern countries in which d'artagnan had hitherto resided she was pale and fair with long curls falling in profusion over her shoulders had large blue languishing eyes rosy lips and hands of alabaster she was talking with great animation with the stranger his eminence then orders me said the lady to return instantly to london and to inform him as soon as the duke leaves london and as to my other instructions asked the fair traveller they are contained in this box which you will not open until you are on the other side of the channel very well and you what will you do i i return to paris what without chastising this insolent boy asked the lady the stranger was about to reply but at the moment he opened his mouth d'artagnan who had heard all precipitated himself over the threshold of the door this insolent boy chastises others cried he and i hope that this time he whom he ought to chastise will not escape him as before will not escape him replied the stranger knitting his brow no before a woman you would not dare fly i presume remember said milady seeing the stranger lay his hand on his sword the least delay may ruin everything you are right cried the gentleman be gone then on your part and i will depart as quickly on mine and bowing to the lady sprang into his saddle 
while her coachman applied his whip vigorously to his horses. The two interlocutors thus separated, taking opposite directions, at full gallop. "'Pay him, booby!' cried the stranger to his servant, without checking the speed of his horse, and the man, after throwing two or three silver pieces at the foot of mine host, galloped after his master. "'Base coward! False gentleman!' cried D'Artagnan, springing forward, in his turn, after the servant but his wound had rendered him too weak to support such an exertion. Scarcely had he gone ten steps when his ears began to tingle. A faintness seized him, a cloud of blood passed over his eyes, and he fell in the middle of the street, crying still, "'Coward! Coward! Coward!' "'He is coward indeed,' grumbled the host, drawing near to D'Artagnan, and endeavouring by this little flattery to make up matters with the young man as the heron of the fable did with the snail he had despised the evening before. "'Yes, a base coward,' murmured D'Artagnan. "'But she, she was very beautiful.' "'What she?' demanded the host. "Milady," faltered D'Artagnan, and fainted a second time. "'Ah, it's all one,' said the host. "'I've lost two customers, but this one remains.' of whom I am pretty certain for some days to come, there will be eleven crowns gained." It is to remember that eleven crowns was just the sum that remained in D'Artagnan's purse. The host had reckoned upon eleven days of confinement at a crown a day, but he had reckoned without his guest. On the following morning at five o'clock D'Artagnan arose, and, descending to the kitchen without help, asked, among other ingredients, the list of which has not come down to us, for some oil, some wine, and some rosemary, and with his mother's recipe in his hand composed a balsam, with which he anointed his numerous wounds, replacing his bandages himself, and positively refusing the assistance of any doctor, D'Artagnan walked about that same evening, and was almost cured by the morrow. But when the time came to pay for his rosemary, this oil, and the wine, the only expense the master had incurred, as he had preserved a strict abstinence, while on the contrary the yellow horse, by the account of the hostler at least, had eaten three times as much as a horse of his size could reasonably suppose to have done. D'Artagnan found nothing in his pocket but his little old velvet purse with the eleven crowns it contained, for as to the letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, it had disappeared. The young man commenced his search for the letter with the greatest patience, turning out his pockets of all kinds over and over again, rummaging and re-rummaging in his valise, and opening and reopening his purse. But when he found that he had come to the conviction that the letter was not to be found, he flew for the third time, into such a rage as was near costing him a fresh consumption of wine, oil, and rosemary. For upon seeing this hot-headed youth become exasperated, and threatened to destroy everything in the establishment if his letter was not found, the host seized a spit, his wife a broom-handle, and the servants the same sticks they had used the day before. "'My letter of recommendation!' cried D'Artagnan. "'My letter of recommendation! Or the holy blood I will spit you all like ortolans!' Unfortunately, there was one circumstance which created a powerful obstacle to the accomplishment of this threat, which was, as we have related, that his sword had been in his first conflict broken in two, and which he had entirely forgotten. Hence it resulted when D'Artagnan proceeded to draw his sword in earnest, he found himself purely and simply armed with a stump of a sword about eight or ten inches in length, which the host had carefully placed in the scabbard. As to the rest of the blade, the master had slyly put that on one side, to make himself a larding-pin. But this deception would probably not have stopped our fiery young man if the host had not reflected that the reclamation which his guest made was perfectly just. "'But after all,' said he, lowering the point of his spit, "'where is this letter?' "'Yes, where is this letter?' cried D'Artagnan. In the first place I warn you that that letter is for Monsieur de Treville, and it must be found. He will know how to find it." His threat completed the intimidation of the host. After the king and the cardinal, 
Monsieur de Treville was the man whose name was perhaps most frequently repeated by the military, and even by citizens. There was, to be sure, Father Joseph, but his name was never pronounced but with a subdued voice, such was the terror inspired by his grey eminence, as the cardinal's familiar was called. Throwing down his spit, and ordering his wife to do the same with her broom-handle, and the servants with their sticks, he set the first example of commencing an earnest search for the lost letter. "'Does the letter contain anything valuable?' demanded the host, after a few minutes of useless investigation. "'Zounds! I think it does indeed!' cried the Gascon, who had reckoned upon this letter for making his way at court. "'It contained my fortune!' "'Bills upon Spain?' asked the disturbed host. "'Bills upon His Majesty's private treasury,' answered D'Artagnan, who, reckoning upon entering into the King's service in consequence of this recommendation, believed he could make this somewhat hazardous reply without telling of a falsehood. "'The devil!' cried the host at his wit's end. "'But it's of no importance,' continued D'Artagnan, with natural assurance, it's of no importance. The money is nothing. That letter was everything. I would rather have lost a thousand pistoles than have lost it. He would not have risked more if he had said twenty thousand, but a certain juvenile modesty restrained him. A ray of light all at once broke upon the mind of the host as he was giving himself to the devil upon finding nothing. "'That letter is not lost!' cried he. "'What?' cried D'Artagnan. No, it has been stolen from you. Stolen? By whom? By the gentleman who was here yesterday. He came down into the kitchen, where your doublet was. He remained there some time alone. I would lay a wager he has stolen it. Do you think so? answered D'Artagnan, but little convinced, as he knew better than any one else how entirely personal the value of this letter was, and was nothing in it likely to tempt cupidity. The fact was that none of his servants, none of the travellers present, could have gained anything by being possessed of this paper. "'Do you say,' resumed D'Artagnan, "'that you suspect that impertinent gentleman?' "'I tell you I am sure of it,' continued the host. "'When I informed him that your lordship was the protégé of Monsieur de Treville, and that you even had a letter for that illustrious gentleman, he appeared to be very much disturbed.' and asked me where that letter was, and immediately came down into the kitchen where he knew your doublet was. "'Then that's my thief,' replied D'Artagnan. "'I will complain to Monsieur de Treville, and Monsieur de Treville will complain to the King.' He then drew two crowns majestically from his purse, and gave them to the host, who accompanied him, cap in hand, to the gate and remounted his yellow horse, which bore him without any further accident to the gate of St. Antoine at Paris, where his owner sold him for three crowns, which was a very good price, considering that D'Artagnan had ridden him hard during the last stage. Thus the dealer to whom D'Artagnan sold him for the nine livres did not conceal from the young man that he only gave that enormous sum for him on the account of the originality of his colour. Thus D'Artagnan entered Paris on foot, carrying his little packet under his arm, and walked about till he found an apartment to be let on terms suited to the scantiness of his means. This chamber was a sort of garret, situated in the Rue des Fessoyeurs, near the Luxembourg. As soon as the earnest money was paid, D'Artagnan took possession of his lodging, and passed the remainder of the day in sewing on to his doublet and hose some ornamental braiding which his mother had taken off an almost new doublet of the elder Monsieur d'Artagnan, and which she had given her son secretly. Next he went to the Quai de Ferraille to have a new blade put to his sword, and then returned toward the Louvre, inquiring of the first musketeer he met for the situation of the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, which proved to be in the Rue de Vieux Colombier that is to say, in the immediate vicinity of the chamber hired by D'Artagnan, a circumstance which appeared to furnish a happy augury for the success of his journey. After this, satisfied with the way in which he had conducted himself at Meung, without remorse for the past, confident in the present, and full of hope for the future, 
he retired to bed and slept the sleep of the brave. This sleep, provincial as it was, brought him to nine o'clock in the morning, at which hour he rose, in order to repair to the residence of Monsieur de Treville, the third personage in the kingdom, in the paternal estimation. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 2 The Antechamber of Monsieur de Treville. Monsieur de Troisville, as his family was still called in Gascony, or Monsieur de Treville, as he has ended by styling himself in Paris, had really commenced life as D'Artagnan now did, that is to say, without a sou in his pocket, but with a fund of audacity, shrewdness, and intelligence which makes the poorest Gascon gentleman often derive more in his hope from the paternal inheritance than the richest Perigordian or Barican gentleman derives in reality from his. His insolent bravery, his still more insolent success at a time when blows poured down like hail, had borne him to the top of that difficult ladder, called court favor, which he had climbed four steps at a time. He was the friend of the king, who honored highly, as every one knows, the memory of his father, Henry the Fourth. The father of Monsieur de Treville had served him so faithfully in his wars against the League that in default of money, a thing to which the Baroness was accustomed all his life, and who constantly paid his debts with that of which he never stood in need of borrowing, that is to say, with ready wit, in default of money, we repeat, he authorized him, after the reduction of Paris, to assume for his arms a golden lion passant upon gules, with the motto, Fidelis et Fortis. This was a great matter in the way of honor, but very little in the way of wealth, so that when the illustrious companion of the great Henry died, the only inheritance he was able to leave his son was his sword and his motto. Thanks to this double gift, and the spotless name that accompanied it, Monsieur de Treville was admitted into the household of the young prince where he made such good use of his sword, and was so faithful to his motto, that Louis the Thirteenth, one of the good blades of his kingdom, was accustomed to say that if he had a friend who was about to fight, he would advise him to choose as a second, himself first, and Treville next, or even perhaps before himself. Thus Louis the Thirteenth had a real liking for Treville, a royal liking, a self-interested liking, it is true, but still a liking. At that unhappy period it was an important consideration to be surrounded by such men as Treville. Many might take for their device the epithet strong, which formed the second part of his motto, but very few gentlemen could lay claim to the faithful, which constituted the first. Treville was one of these latter. His was one of those rare organizations endowed with an obedient intelligence like that of the dog, with a blind valor, a quick eye, and a prompt hand, to whom sight appeared only to be given to see if the king was dissatisfied with any one, and the hand to strike this displeasing personage, whether a Besme, a Morever, a Potiotomer, or a Vitry. In short, up to this period nothing had been wanting to Treville but opportunity, but he was ever on the watch for it and he faithfully promised himself that he would not fail to seize it by its three hairs whenever it came within reach of his hand. At last Louis the Thirteenth made Treville the captain of his musketeers, who were to Louis the Thirteenth in devotedness, or rather in fanaticism, what his ordinaries had been to Henry the Third, and his Scotch guard to Louis the Eleventh. On his part, the cardinal was not behind the king in this respect. 
when he saw the formidable and chosen body with which Louis the Thirteenth had surrounded himself, this second, or rather this first king of France, became desirous that he too should have his guard. He had his musketeers, therefore, as Louis the Thirteenth had his, and these two powerful rivals vied with each other in procuring, not only from all the provinces of France, but even from all foreign states, the most celebrated swordsman. It was not uncommon for Richelieu and Louis the Thirteenth to dispute over their evening game of chess upon the merits of their servants. Each boasted the bearing and the courage of his own people. While exclaiming loudly against duels and brawls, they excited them secretly to quarrel, deriving an immoderate satisfaction, or genuine regret, from the success or defeat of their own combatants. We learn this from the memoirs of a man who was concerned in some few of these defeats, and in many of these victories. Treville had grasped the weak side of his master, and it was to this address that he owed the long and constant favour of a king who has not left the reputation behind him of being very faithful in his friendships. He paraded his musketeers before the Cardinal Armand du Plessis, with an insolent air which made the grey moustache of his eminence curl with ire. Treville understood admirably the war method of that period, in which he, who could not live at the expense of the enemy, must live at the expense of his compatriots. His soldiers formed a legion of devil-may-care fellows, perfectly undisciplined toward all but himself. Loose, half-drunk, imposing, the king's musketeers, or rather Monsieur de Treville's, spread themselves about in the cabarets, in the public walks, and the public sports, shouting, twisting their moustaches, clanking their swords, and taking great pleasure in annoying the guards of the cardinal whenever they could fall in with them. Then, drawing in the open streets, as if it were the best of all possible sports, sometimes killed, but sure in that case to be both wept and avenged, often killing others, but then certain of not rotting in prison, Monsieur de Treville being there to claim them. Thus Monsieur de Treville was praised to the highest note by these men, who adored him, and who, ruffians as they were, trembled before him like scholars before their master, obedient to his least word, and ready to sacrifice themselves to wash out the smallest insult. Monsieur de Treville employed this powerful weapon for the king in the first place, and the friends of the king, and then for himself and his own friends. For the rest, in the memoirs of this period, which have left so many memoirs, one does not find this worthy gentleman blamed even by his enemies, and he had many such among men of the pen, as well as among men of the sword. In no instance, let us say, was this worthy gentleman accused of deriving personal advantage from the cooperation of his minions. Endowed with a rare genius for intrigue, which rendered him the equal of the ablest intriguers, he remained an honest man. Still further, in spite of sword thrusts which weaken, and painful exercises which fatigue, he had become one of the most gallant frequenters of revels, one of the most insinuating ladies' men, one of the softest whisperers of interesting nothings of his day. The bon fortune of de Treville were talked of as those of Monsieur de Bassompierre had been talked of twenty years before, and that was not saying a little. The captain of the musketeers was therefore admired, feared, and loved, and this constitutes the zenith of human fortune. Louis the Fourteenth absorbed all the smaller stars of his court in his own vast radiance, but his father, a son pluribus impar, left his personal splendour to each of his favourites his individual value to each of his courtiers. In addition to the leaves of the king and the cardinal, there might be reckoned in Paris at that time more than two hundred smaller but still noteworthy leaves. Among these two hundred leaves that of Treville was one of the most sought. The court of his hotel, situated in the Rue de Vieux Colombier, 
resembled a camp from by six o'clock in the morning in summer and eight o'clock in winter. From fifty to sixty musketeers, who appeared to replace one another in order always to present an imposing number, paraded constantly, armed to the teeth and ready for anything. On one of these immense staircases, upon whose space modern civilizations would build a whole house, ascended and descended the office-seekers of Paris, who ran after any sort of favour, gentlemen from the provinces anxious to be enrolled, and servants in all sorts of liveries bringing and carrying messages between their masters and Monsieur de Treville. In the antechamber, upon long circular benches, reposed the elect, that is to say, those who were called. In this apartment a continued buzzing prevailed from morning till night, while M. de Treville, in his office contiguous to this antechamber, received visits, listened to complaints, gave his orders, and like the king in his balcony at the Louvre, had only to place himself at the window to review both his men and arms. The day on which D'Artagnan presented himself the assemblage was imposing, particularly for a provincial just arriving from his province. It is true that this provincial was a Gascon, and that, particularly at this period, the compatriots of D'Artagnan had the reputation of not being easily intimidated. When he had once passed the massive door covered with long square-headed nails, he fell into the midst of a troop of swordsmen, who crossed one another in their passage, calling out, quarrelling, and playing tricks one with another. In order to make one's way amid these turbulent and conflicting waves, it was necessary to be an officer, a great noble, or a pretty woman. It was then, into the midst of this tumult and disorder, that our young man advanced with a beating heat, ranging his long rapier up his lanky leg, and keeping one hand on the edge of his cap, with that half-smile of the embarrassed, a provincial who wishes to put on a good face. When he had passed one group he began to breathe more freely, but he could not help observing that they turned round to look at him, and for the first time in his life D'Artagnan, who had till that day entertained a very good opinion of himself, felt ridiculous. Arrived at the staircase it was still worse. There were four musketeers on the bottom steps, amusing themselves with the following exercise, while ten or twelve of their comrades waited upon the landing-place to take their turn in the sport. One of them, stationed upon the top stair, naked sword in hand, prevented, or at least endeavoured to prevent, the three others from ascending. These three others fenced against him with their agile swords. D'Artagnan at first took these weapons for foils, and believed them to be buttoned, but he soon perceived by certain scratches that every weapon was pointed and sharpened, and that at each of these scratches not only the spectators, but even the actors themselves, laughed like so many madmen. He who at the moment occupied the upper step kept his adversaries marvellously in check. A circle was formed around them. The conditions required that at every hit the man touched should quit the game, yielding his turn for the benefit of the adversary who had hit him. In five minutes three were slightly wounded, one on the hand, another on the ear, by the defender of the stair, who himself remained intact, a piece of skill which was worth to him, according to the rules agreed upon, three turns of favour. However difficult it might be, or rather as he pretended it was, to astonish our young traveller, this pastime really astonished him. He had seen in his province, that land in which heads became so easily heated, a few of the preliminaries of duels, but the daring of these four fencers appeared to him the strongest he had ever heard of even in Gascony. He believed himself transported into that famous country of giants into which Gulliver afterward went and was so frightened, and yet he had not gained the goal, for there was still the landing-place and the antechamber. On the landing they were no longer fighting, but amused themselves with stories about women, and in the antechamber with stories about the court. On the landing D'Artagnan blushed, in the antechamber he trembled. His warm and fickle imagination, 
which in Gascony had rendered formidable to young chambermaids, and even sometimes their mistresses, had never dreamed, even in the moments of delirium, of half the amorous wonders, or a quarter of the feats of gallantry which were here set forth in connection with names the best known, and with details the least concealed. But if his morals were shocked on the landing, his respect for the cardinal was scandalized in the antechamber. There, to his great astonishment, D'Artagnan heard the policy which made all Europe tremble, criticized aloud and openly, as well as the private life of the cardinal, which so many great nobles have been punished for trying to pry into. That great man, who was so revered by D'Artagnan the Elder, served as an object of ridicule to the musketeers of Treville, who cracked their jokes upon his bandy legs and his crooked back. Some sang ballads about Mademoiselle d'Anguillon, his mistress, and Mademoiselle Combalet, his niece, while others formed parties and plans to annoy the pages and guards of the Cardinal Duke, all things which appeared to D'Artagnan monstrous impossibilities. Nevertheless, when the name of the king was now and then uttered unthinkingly amid all these cardinal jests, a sort of gag seemed to close for a moment on all those jeering mouths. They looked hesitating around them, and appeared to doubt the thickness of the partition between them and the office of Monsieur de Treville. But a fresh allusion soon brought back the conversation to his eminence, and then the laughter recovered its loudness, and the light was not withheld from any of his actions. Certes, these fellows will all either be imprisoned or hanged, thought the terrified D'Artagnan, and I no doubt with them, for from the moment I have either listened to or heard them, I shall be held as an accomplice. What would my good father say, who so strongly pointed out to me the respect due to the cardinal, if he knew I was in the society of such pagans? We have no need, therefore, to say that D'Artagnan dared not join in the conversation. Only he looked with all his eyes and listened with all his ears, stretching his five senses so as to lose nothing. And despite his confidence on the paternal admonitions, he felt himself carried by his tastes and led by his instincts to praise rather than to blame the unheard-of things which were taking place. Although he was a perfect stranger in the court of Monsieur de Treville's courtiers, and this his first appearance in that place, he was at length noticed, and somebody came and asked him what he wanted. At this demand D'Artagnan gave his name very modestly, emphasized the title of compatriot, and begged the servant who had put the question to him to request a moment's audience of Monsieur de Treville a request which the other, with an air of protection, promised to transmit in due season. D'Artagnan, a little recovered from his first surprise, had now leisure to study costumes and physiognomy. The centre of the most animated group was a musketeer of great height and haughty countenance, dressed in a costume so peculiar as to attract general attention. He did not wear the uniform cloak which was not obligatory at that epoch of less liberty but more independence, but a cerulean blue doublet, a little faded and worn, and over this a magnificent baldric, worked in gold, which shone like water ripples in the sun. A long cloak of crimson velvet fell in graceful folds from his shoulders, disclosing in front the splendid baldric, from which was suspended a gigantic rapier. This musketeer had just come off guard, complained of having a cold, and coughed from time to time affectedly. It was for this reason, as he said to those around him, that he had put on his cloak, and while he spoke with a lofty air, and twisted his moustache disdainfully, all admired his embroidered baldric, and D'Artagnan more than any one. "'What would you have?' said the musketeer. This fashion is coming in. It is a folly, I admit, but still it is the fashion. Besides, one must lay out one's inheritance somehow. Ah, Porthos! cried one of his companions. Don't try to make us believe you obtained that baldric by paternal generosity. 
It was given to you by that veiled lady I met you with the other Sunday, near the gate St. Honor. No, upon honour and by the faith of a gentleman, I bought it with the contents of my own purse, answered he, who they designated by the name Porthos. Yes, about in the same manner, said another musketeer, that I bought this new purse with what my mistress put into the old one. It's true, though, said Porthos, and the proof is that I paid twelve pistoles for it. The wonder was increased, though the doubt continued to exist. "'Is it not true, Aramis?' said Porthos, turning toward another musketeer. This other musketeer formed a perfect contrast to his interrogator, who had just designated him by the name of Aramis. He was a stout man, of about two or three and twenty, with an open, ingenuous countenance, a black, mild eye, and cheeks rosy and downy as an autumn peach. His delicate moustache marked a perfectly straight line upon his upper lip. He appeared to dread to lower his hands lest their veins should swell, and he pinched the tips of his ears from time to time to preserve their delicate pink transparency. Habitually he spoke little and slowly, bowed frequently, laughed without noise, showing his teeth, which were fine, and which, as the rest of his person, he appeared to take great care. He answered the appeal of his friend by an affirmative nod of the head. This affirmation appeared to dispel all doubts with regard to the baldric. They continued to admire it, but said no more about it, and with a rapid change of thought the conversation passed suddenly to another object. "'What do you think of the story Chalet's Esquire relates?' asked another musketeer, without addressing any one in particular, but on the contrary speaking to everybody. "'And what does he say?' asked Porthos, in a self-sufficient tone. "'He relates that he met at Brussels Rochefort, the M. Damne of the Cardinal disguised as a Capuchin, and that this cursed Rochefort, thanks to his disguise, had tricked Monsieur de Lague like a ninny as he is. "'A ninny, indeed,' said Porthos. "'But is the matter certain?' "'I had it from Aramis,' replied the musketeer. "'Indeed!' "'Why, you know it, Porthos,' said Aramis. "'I told you of it yesterday. Let us say no more about it.' "'Say no more about it. That's your opinion,' replied Porthos. "'Say no more about it. Peste! You come to your conclusions quickly. What? The cardinal sets a spy upon a gentleman? Has his letters stolen from him by means of a traitor, a brigand, a rascal has, with the help of this spy? And thanks to this correspondence, Chalet's throat cut?' under the stupid pretext that he wanted to kill the king and marry monsieur to the queen. Nobody knew a word of this enigma. You unraveled it yesterday to the great satisfaction of all, and while we are still gaping with wonder at the news, you come and tell us to-day, let us say no more about it. Well, then, let us talk about it, since you desire it, replied Aramis patiently. "'This Rochefort,' cried Porthos, "'if I were the Esquire pour Chalet, "'should pass a minute or two very uncomfortably with me. "'And you, you would pass rather a sad quarter-hour "'with the Red Duke,' replied Aramis. "'Oh, the Red Duke! Bravo, bravo, the Red Duke!' cried Porthos, "'clapping his hands and nodding his head. "'The Red Duke is capital. "'I'll circulate that saying, be assured.' my dear fellow, who says this Aramis is not a wit? What a misfortune it is that you do not follow your first vocation! What a delicious abbey you would have made! Oh, it's only a temporary postponement, replied Aramis. I shall be one some day. You very well know, Porthos, that I continue to study theology for that purpose." "'He will be one, as he says,' cried Porthos. "'He will be one, sooner or later.' "'Sooner,' said Aramis. "'He only waits for one thing to determine him to resume his cassock, which hangs behind his uniform,' said another musketeer. "'What is he waiting for?' 
asked another. "'Only till the king has given an heir to the crown of France.' "'No jesting upon that subject, gentlemen,' said Porthos. "'Thank God the queen is still of an age to give one.' "'They say that Monsieur de Buckingham is in France,' replied Aramis, with a significant smile which gave to this sentence, apparently so simple, a tolerably scandalous meaning. "'Aramis, my good friend, this time you are wrong.' interrupted Porthos. Your wit is always leading you beyond bounds. If Monsieur de Treville heard you, you would repent of speaking thus. "'Are you going to give me a lesson, Porthos?' cried Aramis, from whose usually mild eye a flash passed like lightning. "'My dear fellow, be a musketeer or an abbe, be one or the other, but not both,' replied Porthos. "'You know what Athos told you the other day.' You eat at everybody's mess. Ah, don't be angry, I beg of you. That would be useless. You know what is agreed upon between you, Athos, and me. You go to Madame of D'Aguillon's, and you pay your court to her. You go to Madame de Bois Tracy's, the cousin of Madame de Chevreuse, and you pass for being far advanced in the good graces of that lady. Oh, good Lord, don't trouble yourself to reveal your good luck. No one asks for your secret. All the world knows your discretion. But since you possess that virtue, why the devil don't you make use of it with respect to Her Majesty? Let whoever likes talk of the King and the Cardinal, and how he likes. But the Queen is sacred, and if any one speaks of her, let it be respectfully. Porthos, you are as vain as Narcissus, I plainly tell you so, replied Aramis. You know I hate moralizing, except when it is done by Athos. As to you, good sir, you wear too magnificent a baldric to be strong on that head. I will be an abbe if it suits me. In the meanwhile I am a musketeer. In that quality I say what I please, and at this moment it pleases me to say that you weary me. Aramis! Porthos! Gentlemen, gentlemen! cried the surrounding group. "'Monsieur de Treville awaits Monsieur d'Artagnan,' cried a servant, throwing open the door of the cabinet. At this announcement, during which the door remained open, every one became mute, and amid the general silence the young man crossed part of the length of the antechamber, and entered the apartment of the captain of the musketeers, congratulating himself with all his heart at having so narrowly escaped the end of this strange quarrel." End of chapter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 3 The Audience. Monsieur de Treville was at the moment in rather ill humour. Nevertheless, he saluted the young man politely, who bowed to the very ground, and he smiled on receiving D'Artagnan's response, the Baronet's accent of which recalled to him at the same time his youth and his country, a double remembrance which makes a man smile at all ages. But stepping towards the antechamber, and making a sign to D'Artagnan with his hand, as if to ask his permission to finish with others before he began with him, he called three times, with a louder voice at each time, so that he ran through the intervening tones between the imperative accent and the angry accent. Athos! Porthos! Aramis! The two musketeers with whom we have already made acquaintance, and who answered to the last of these three names, immediately quitted the group of which they had formed a part, and advanced toward the cabinet the door of which closed after them as soon as they had entered. Their appearance, though it was not quite at ease, excited by its carelessness, at once full of dignity and submission, the admiration of D'Artagnan, who beheld in these two men demigods, and in their leader an Olympian Jupiter, armed with all his thunders. When the two musketeers had entered, when the door was closed behind them, when the buzzing murmur of the antechamber, to which the summons which had been made had doubtless furnished fresh food, 
had recommenced, when M. de Treville had three or four times paced in silence, and with a frowning brow, the whole length of his cabinet, passing each time before Porthos and Aramis, who were as upright and silent as if on parade, he stopped all at once full in front of them, and covering them from head to foot with an angry look. "'Do you know what the king said to me?' cried he. "'And that no longer ago than yesterday evening. Do you know, gentlemen?' "'No,' replied the two musketeers, after a moment's silence. "'No, sir, we do not.' "'But I hope that you will do us the honour to tell us,' added Aramis, in his politest tone, and with his most graceful bow. "'He told me that he should henceforth recruit his musketeers from among the guards of Monsieur le Cardinal.' "'The guards of the Cardinal? And why so?' asked Porthos warmly. "'Because he plainly perceives that his piquette stands in need of being enlivened by a mixture of good wine.' A piquette is a watered liquor made from the second pressing of the grape. The two musketeers reddened to the whites of their eyes. D'Artagnan did not know where he was, and wished himself a hundred feet underground. "'Yes, yes,' continued Monsieur de Treville, growing warmer as he spoke, "'and his majesty was right, for upon my honour it is true that the musketeers make but a miserable figure at court.' The cardinal related yesterday, while playing with the king, with an air of condolence very displeasing to me, that the day before yesterday those damned musketeers, those daredevils, he dwelt upon those words with an ironical tone still more displeasing to me, those braggarts, added he, glancing at me with his tiger-cat's eye, had made a riot in the Rue Ferru in a cabaret, and that a party of his guards, I thought he was going to laugh in my face, had been forced to arrest the rioters. Morbleu! You must know something about it. Arrest musketeers! You were among them. You were! Don't deny it. You were recognized, and the cardinal named you. But it's all my fault, yes, it's all my fault, because it is myself who selects my men. You, Aramis! Why the devil did you ask me for a uniform when you would have been so much better in a cassock? And you, Porthos, do you only wear such a fine golden baldric to suspend a sword of straw from it? And Athos? I don't see Athos. Where is he? Ill? Very ill, say you? And of what malady? It is feared that it may be the smallpox, sir, replied Porthos desirous of taking his turn in the conversation, and what is serious is that it will certainly spoil his face. The smallpox! That's a great story to tell me, Porthos! Sick of the smallpox at his age? No, no! But wounded without doubt, killed, perhaps. Ah, if I knew! Good blood! Monsieur Musketeers, I will not have this haunting of bad places, this quarrelling in the streets, the sword-play at the crossways, and above all I will not have occasion given for the cardinal's guards, who are brave, quiet, skilful men, who never put themselves in a position to be arrested, and who, besides, never allow themselves to be arrested, to laugh at you. I am sure of it. They would prefer dying on the spot to being arrested or taking back a step. To save yourselves, to scamper away, to flee— that is good for the king's musketeers. Porthos and Aramis trembled with rage. They could willingly have strangled M. de Treville, if at the bottom of all this they had not felt it was the great love he bore them which made him speak thus. They stamped upon the carpet with their feet, they bit their lips till the blood came, and grasped the hilts of their swords with all their might. All without had heard, as we have said, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis called, and had guessed, from M. de Treville's tone of voice, that he was very angry about something. Ten curious heads were glued to the tapestry, and became pale with fury, for their ears, closely applied to the door, did not lose a syllable of what he said, while their mouths repeated as he went on the insulting expressions of the captain to all the people in the antechamber. In an instant, from the door of the cabinet to the street gate, the whole hotel was boiling." "'Ah! 
"'The king's musketeers are arrested by the guards of the cardinal, are they?' continued M. de Treville, as furious at heart as his soldiers, but emphasizing his words and plunging them one by one, so to say, like so many blows of a stiletto, into the bosoms of his auditors. "'What! Six of his eminence's guards arrest six of his majesty's musketeers? Morbleu! My part is taken. I will go straight to the Louvre. I will give him my resignation as captain of the king's musketeers to take a lieutenancy in the cardinal's guards, and if he refuses me, morbleu! I will turn abbey. At these words the murmur without became an explosion. Nothing was to be heard but oaths and blasphemies. The morbleus, the sang dieus, the mort toutes les diables, crossed one another in the air. D'Artagnan looked for some tapestry behind which he might hide himself, and felt an immense inclination to crawl under the table. "'Well, my captain,' said Porthos, quite beside himself, the truth is that we were six against six, but we were not captured by fair means, and before we had time to draw our swords, two of our party were dead, and Athos, grievously wounded, was very little better. For you know Athos. Well, Captain, he endeavoured twice to get up, and fell again twice, and we did not surrender, no. They dragged us away by force. On the way we escaped. As for Athos, they believed him to be dead and left him very quiet on the field of battle, not thinking it worth the trouble to carry him away. That's the whole story. What the devil, Captain! One cannot win all one's battles. The great Pompey lost that of Pharsalia, and Francis I, who was, as I have heard say, as good as other folks, nevertheless lost the Battle of Pavia. And I have the honour of assuring you that I killed one of them with his own sword, said Aramis for mine was broken at the first parry. Killed him, or poniarded him, sir, as is most agreeable to you." "'I did not know that,' replied M. de Treville, in a somewhat softened tone. The cardinal exaggerated, as I perceive. "'But pray, sir,' continued Aramis, who, seeing his captain become appeased, ventured to risk a prayer, "'do not say that Athos is wounded.' He would be in despair if that should come to the ears of the king, and as the wound is very serious, seeing that after crossing the shoulder it penetrates into the chest, it is to be feared. At this instant the tapestry was raised, and a noble and handsome head, but frightfully paled, appeared under the fringe. "'Athos!' cried the two musketeers. "'Athos!' repeated M. de Treville himself. "'You have sent for me, sir.' said Athos to M. de Treville, in a feeble but perfectly calm voice. "'You have sent for me, as my comrades inform me, and I have hastened to receive your orders. I am here. What do you want with me?' And at these words the musketeer, in irreproachable costume, belted as usual, with a tolerably firm step, entered the cabinet. M. de Treville, moved to the bottom of his heart, by this proof of courage, sprang toward him. "'I was about to say to these gentlemen,' added he, "'that I forbid my musketeers to expose their lives needlessly, for brave men are very dear to the king, and the king knows that his musketeers are the bravest on the earth. Your hand, Athos!' And without waiting for the answer of the newcomer to this proof of affection, M. de Treville seized his right hand and pressed it with all his might, without perceiving that Athos, whatever might be his self-command, allowed a slight murmur of pain to escape him, and, if possible, grew paler than he was before. The door had remained open, so strong was the excitement produced by the arrival of Athos, whose wound, though kept as a secret, was known to all. A burst of satisfaction hailed the last words of the captain and two or three heads, carried away by the enthusiasm of the moment, appeared through the openings of the tapestry. M. de Treville was about to reprehend this breach of the rules of etiquette, when he felt the hand of Athos, who had rallied all his energies to contend against pain, at length, overcome by it, fell upon the floor as if he were dead. "'A surgeon!' cried M. de Treville. 
mine, the king's, the best, a surgeon, horse blood, my brave Athos will die. At the cries of Monsieur de Cheville, the whole assemblage rushed into the cabinet, he not thinking to shut the door against any one, and all crowded round the wounded man. But all this eager attention might have been useless if the doctor so loudly called for had not chanced to be in the hotel. He pushed through the crowd, approached Athos, still insensible, and as all this noise and commotion inconvenienced him greatly, he required, as the first and most urgent thing, that the musketeers should be carried into an adjoining chamber. Immediately M. de Treville opened and pointed the way to Porthos and Aramis, who bore their comrade in their arms. Behind this group walked the surgeon, and behind the surgeon the door closed. The cabinet of M. de Treville, generally held so sacred, became in an instant the annex of the antechamber. Every one spoke, harangued, and vociferated, swearing, cursing, and consigning the cardinal and his guards to all the devils. An instant after, Porthos and Aramis re-entered, the surgeon and M. de Treville alone remaining with the wounded. At length M. de Treville himself returned. The injured man had recovered his senses. The surgeon declared that the situation of the musketeer had nothing in it to render his friends uneasy, his weakness having been purely and simply caused by loss of blood. Then M. de Treville made a sign with his hand, and all retired, except D'Artagnan, who did not forget that he had an audience, and with the tenacity of a Gascon, remained in his place. When all had gone out, and the door was closed, M. de Treville, on turning round, found himself alone with the young man. The event which had occurred had in some degree broken the thread of his ideas. He inquired what was the will of his persevering visitor. D'Artagnan then repeated his name, and in an instant recovering all his remembrances of the present and the past, M. de Treville grasped the situation. "'Pardon me,' said he, smiling. Pardon me, my dear compatriot, but I had wholly forgotten you. But what help is there for it? A captain is nothing but a father of a family, charged with even a greater responsibility than the father of an ordinary family. Soldiers are big children, but as I maintain that the orders of the king, and more particularly the orders of the cardinal, should be executed, D'Artagnan could not restrain a smile. By this smile M. de Treville judged that he had not to deal with a fool, and, changing the conversation, came straight to the point. "'I respected your father very much,' said he. "'What can I do for the son? Tell me quickly, my time is not my own.' "'Monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, "'on quitting Tarbes and coming hither, it was my intention to request of you, in remembrance of the friendship which you have not forgotten, the uniform of a musketeer. But after all that I have seen during the last two hours, I comprehend that such a famer is enormous, and tremble lest I should not merit it." "'It is indeed a favour, young man,' replied M. de Treville. "'But it may not be so far beyond your hopes as you believe, or rather as you appear to believe. But His Majesty's decision is always necessary and I inform you with regret that no one becomes a musketeer without the preliminary ordeal of several campaigns, certain brilliant actions, or service of two years in some other regiment less favoured than ours." D'Artagnan bowed without replying, feeling his desire to don the musketeer's uniform vastly increased by the great difficulties which preceded the attainment of it. But, continued M. de Treville, fixing upon his compatriot a look so piercing that it might be said he wished to read the thoughts of his heart. On account of my old companion, your father, as I have said, I will do something for you, young man. Our recruits from Béarn are not generally very rich, and I have no reason to think matters have much changed in this respect since I left the province. I dare say you have not brought too large a stock of money with you? D'Artagnan drew himself up with a proud air which plainly said, I asked alms of no man. "'Oh, that's very well, young man,' continued M. de Treville. "'That's all very well. I know these airs. I myself came to Paris with four crowns in my purse, 
and would have fought with any one who dared to tell me I was not in a condition to purchase the Louvre. D'Artagnan's bearing became still more imposing. Thanks to the sale of his horse, he commenced his career with four more crowns than M. de Treville possessed at the commencement of his. You ought, I say, then, to husband the means you have, however large the sum may be. But you ought also to endeavour to perfect yourself in the exercises becoming a gentleman. I will write a letter to-day to the director of the Royal Academy, and to-morrow he will admit you without any expense to yourself. Do not refuse this little service. Our best-born and richest gentlemen sometimes solicit it without being able to obtain it. You will learn horsemanship, swordsmanship in all its branches, and dancing. You will make some desirable acquaintances, and from time to time you can call upon me, just to tell me how you are getting on, and to say whether I can be of further service to you." D'Artagnan, stranger as he was to all the manners of a court, could not but perceive a little coldness in this reception. "'Alas, sir,' said he, "'I cannot but perceive how sadly I miss the letter of introduction which my father gave me to present to you.' "'I certainly am surprised,' replied M. de Treville, "'that you should undertake so long a journey without that necessary passport, the sole resource of us poor Bayonnais.' "'I had one, sir, and, thank God, such as I could wish,' cried D'Artagnan. "'But it was perfidiously stolen from me.' He then related the adventures of Meung, described the unknown gentleman with the greatest minuteness, and all with a warmth and truthfulness that delighted M. de Treville. "'This is all very strange,' said M. de Treville, after meditating a minute. "'You mentioned my name, then, aloud?' "'Yes, sir, I certainly committed that imprudence. But why should I have done otherwise? A name like yours must be as a buckler to me on my way. Judge if I should not put myself under its protection.' Flattery was at that period very current, and M. de Treville loved incense as well as a king, or even a cardinal. He could not refrain from a smile of visible satisfaction, but this smile soon disappeared and returning to the adventure of Meung. "'Tell me,' continued he, "'had not this gentleman a slight scar on his cheek?' "'Yes, such a one as would be made by the grazing of a ball.' "'Was he not a fine-looking man?' "'Yes.' "'Of lofty stature?' "'Yes.' "'Of complexion and brown hair?' "'Yes, yes, that is he. How is it, sir, that you are acquainted with this man?' If I ever find him again, and I will find him, I swear word in hell. He was waiting for a woman, continued Treville. He departed immediately after having conversed for a minute with her, whom he awaited. You know not the subject of their conversation. He gave her a box, told her not to open it except in London. Was this woman English? He called her Milady. It is he, it must be he murmured Treville. I believed him still at Brussels. "'Oh, sir, if you know who this man is,' cried D'Artagnan, "'tell me who he is and whence he is. I will then release you from all your promises, even that of procuring my admission into the musketeers. But before everything I wish to avenge myself.' "'Beware, young man,' cried Treville. "'If you see him coming on one side of the street, pass by on the other. Do not cast yourself against such a rock.' He would break you like glass. "'That will not prevent me,' replied D'Artagnan, "'if ever I find him.' "'In the meantime,' said Treville, "'seek him not, if I have a right to advise you.' All at once the captain stopped, as if struck by a sudden suspicion. This great hatred which the young traveller manifested so loudly for this man, who, a rather improbable thing, had stolen his father's letter from him, was there not some perfidy concealed under this hatred? Might not this young man be sent by his eminence? Might not he have come for the purpose of laying a snare for him? This pretended d'Artagnan, was he not an emissary of the cardinal, whom the cardinal sought to introduce in Treville's house, to place near him, to win his confidence, 
and afterward to ruin him as had been done in a thousand other instances? He fixed his eyes upon D'Artagnan even more earnestly than before. He was moderately reassured, however, by the aspect of that countenance, full of astute intelligence and affected humility. "'I know he is a Gascon,' reflected he, "'but he may be one for the Cardinal as well as for me. Let us try him.' "'My friend,' said he slowly, "'I wish, as the son of an ancient friend, for I consider this story of the lost letter perfectly true, I wish, I say, in order to repair the coldness you may have remarked in my reception of you, to discover to you the secrets of our policy. The King and the Cardinal are the best of friends. Their apparent bickerings are only feints to deceive fools. I am not willing that a compatriot, a handsome cavalier, a brave youth, quite fit to make his way, should become the dupe of all these artifices, and fall into the snare after the example of so many others who have been ruined by it. Be assured that I am devoted to both these all-powerful masters, and that my earnest endeavours have no other aim than the service of the King, and also the Cardinal, one of the most illustrious geniuses that France has ever produced. Now, young man, regulate your conduct accordingly. And if you entertain, whether from your family, your relations, or even from your instincts, any of these enmities which we see constantly breaking out against the Cardinal, bid me adieu, and let us separate. I will aid you in many ways, but without attaching you to my person. I hope that my frankness at least will make you my friend, for you are the only young man to whom I have hitherto spoken as I have done to you. Treville said to himself, If the Cardinal has set this young fox upon me, he will certainly not have failed. He who knows how bitterly I execrate him, to tell his spy that the best means of making his court to me is to rail at him. Therefore, in spite of all my protestations, if it be as I suspect, my cunning gossip will assure me that he holds his eminence in horror. It, however, proved otherwise. D'Artagnan answered with the greatest simplicity. I came to Paris with exactly such intentions. My father advised me to stoop to nobody but the king, the cardinal, and yourself, whom he considered the first three personages in France. D'Artagnan added M. de Treville to the others, as may be perceived, but he thought this addition would do no harm. I have the greatest veneration for the cardinal, continued he, and the most profound respect for his actions. So much the better for me, sir, if you speak to me, as you say, with frankness, for then you will do me the honour to esteem the resemblance of our opinions. But if you have entertained any doubt, as naturally you may, I feel that I am ruining myself by speaking the truth. But I still trust you will not esteem me the less for it, and that is my object beyond all others." M. de Treville was surprised to the greatest degree. So much penetration, so much frankness, created admiration, but did not entirely remove his suspicions. The more this young man was superior to others, the more he was to be dreaded if he meant to deceive him. "'You are an honest youth, but at the present moment I can only do for you that which I had just now offered. My hotel will always open to you. Hereafter, being able to ask for me at all hours, and consequently to take advantage of all opportunities, you will probably obtain that which you desire. That is to say, replied D'Artagnan, that you will wait until I have proved myself worthy of it. Well, be assured, added he, with the familiarity of a Gascon, you shall not wait long. And he bowed in order to retire, and as if he considered the future in his own hands. But wait a minute, said M. de Treville, stopping him. I promised you a letter for the director of the academy. Are you too proud to accept it, young gentleman? No, sir, said D'Artagnan, and I will guard it so carefully that I will be sworn it shall arrive at its address, and woe be to him who shall attempt to take it from me. M. de Treville smiled at this flourish, and leaving his young man compatriot in the embrasure of the window, 
where they had talked together, he seated himself at a table in order to write the promised letter of recommendation. While he was doing this, D'Artagnan, having no better employment, amused himself with beating a march upon the window, and with looking at the musketeers who went away, one after another, following them with his eyes until they disappeared. M. de Treville, after having written the letter, sealed it, and rising, approached the young man in order to give it to him. But at the very moment when D'Artagnan stretched out his hand to receive it, M. de Treville was highly astonished to see his protégé make a sudden spring, become crimson with passion, and rush from the cabinet, crying, "'Splud! He will not escape me this time!' "'And who?' asked M. de Treville. "'He, my thief!' replied D'Artagnan. "'Ha! The traitor!' and he disappeared. "'The devil take the madman!' murmured M. de Treville. "'Unless,' added he, "'this is a cunning mode of escaping, seeing that he had failed in his purpose.'" End of chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith, Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 4 the shoulder of Athos, the baldric of Porthos, and the handkerchief of Aramis. D'Artagnan, in his state of fury, crossed the antechamber at three bounds, and was darting towards the stairs, which he reckoned upon descending four at a time, when, in his heedless course, he ran head foremost against a musketeer who was coming out of one of Monsieur de Treville's private rooms, and striking his shoulder violently made him utter a cry, or rather a howl. "'Excuse me,' said D'Artagnan, endeavouring to resume his course. "'Excuse me, but I am in a hurry.' Scarcely had he descended the first stair, when a hand of iron seized him by the belt and stopped him. "'You are in a hurry,' said the musketeer, as pale as a sheet. "'Under that pretense you run against me. You say, "'Excuse me, and you believe that is sufficient. Not at all, my young man.' Do you fancy, because you have heard Monsieur de Treville speak to us a little cavalierly today, that other people are to treat us as he speaks to us? Undeceive yourself, comrade. You are not Monsieur de Treville. My faith, replied D'Artagnan, recognizing Athos, who, after the dressing performed by the doctor, was returning to his own apartment. I did not do it intentionally, and not doing it intentionally, I said, excuse me. It appears to me that this is quite enough. I repeat to you, however, and this time on my word of honor, I think perhaps too often, that I am in haste, great haste. Leave your hold, then, I beg of you, and let me go where my business calls me. Monsieur, said Athos, letting him go, you are not polite. It is easy to perceive that you come from a distance. D'Artagnan had already strode down three or four stairs, but at Athos's last remark he stopped short. "'More blue, monsieur,' said he. "'However far I may come, it is not you who can give me a lesson in good manners, I warn you.' "'Perhaps,' said Athos. "'Ah, if I were not in such haste, and if I were not running after someone,' said D'Artagnan. "'Monsieur, man in a hurry, you can find me without running. Me, you understand. "'And where, I pray you?' "'Near the Calme de Chaux. "'At what hour?' about noon about noon that will do i will be there endeavor not to make me wait for a quarter past twelve i will cut off your ears as you run good cried d'artagnan i will be there ten minutes before twelve and he set off running as if the devil possessed him hoping that he might yet find the stranger whose slow pace could not have carried him far but at the street gate porthos was talking with a soldier on guard between the two talkers there was just enough room for a man to pass. D'Artagnan thought it would suffice for him, and he sprang forward like a dart between them. But D'Artagnan had reckoned without the wind. As he was about to pass, the wind blew out Porthos's long cloak, and D'Artagnan rushed straight into the middle of it. 
without doubt porthos had reasons for not abandoning this part of his vestments for instead of quitting his hold on the flap in his hand he pulled it toward him so that d'artagnan rolled himself up in the velvet by a movement of rotation explained by the persistency of porthos d'artagnan hearing the musketeer swear wished to escape from the cloak which blinded him and sought to find his way from under the folds of it he was particularly anxious to avoid marring the freshness of the magnificent baldric we are acquainted with but on timidly opening his eyes he found himself with his nose fixed between the two shoulders of porthos that is to say exactly upon the baldric alas like most things in this world which have nothing in their favor but appearances the baldric was glittering with gold in the front but was nothing but simple buff behind vainglorious as he was porthos could not afford to have a baldric wholly of gold but had at least half one could comprehend the necessity of the cold and the urgency of the cloak bless me cried porthos making strong efforts to disembarrass himself of d'artagnan who was wriggling about his back you must be mad to run against people in this manner excuse me said d'artagnan reappearing under the shoulder of the giant but i am in such haste i was running after some one and and do you always forget your eyes when you run asked porthos no replied d'artagnan piqued and thanks to my eyes i can see what other people cannot see whether Porthos understood him, or did not understand him, giving way to his anger, Bonjour, said he, you stand a chance of getting chastised if you rub musketeers in this fashion. Chastise, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, the expression is strong. It is one that becomes a man accustomed to look his enemies in the face. Ah, pardieu, I know full well that you don't turn your back to yours and the young man, delighted with his joke, went away laughing loudly. Porthos foamed with rage, and made a movement to rush after D'Artagnan. "'Presently, presently,' cried the latter, "'when you haven't your cloak on.' "'At what o'clock, then, behind the Luxembourg?' "'Very well, at what o'clock, then,' replied D'Artagnan, turning the angle of the street." But neither in the street he had passed through, nor in the one which his eager glance pervaded, could he see any one. However slowly the stranger had walked, he was gone on his way, or perhaps had entered some house. D'Artagnan inquired of every one he met with, went down to the ferry, came up again by the Rue de Seine and the Red Cross, but nothing, absolutely nothing. This chase was, however, advantageous to him in one sense, for in proportion as the perspiration broke from his forehead, his heart began to cool he began to reflect upon the events that had passed they were numerous and inauspicious it was scarcely eleven o'clock in the morning and yet this morning had already brought him into disgrace with monsieur de treville who could not fail to think the manner in which d'artagnan had left him a little cavalier besides this he had drawn upon himself two good duels with two men each capable of killing three d'artagnans with two musketeers in short with two of those beings whom he esteemed so greatly that he placed them in his mind and heart above all other men the outlook was sad sure of being killed by athos it may easily be understood that the young man was not very uneasy about porthos as hope however is the last thing extinguished in the heart of man he finished by hoping that he might survive even though with terrible wounds in both these duels and in case of surviving he made the following reprehensions upon his own conduct what a madcap i was and what a stupid fellow i am that brave and unfortunate athos was wounded on that very shoulder against which i must run head foremost like a ram the only thing that astonishes me is that he did not strike me dead at once he had good cause to do so the pain i gave him must have been atrocious as to porthos oh as to porthos faith that's a droll affair and in spite of himself the young man began to laugh aloud looking round carefully however to see that his solitary laugh without a cause in the eyes of passers-by offended no one as to porthos that is certainly droll but i am not the less a giddy fool are people to be run against without warning no and have i any right to go and peep under their cloaks to see what is not there he would have pardoned me he would certainly have pardoned me if i had not said anything to him about that cursed baldric in ambiguous words it is true but rather drolly ambiguous 
A cursed Gascon that I am, I get from one hobble into another. Friend D'Artagnan, continued he, speaking to himself with all the amenity that he thought due himself, if you escape, of which there is not much chance, I would advise you to practice perfect politeness for the future. You must henceforth be admired and quoted as a model of it. To be obliging and polite does not necessarily make a man a coward. Look at Aramis now. Aramis's mildness and grace personified. Well, did anybody ever dream of calling Aramis a coward? No, certainly not, and from this moment I will endeavor to model myself after him. Oh, that's strange. Here he is. D'Artagnan, walking and soliloquizing, had arrived within a few steps of the Hotel d'Arguillon, and in front of that hotel perceived Aramis, chatting gaily with three gentlemen but as he had not forgotten that it was in the presence of this young man that monsieur de treville had been so angry in the morning and as a witness of the rebuke the musketeers had received was not likely to be at all agreeable he pretended not to see him d'artagnan on the contrary quite full of his plans of conciliation and courtesy approached the young men with a profound bow accompanied by a most gracious smile all four besides immediately broke off their conversation d'artagnan was not so dull as not to perceive that he was one too many but he was not sufficiently broken into the fashions of the gay world to know how to extricate himself gallantly from a false position like that of a man who begins to mingle with people he is scarcely acquainted with and in a conversation that does not concern him he was seeking in his mind then for the least awkward means of retreat when he remarked that aramis had let his handkerchief fall and by mistake no doubt had placed his foot upon it this appeared to be a favorable opportunity to repair his intrusion he stooped and with the most gracious air he could assume drew the handkerchief from under the foot of the musketeer in spite of the efforts the latter made to detain it and holding it out to him said i believe monsieur that this is a handkerchief you would be sorry to lose the handkerchief was indeed richly embroidered and had a coronet and arms at one of its corners aramis blushed excessively and snatched rather than took the handkerchief from the hand of the gascon ha ha cried one of the guards will you persist in saying most discreet aramis that you are not on good terms with madame de beautracy when that gracious lady has the kindness to lend you one of her handkerchiefs aramis darted at d'artagnan one of those looks which inform a man that he has acquired a mortal enemy then resuming his mild air you are deceived gentlemen said he this handkerchief is not mine, and I cannot fancy why Monsieur has taken it into his head to offer it to me rather than to one of you, and as a proof of what I say, here is mine in my pocket. So saying, he pulled out his own handkerchief, likewise a very elegant handkerchief, and of fine cambric, though cambric was dear at the period, but a handkerchief without embroidery and without arms, only ornamented with a single cipher, that of its proprietor this time d'artagnan was not hasty he perceived his mistake but the friends of aramis were not at all convinced by his denial and one of them addressed the young musketeer with affected seriousness if it were as you pretend it is said he i should be forced my dear aramis to reclaim it myself for as you very well know Blatracy is an intimate friend of mine and i cannot allow the property of his wife to be sported as a trophy you make the demand badly replied aramis and while acknowledging the justice of your reclamation i refuse it on account of the form the fact is hazarded d'artagnan timidly i did not see the handkerchief fall from the pocket of monsieur aramis he had his foot upon it that is all and i thought from having his foot upon it the handkerchief was his and you were deceived my dear sir replied aramis coldly very little sensible to the reparation then turning toward that one of the guards who had declared himself the friend of Bois Tracy, besides continued he i have reflected my dear intimate of Bois Tracy, that i am not less tenderly his friend than you can possibly be so that decidedly this handkerchief is as likely to have fallen from your pocket as mine no upon my honor cried his majesty's guardsman you are about to swear upon your honor and i upon my word and then it will be pretty evident that one of us will have lied now here montaran we will do better than that 
Let each take a half. Of the handkerchief? Yes. Perfectly just, cried the other two guardsmen. The judgment of King Solomon. Aramis, you certainly are full of wisdom. The young men burst into a laugh, and, as may be supposed, the affair had no other sequel. In a moment or two the conversation ceased, and the three guardsmen and the musketeer, after having cordially shaken hands, separated, the guardsmen going one way, and Aramis another. "'Now is my time to make peace with this gallant man,' said D'Artagnan to himself, having stood on one side during the whole of the latter part of the conversation." and with this good feeling drawing near to Aramis, who was departing without paying any attention to him. Monsieur, said he, you will excuse me, I hope. Ah, monsieur, interrupted Aramis, permit me to observe to you that you have not acted in this affair as a gallant man ought. What, monsieur, cried D'Artagnan, and do you suppose? I suppose, monsieur, that you are not a fool, and that you know very well, although coming from Gascony, that people do not tread upon handkerchiefs without a reason. What the devil! Paris is not paved with cambric. Monsieur, you act wrongly in endeavoring to mortify me, said D'Artagnan, in whom the natural quarrelsome spirit began to speak more loudly than his pacific resolutions. I am from Gascony, it is true, and since you know it, there is no occasion to tell you that Gascons are not very patient, so that when they have begged to be excused once, were it even for a folly, they are convinced that they have done already at least as much again as they ought to have done. Monsieur, what I say to you about the matter, said Aramis, is not for the sake of seeking a quarrel. Thank God I am not a bravo and being a musketeer but for a time i only fight when i am forced to do so and always with great repugnance but this time the affair is serious for here is a lady compromised by you by us you mean cried d'artagnan why did you so maladroitly restore me the handkerchief why did you so awkwardly let it fall i have said monsieur and i repeat that the handkerchief did not fall from my pocket and thereby you have lied twice, monsieur, for I saw it fall. Ah, you take it with that tone, do you, Master Gascon? Well, I will teach you how to behave yourself. And I will send you back to your mass-book, Master Abbe. Draw, if you please, and instantly— Not so, if you please, my good friend, not here at least. Do you not perceive that we are opposite the Hotel d'Arguillon, which is full of the cardinal's creatures? How do I know that this is not his eminence who has honored you with a commission to procure my head? Now, I entertain a ridiculous partiality for my head. It seems to suit my shoulders so correctly. I wish to kill you, be at rest as to that, but to kill you quietly, in a snug, remote place, where you will not be able to boast of your death to anybody. I agree, monsieur, but do not be too confident take your handkerchief whether it belongs to you or another you may perhaps stand in need of it monsieur is a gascon asked aramis yes monsieur does not postpone an interview through prudence prudence monsieur is a virtue sufficiently useless to musketeers i know but indispensable to churchmen and as i am only a musketeer provisionally i hold it good to be prudent at two o'clock i shall have the honor of expecting you at the hotel of monsieur de treville there i will indicate to you the best place and time the two young men bowed and separated aramis ascending the street which led to the luxembourg while d'artagnan perceiving the appointed hour was approaching took the road to the con de chaux saying to himself decidedly i can't draw back but at least if i am killed I shall be killed by a musketeer. End of chapter 4「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith. Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter Five: The King's Musketeers and the Cardinal's Guards D'Artagnan was acquainted with nobody in Paris. He went, therefore, to his appointment with Athos without a second, determined to be satisfied with those his adversary should choose. 
Besides, his intention was formed to make the brave musketeer all suitable apologies, but without meanness or weakness, fearing that might result from this duel, which generally results from an affair of this kind, when a young and vigorous man fights with an adversary who is wounded and weakened. If conquered, he doubles the triumph of his antagonist. If a conqueror, he is accused of foul play and want of courage." now we must have badly painted the character of our adventure-seeker or our readers must have already perceived that d'artagnan was not an ordinary man therefore while repeating to himself that his death was inevitable he did not make up his mind to die quietly as one less courageous and less restrained might have done in his place he reflected upon the different characters of men he had to fight with and began to view his situation more clearly he hoped by means of loyal excuses to make a friend of athos whose lordly air and austere bearing pleased him much he flattered himself he should be able to frighten porthos with the adventure of the baldric which he might if not killed upon the spot relate to everybody a recital which well managed would cover porthos with ridicule as to the astute aramis he did not entertain much dread of him and supposing he should be able to get so far he determined to dispatch him in good style, or at least by hitting him in the face, as Caesar recommended his soldiers do to those of Pompey, to damage forever the beauty of which he was so proud. In addition to this, D'Artagnan possessed that invincible stock of resolution which the counsels of his father had implanted in his heart. Endure nothing from any one but the king, the cardinal, and Monsieur de Treville. He flew, then, rather than walked, toward the convent of the Carme de Chausse, or rather de Chaux, as it was called at that period, a sort of building without a window, surrounded by barren fields, an accessory to the Proclic, and which was generally employed as a place for the duels of men who had no time to lose. When D'Artagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of ground which extended along the foot of the monastery, Athos had been waiting about five minutes, and twelve o'clock was striking. He was, then, as punctual as the Samaritan woman, and the most rigorous casuist with regard to duels could have nothing to say. Athos, who still suffered grievously from his wound, though it had been dressed anew by Monsieur de Treville's surgeon, was seated on a post, and waiting for his adversary with hat in hand, his feather even touching the ground. Monsieur, said Athos, I have engaged two of my friends as seconds, but these two friends are not yet come, at which I am astonished, as it is not at all their custom. I have no seconds on my part, Monsieur, said D'Artagnan, for having only arrived yesterday in Paris, I yet know no one but Monsieur de Treville, to whom I was recommended by my father, who has the honor to be, in some degree, one of his friends. Athos reflected for an instant. "'You know no one but Monsieur de Treville?' he asked. "'Yes, Monsieur, I know only him.' "'Well, but then,' continued Athos, speaking half to himself, "'if I kill you, I shall have the air of a boy-slayer.' "'Not too much so,' replied D'Artagnan, with a bow that was not deficient in dignity. "'Since you do me the honor to draw a sword with me while suffering from a wound which is very inconvenient.' "'Very inconvenient, upon my word, and you hurt me devilishly, I can tell you. "'But I will take the left hand. It is my custom in such circumstances. "'Do not fancy that I do you a favor. I use either hand easily. "'And it will be even a disadvantage to you. "'A left-handed man is very troublesome to people who are not prepared for it. "'I regret I did not inform you sooner of this circumstance.' "'You have truly, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, bowing again, "'a courtesy for which, I assure you, I am very grateful.' "'You confuse me,' replied Athos, with his gentlemanly air. "'Let us talk of something else, if you please. "'Ah, Splud, how you have hurt me! My shoulder quite burns.' "'If you would permit me,' said D'Artagnan, with timidity. "'What, monsieur?' I have a miraculous balsam for wounds, a balsam given to me by my mother, and of which I have made a trial upon myself. Well, well, I am sure that in less than three days this balsam would cure you. And at the end of three days, when you would be cured, well, sir, it would still do me a great honor to be your man. D'Artagnan spoke these words with a simplicity that did honor to his courtesy, without throwing the least doubt upon his courage. 
Pardieu, monsieur, said Athos, that's a proposition that pleases me. Not that I can accept it, but a league off it savors of the gentleman. Thus spoke and acted the gallant knights of the time of Charlemagne, in whom every cavalier ought to seek his model. Unfortunately, we do not live in the times of the great emperor, we live in the times of the cardinal. And three days hence, however well the secret might be guarded, it would be known, I say, that we were to fight, and our combat would be prevented. I think these fellows will never come. "'If you are in haste, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, with the same simplicity with which a moment before he had proposed to him to put off the duel for three days, and if it be your will to dispatch me at once, do not inconvenience yourself, I pray you.' "'There is another word which pleases me,' cried Athos, with a gracious nod to D'Artagnan. "'That did not come from a man without heart. "'Monsieur, I love men of your kidney, "'and I foresee plainly that, if we don't kill each other, "'I shall hereafter have much pleasure in your conversation. "'We will wait for these gentlemen, so please you. "'I have plenty of time, and it will be more correct. "'Ah, here is one of them, I believe.' In fact, at the end of the Rue Valgerard, the gigantic Porthos appeared. What? cried D'Artagnan. Is your first witness Monsieur Porthos? Yes, that disturbs you. By no means. And here is the second. D'Artagnan turned in the direction pointed to by Athos and perceived Aramis. What? cried he, in an accent of greater astonishment than before. Your second witness is Monsieur Aramis? Doubtless. Are you not aware that we are never seen one without the others, and that we are called among the musketeers and the guards, at court and in the city, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or the three inseparables? And yet, as you come from Dath Port, from Tarbes, said D'Artagnan, it is probable you are ignorant of this little fact, said Athos. My faith, replied D'Artagnan, you are well named, gentlemen, and my adventure, if it should make any noise, will prove at least that your union is not founded upon contrasts. In the meantime, Porthos had come up, waved his hand to Athos, and then turning toward D'Artagnan, stood quite astonished. Let us say in passing that he had changed his baldric and relinquished his cloak. Ah, oh, ah, said he, what does this mean? "'This is the gentleman I am going to fight with,' said Athos, pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand, and saluting him with the same gesture. "'Why, it was with him I am also going to fight,' said Porthos. "'But not before one o'clock,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And I also am to fight with this gentleman,' said Aramis, coming in his turn on to the place. "'But not until two o'clock,' said D'Artagnan, with the same calmness. "'But what are you going to fight about, Athos?' asked Aramis. "'Faith, I don't very well know. "'He hurt my shoulder, and you, Porthos?' "'Faith, I am going to fight, because I am going to fight,' answered Porthos, reddening. Athos, whose keen eye lost nothing, perceived a faintly sly smile pass over the lips of the young Gascon as he replied, "'We had a short discussion upon dress.' "'And you, Aramis?' asked Athos. "'Oh, ours is a theological quarrel,' replied Aramis, making a sign to D'Artagnan to keep secret the cause of their duel. Athos indeed saw a second smile upon the lips of D'Artagnan. "'Indeed,' said Athos. "'Yes, a passage of St. Augustine, upon which we could not agree,' said the Gascon. "'Decidedly, this is a clever fellow,' murmured Athos. "'And now you are assembled, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan. "'Permit me to offer you my apologies.' At this word, apologies, a cloud passed over the brow of Athos, a haughty smile curled the lip of Porthos, and a negative sign was the reply of Aramis. "'You do not understand me, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, throwing up his head, the sharp and bold lines of which were at the moment gilded by a bright ray of the sun. "'I ask to be excused in case I should not be able to discharge my debt to all three. For Monsieur Athos has the right to kill me first which must much diminish the face value of your bill, Monsieur Porthos, and render yours almost null, Monsieur Aramis. And now, gentlemen, I repeat, excuse me, but on that account only, and a god. At these words, with the most gallant air possible, D'Artagnan drew his sword. The blood had mounted to the head of D'Artagnan, and at that moment he would have drawn his sword against all the musketeers in the kingdom as willingly as he now did against Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It was a quarter past midday. The sun was in its zenith, and the spot chosen for the scene of the duel was exposed to its full ardor. 
"'It is very hot,' said Athos, drawing his sword in its turn. "'And yet I cannot take off my doublet, "'for I just now felt my wound begin to bleed again, "'and I should not like to annoy Monsieur with a sight of blood "'which he has not drawn from me himself.' "'That is true, Monsieur,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And whether drawn by myself or another, "'I assure you I shall always view with regret "'the blood of so brave a gentleman. "'I will therefore fight in my doublet like yourself.' "'Come, come, enough of such compliments,' cried Porthos. "'Remember, we are waiting for our turns.' "'Speak for yourself when you are inclined to utter such incongruities,' interrupted Aramis. "'For my part, I think what they say is very well said, and quite worthy of two gentlemen.' "'When you please, monsieur,' said Athos, putting himself on guard. "'I waited your orders,' said D'Artagnan, crossing swords.' But scarcely had the two rapiers clashed when a company of the guards of his eminence, commanded by Monsieur de Jussac, turned the corner of the convent. "'The cardinal's guards!' cried Aramis and Porthos at the same time. "'Sheathe your swords, gentlemen! Sheathe your swords!' But it was too late. The two combatants had been seen in a position which left no doubt of their intentions. Hello! cried Jussac, advancing toward them and making a sign to his men to do so likewise. "'Hello, musketeers! Fighting here, are you? And the edicts! What has become of them?' "'You are very generous, gentlemen of the guards,' said Athos, full of rancor, for Jussac was one of the aggressors of the preceding day. "'If we were to see you fighting, I can assure you that we would make no effort to prevent you. Leave us alone, then, and you will enjoy a little amusement without cost to yourselves.' "'Gentlemen,' said Jussac, it is with great regret that I pronounce the thing impossible. Duty before everything. Sheathe then, if you please, and follow us. Monsieur, said Aramis, parodying Jussac, it would afford us great pleasure to obey your polite invitation if it depended upon ourselves. But unfortunately the thing is impossible. Monsieur de Treville has forbidden it. Pass on your way, then. It is the best thing to do. This raillery exasperated Jussac. "'We will charge upon you, then,' said he, "'if you disobey.' "'There are five of them,' said Athos, half aloud, "'and we are but three. "'We shall be beaten again, and must die on the spot, "'for on my part I declare I will never appear again "'before the captain as a conquered man.' Athos, Porthos, and Aramis instantly drew near one another, while Jussac drew up his soldiers. This short interval was sufficient to determine D'Artagnan on the part he was to take. It was one of those events which decide the life of a man. It was a choice between the king and the cardinal. The choice made, it must be persisted in. To fight, that was to disobey the law. That was to risk his head. That was to make at one blow an enemy of a minister more powerful than the king himself. All this young man perceived, and yet, to his praise we speak it, he did not hesitate a second. Turning toward Athos and his friends, "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'allow me to correct your words, if you please. You said you were but three, but it appears to me we are four. "'But you are not one of us,' said Porthos. "'That's true,' replied D'Artagnan. "'I have not the uniform, but I have the spirit.' "'My heart is that of a musketeer. "'I feel it, monsieur, and that impels me on.' "'Withdraw, young man,' cried Jussac, "'who doubtless, by his gestures and the expression of his countenance, "'had guessed D'Artagnan's design. "'You may retire. We consent to that. "'Save your skin. Be gone quickly.' "'D'Artagnan did not budge. "'Decidedly, you are a brave fellow,' said Athos, "'pressing the young man's hand. "'Come, come, choose your part,' replied Jussac. Well, said Porthos to Aramis, we must do something. Monsieur is full of generosity, said Athos. But all three reflected upon the youth of D'Artagnan, and dreaded his inexperience. We should only be three, one of whom is wounded, with the addition of a boy, resumed Athos. And yet, it will not be the less said, we were four men. Yes, but to yield, said Porthos. That is difficult, replied Athos. D'Artagnan comprehended their irresolution. "'Try me, gentlemen,' said he, "'and I swear to you, by my honor, "'that I will not go hence if we are conquered.' "'What is your name, my brave fellow?' said Athos. "'D'Artagnan, monsieur.' 
"'Well, then, Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, forward!' cried Athos. "'Come, gentlemen, have you decided?' cried Jusac for the third time. "'It is done, gentlemen,' said Athos. "'And what is your choice?' asked Jusac. "'We are about to have the honor of charging you,' replied Aramis, lifting his hat with one hand and drawing his sword with the other. "'Ah, you resist, do you?' cried Jusac. "'Sblood, does that astonish you?' and the nine combatants rushed upon each other with a fury which, however, did not exclude a certain degree of method. Athos fixed upon a certain Cahusac, a favorite of the cardinals. Porthos had Bicarat, and Aramis found himself opposed to two adversaries. As to D'Artagnan, he sprang toward Jusac himself. The heart of the young Gascon beat as if it would burst through his side. Not from fear, God he thanked, he had not the shade of it, but with emulation— he fought like a furious tiger, turning ten times round his adversary, and changing his ground and his guard twenty times. Jusac was, as was then said, a fine blade, and had had much practice. Nevertheless, it required all his skills to defend himself against an adversary who, active and energetic, departed every instant from received rules, attacking him on all sides at once, and yet parrying like a man who had the greatest respect for his own epidermis. This contest at length exhausted Jusac's patience. Furious at being held in check by one whom he had considered a boy, he became warm and began to make mistakes. D'Artagnan, who though wanting in practice had a sound theory, redoubled his agility. Jusac, anxious to put an end to this, springing forward, aimed a terrible thrust at his adversary, but the latter parried it, and while Jusac was recovering himself, glided like a serpent beneath his blade and passed his sword through his body. Jusac fell like a dead mass. D'Artagnan then cast an anxious and rapid glance over the field of battle. Aramis had killed one of his adversaries, but the other pressed him warmly. Nevertheless, Aramis was in a good situation and able to defend himself. Bicarat and Porthos had just made counter-hits. Porthos had received a thrust through his arm, and Bicarat one through his thigh. But neither of these two wounds was serious, and they only fought more earnestly. Athos, wounded anew by Cahusac, became evidently paler, but did not give way a foot. He only changed his sword hand and fought with his left hand. According to the laws of dueling at that period, D'Artagnan was at liberty to assist whom he pleased. While he was endeavoring to find out which of his companions stood in greatest need, he caught a glance from Athos. The glance was of sublime eloquence. Athos would have died rather than appeal for help, but he could look and with that look ask assistance. D'Artagnan interpreted it. With a terrible bound he sprang to the side of Cahusac, crying, To me, Monsieur Guardsman, I will slay you! Cahusac turned. It was time, for Athos, whose great courage alone supported him, sank upon his knee. Splud, cried he to D'Artagnan, do not kill him, young man, I beg of you. I have an old affair to settle with him when I am cured and sound again. Disarm him only, make sure of his sword. That's it, very well done. The exclamation was drawn from Athos by seeing the sword of Cahusac fly twenty paces from him. D'Artagnan and Cahusac sprang forward at the same instant, the one to recover, the other to obtain the sword. But D'Artagnan, being the more active, reached it first and placed his foot upon it. Cahusac immediately ran to the guardsman whom Aramis had killed, seized his rapier, and returned toward D'Artagnan. But on his way he met Athos, who during his relief, which D'Artagnan had procured him, had recovered his breath, and who, for fear that D'Artagnan would kill his enemy, wished to resume the fight. D'Artagnan perceived that it would be disobliging Athos not to leave him alone, and in a few minutes Cahusac fell with a sword thrust through his throat. At the same instant Aramis placed his sword-point on the breast of his fallen enemy and forced him to ask for mercy. There only then remained Porthos and Bicarat. Porthos made a thousand flourishes, asking Bicarat what o'clock it could be, and offering him compliments upon his brothers having just obtained a company in the regiment of Navarre. But just as he might, he gained nothing. Bicarat was one of those iron men who never fell dead. Nevertheless, it was necessary to finish. The watch might come up and take all the combatants, wounded or not, royalists or cardinalists. Athos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan surrounded Bicarat and required him to surrender. Though alone against all, and with a wound in his thigh, Bicarat wished to hold out, 
but Juzac, who had risen upon his elbow, cried out to him to yield. Picarat was a Gascon, as D'Artagnan was. He turned a deaf ear, and contented himself with laughing, and between two parries finding time to point to a spot of earth with his sword. Here, cried he, parodying a verse of the Bible, here will Bicarat die, for I only am left, and they seek my life. But there are four against you. Leave off, I command you. Ah, if you command me, that's another thing, said Bicarat. As you are my commander, it is my duty to obey. And springing backward, he broke his sword across his knee to avoid the necessity of surrendering it, threw the pieces over the convent wall, and crossed his arms, whistling a cardinalist air. Bravery is always respected, even in an enemy. The musketeers saluted Bicarat with their swords, and returned them to their sheaths. D'Artagnan did the same. Then, assisted by Bicarat, the only one left standing, he bore Juzac, Cahusac, and one of Aramis's adversaries, who was only wounded under the porch of the convent. The fourth, as we have said, was dead. They then rang the bell, and carrying away four swords out of five, they took their road, intoxicated with joy, toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville. They walked arm in arm, occupying the whole width of the street, and taking in every musketeer they met, so that in the end it became a triumphal march. The heart of D'Artagnan swam in delirium. He marched between Athos and Porthos, pressing them tenderly. "'If I am not yet a musketeer,' said he to his new friends, as he passed through the gateway of Monsieur de Treville's hotel, "'at least I have entered upon my apprenticeship, haven't I?' End of chapter 5「Monsieur de Treville scolded his musketeers in public, and congratulated them in private. But as no time was to be lost in gaining the king, Monsieur de Treville hastened to report himself at the Louvre. It was already too late. The king was closeted with the cardinal, and Monsieur de Treville was informed that the king was busy, and could not receive him at that moment. In the evening, Monsieur de Treville attended the king's gaming table. The king was winning, and as he was very avaricious, he was in an excellent humor. Perceiving Monsieur de Treville at a distance, "'Come here, Monsieur Captain,' he said. "'Come here, that I may growl at you. Do you know that his eminence has been making fresh complaints against your musketeers, and that with so much emotion after this evening his eminence is indisposed?' Ah, these musketeers of yours are very devils, fellows to be hanged. No, sire, replied Treville, who saw at the first glance how things would go. On the contrary, they are good creatures, as meek as lambs, and have but one desire. I'll be their warranty, and that is that their swords may never leave their scabbards but in your majesty's service. But what are they to do? The guards of Monsieur the Cardinal are for ever seeking quarrels with them, and for the honor of the corps even, the poor young men are obliged to defend themselves. Listen to Monsieur de Treville, said the king, listen to him. Would not one say he was speaking of a religious community? In truth, my dear captain, I have a great mind to take away your commission and give it to Mademoiselle de Chamarot, to whom I promised an abbey. But don't fancy that I am going to take you on your bare word. I am called Louis the Just, Monsieur de Treville, and by and by, by and by, we will see. Ah, sire, it is because I confide in that justice that I shall wait patiently and quietly the good pleasure of your majesty. Wait, then, Monsieur, wait, said the king. I will not detain you long. In fact, fortune changed, and as the king began to lose what he had won, he was not sorry to find an excuse for playing Charlemagne, if we may use a gaming phrase of whose origin we confess our ignorance. The king therefore arose a minute after, and putting the money which lay before him into his pocket, the major part of which arose from his winnings, La Vouéville, said he, take my place. I must speak to Monsieur de Treville on an affair of importance. Ah, I had eighty louis before me, 
put down the same sum, so that they who have lost may have nothing to complain of, justice before everything. Then turning toward Monsieur de Treville, and walking with him toward the embrasure of a window, "'Well, Monsieur,' continued he, "'you say it is his eminence's guard to have sought a quarrel with your musketeers? "'Yes, sire, as they always do. "'And how did the thing happen? "'Let us see, for you know, my dear captain, a judge must hear both sides.' "'Good Lord, in the most simple and natural manner possible, three of my best soldiers, whom your Majesty knows by name, and whose devotedness you have more than once appreciated, and who have, I dare affirm to the King, his service much at heart, three of my best soldiers, I say, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, had made a party of pleasure with a young fellow from Gascony, whom I had introduced to them the same morning. The party was to take place at St. Germain, I believe, and they had appointed to meet at the Carme des Chaux, where they were disturbed by de Jusac, Cahuzac, and Bicara, and two other guardsmen, who certainly did not go there in such a numerous company without some ill intention against the edicts. Ah, ah, you incline me to think so, said the king. There is no doubt they went thither to fight themselves. I do not accuse them, sire, but I leave your majesty to judge what five armed men could possibly be going to do in such a deserted place as the neighborhood of the convent des Carmes. Yes, you are right, Treville, you are right. Then, upon seeing my musketeers, they changed their minds, and forgot their private hatred for partisan hatred, for your majesty could not be ignorant that the musketeers, who belong to the king, and nobody but the king, are the natural enemies of the guardsmen, who belong to the cardinal. Yes, Treville, yes, said the king in a melancholy tone. And it is very sad, believe me, to see thus two parties in France, two heads to royalty. But all this will come to an end, Treville, will come to an end. You say, then, that the guardsmen sought a quarrel with the musketeers? I say that it is probable that things have fallen out so, but I will not swear to it, sire. You know how difficult it is to discover the truth, and unless a man be endowed with that admirable instinct which causes Louis the Thirteenth to be named the just— you are right, Treville, but they were not alone, your musketeers. They had a youth with them? Yes, sire, and one wounded man, so that three of the king's musketeers, one of whom was wounded, and a youth, not only maintained their ground against five of the most terrible of the cardinal's guardsmen, but absolutely brought four of them to earth. Why, this is a victory, cried the king, all radiant, a complete victory. Yes, sire, as complete as that as the bridge of Say. Four men, one of them wounded, and a youth, say you? One hardly a young man, but who, however, behaved himself so admirably on this occasion that I will take the liberty of recommending him to your majesty. How does he call himself? D'Artagnan, sire. He is the son of one of my oldest friends, the son of a man who served under the king your father, of glorious memory, in the Civil War. And you say this young man behaved himself well? Tell me how, Treville, you know how I delight in accounts of war and fighting. And Louis the Thirteenth twisted his moustache proudly, placing his hand upon his hip. Sire, resumed Treville, as I told you, Monsieur d'Artagnan is a little more than a boy, and he has not the honor of being a musketeer. He was dressed as a citizen. The guards of the cardinal, perceiving his youth and that he did not belong to the corps, invited him to retire before they attacked. "'So you may plainly see, Treville interrupted the king. "'It was they who attacked?' "'That is true, sire. There can be no more doubt on that head.' "'They called upon him then to retire, but he answered that he was a musketeer at heart, "'entirely devoted to your majesty, and that therefore he would remain with Monsieur's the musketeers.' "'Brave young man,' murmured the king. Well, he did remain with them, and your majesty has in him so firm a champion that it was he who gave Jusac the terrible sword thrust which has made the cardinal so angry. He who wounded Jusac, cried the king, he a boy? Treville, that is impossible. It is as I have the honor to relate it to your majesty. Jusac, one of the first swordsmen in the kingdom? Well, sire, for once he found his master. I will see this young man, Treville. I will see him, and if anything can be done, well, we will make it our business. When will your majesty deign to receive him? Tomorrow at midday, Treville. 
Shall I bring him alone? No, bring me all four together. I wish to thank them all at once. Devoted men are so rare, Treville. By the back of the staircase. It is useless to let the cardinal know. Yes, sire. You understand, Treville, an edict is still an edict. It is forbidden to fight, after all. But this encounter, sire, is quite out of the ordinary conditions of a duel. It is a brawl, and the proof is that there were five of the cardinal's guardsmen against my three musketeers and Monsieur d'Artagnan. That is true, said the king, but never mind, Treville. Come still by the back staircase. Treville smiled. But as it was indeed something to have prevailed upon this child to rebel against his master, he saluted the king respectfully, and with this agreement took leave of him. That evening the three musketeers were informed of the honor accorded them. As they had long been acquainted with the king, they were not much excited, but D'Artagnan, with his Gascon imagination, saw in it his future fortune, and passed the night in golden dreams. By eight o'clock in the morning he was at the apartment of Athos. D'Artagnan found the musketeer dressed and ready to go out. As the hour to wait upon the king was not till twelve, he had made a party with Porthos and Aramis to play a game at tennis in a tennis court situated near the stables of Luxembourg. Athos invited D'Artagnan to follow them, and although ignorant of the game which he had never played, he accepted, not knowing what to do with his time from nine o'clock in the morning, as it then scarcely was, till twelve. The two musketeers were already there, and were playing together. Athos, who was very expert in all bodily exercises, passed with D'Artagnan to the opposite side and challenged them, but at the first effort he made, although he played with his left hand, he found that his wound was yet too recent to allow of such exertion. D'Artagnan remained therefore alone, and as he declared he was too ignorant of the game to play it regularly, they only continued giving balls to one another without counting. But one of these balls, launched by Porthos's Herculean hand, passed so close to D'Artagnan's face that he thought if, instead of passing near it, it hit him, his audience would have been probably lost, as it would have been impossible for him to present himself before the king. Now, as upon this audience, in his Gascon imagination, depended his future life, he saluted Aramis and Porthos politely, declaring that he would not resume the game until he should be prepared to play with them on more equal terms, and went and took his place near the court and in the gallery. Unfortunately for D'Artagnan among the spectators was one of his eminence's guardsmen, who, still irritated by the defeat of his companions, which had happened only the day before, had promised himself to seize the first opportunity of avenging it. He believed this opportunity was now come, and addressed his neighbor. It is not astonishing that a young man should be afraid of a ball, for he is doubtless a musketeer apprentice. D'Artagnan turned round as if a serpent had stung him, and fixed his eyes intensely upon the guardsman who had just made this insolent speech. Pardieu, resumed the latter, twisting his moustache, look at me as long as you like, my little gentleman. I have said what I have said. And as since that which you have said is too clear to require an explanation, replied D'Artagnan in a low voice, I beg you to follow me. And when, asked the guardsman, with the same jeering air, at once, if you please, and you know who I am, without doubt? I? I'm completely ignorant, nor does it much disquiet me. You're in the wrong there, for if you knew my name, perhaps you would not be so pressing. What is your name? Bernajot, at your service. Well then, Monsieur Bernajot, said D'Artagnan tranquilly, I will wait for you at the door. Go, Monsieur, I will follow you. Do not hurry yourself, Monsieur, lest it be observed that we go out together. You must be aware that for our undertaking, company would be in the way. That's true, said the guardsman, astonished that his name had not produced more effect upon the young man. Indeed, the name of Bernajot was known to all the world, D'Artagnan alone excepted, perhaps, for it was one of those of which figured most frequently in the daily brawls which all the edicts of the cardinal could not repress. Porthos and Aramis were so engaged with their game, and Athos was watching them with so much attention, that they did not even perceive their young companion go out, who, as he had told the guardsman of his eminence, stopped outside the door. An instant after, the guardsman descended in his turn, as D'Artagnan had no time to lose on account of the audience of the king, which was fixed for midday 
cast his eyes around, and seeing that the street was empty, said to his adversary, "'My faith, it is fortunate for you, although your name is Bernajo, to have only to deal with an apprentice musketeer. Never mind, be content, I will do my best. On guard!' But, said he, whom D'Artagnan thus provoked, it appears to me that this place is badly chosen, and that we should be better behind the Abbey St. Germain or in the Pré aux Clairs. What you say is full of sense, replied D'Artagnan, but unfortunately I have very little time to spare, having an appointment at precisely twelve. On guard, then, monsieur, on guard! Bernajot was not a man to have such a compliment paid to him twice. In an instant his sword glittered in his hand, and he sprang upon his adversary, whom, thanks to his great youthfulness, he hoped to intimidate. But D'Artagnan had, on the preceding day, served his apprenticeship. Fresh sharpened by his victory, full of hopes of future favor, he was resolved not to recoil a step. So the two swords were crossed close to the hilts, and as D'Artagnan stood firm, it was his adversary who made the retreating step. But D'Artagnan seized the moment at which, in this movement, the sword of Bernajot deviated from the line. He freed his weapon, made a lunge, and touched his adversary on the shoulder. D'Artagnan immediately made a step backward and raised his sword, but Bernajot cried out that it was nothing, and rushing blindly upon him, absolutely spitted himself upon D'Artagnan's sword. As, however, he did not fall, as he did not declare himself conquered, but only broke away toward the hotel of Monsieur de la Tremouille, in whose service he had a relative, D'Artagnan was ignorant of the seriousness of the last wound his adversary had received, and pressing him warmly, without doubt, would soon have completed his work with a third blow, when the noise which arose from the street being heard in the tennis court, two of the friends of the guardsman who had seen him go out after exchanging some words with D'Artagnan, rushed sword in hand from the court, and fell upon the conqueror. But Athos, Porthos, and Aramis quickly appeared in their turn, and the moment the two guardsmen attacked their young companion, drove them back. Bernajot now fell, and as the guardsmen were only two against four, they began to cry, "'To the rescue! The Hôtel de la Tremouille!' At these cries all who were in the hotel rushed out, and fell upon the four companions, who, on their side, cried aloud, "'To the rescue, musketeers!' This cry was generally heeded, for the musketeers were known to be enemies of the cardinal, and were beloved on account of the hatred they bore to his eminence. Thus the soldiers of other companies than those which belonged to the Red Duke, as Aramis had called him, often took part with the king's musketeers in these quarrels. Of three guardsmen of the company of Monsieur Dessessar, who were passing, two came to the assistance of the four companions, while the other ran toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, crying, "'To the rescue, musketeers, to the rescue!' As usual, the hotel was full of soldiers of this company, who hastened to the succor of their comrades. The melee became general, but strength was on the side of the musketeers. The cardinal's guards and Monsieur de la Tremouille's people retreated into the hotel, the doors of which they closed just in time to prevent their enemies from entering with them. As to the wounded man, he had been taken in at once, and, as we have said, in a very bad state." excitement was at its height among the musketeers and their allies and they even began to deliberate whether they should not set fire to the hotel to punish the insolence of monsieur de la tremouille's domestics in daring to make a sortie upon the king's musketeers the proposition had been made and received with enthusiasm when fortunately eleven o'clock struck D'Artagnan and his companions remembered their audience, and as they would very much have regretted that such an opportunity should be lost, they succeeded in calming their friends, who contented themselves with hurling some paving-stones against the gates. But the gates were too strong. They soon tired of the sport. Besides, those who must be considered the leaders of the enterprise had quit the group, and were making their way toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, who was waiting for them, already informed of this fresh disturbance quick to the louvre said he to the louvre without losing an instant and let us endeavour to see the king before he is prejudiced by the cardinal we will describe the thing to him as a consequence of the affair of yesterday and the two will pass off together Monsieur de treville accompanied by the four young fellows directed his course toward the louvre but to the great astonishment of the captain of the musketeers he was informed that the king had gone stag-hunting in the forest of st germain 
Monsieur de Treville required this intelligence to be repeated to him twice, and each time his companion saw his brow become darker. Had his majesty, asked he, any intention of holding this hunting party yesterday? No, your excellency, replied the valet de chambre. The master of the hounds came this morning to inform him that he had marked down a stag. At first the king answered that he would not go, but he could not resist his love of sport, and set out after dinner. And the king has seen the cardinal? asked Monsieur de Treville. In all probability he has, replied the valet, for I saw the horses harnessed to his eminence's carriage this morning, and when I asked where he was going, they told me, to St. Germain. He is beforehand with us, said Monsieur de Treville. Gentlemen, I will see the king this evening, but as to you, I do not advise you to risk doing so. This advice was too reasonable, and moreover came from a man who knew the king too well, to allow the four young men to dispute it. Monsieur de Treville recommended every one to return home and wait for news. On entering his hotel, Monsieur de Treville thought it best to be first in making the complaint. He sent one of his servants to Monsieur de la Tremouille with a letter in which he begged of him to eject the cardinal's guardsmen from his house, and to reprimand his people for their audacity in making sortie against the king's musketeers. But Monsieur de la Tremouille, already prejudiced by his esquire, whose relative, as we already know, Bernageau was, replied that it was neither for Monsieur de Treville nor the musketeers to complain, but on the contrary for him, whose people the musketeers had assaulted, and whose hotel they had endeavoured to burn. Now, as the debate between these two nobles might last a long time, each becoming, naturally, more firm in his own opinion, Monsieur de Treville thought of an expedient which might terminate it quietly. This was to go himself to Monsieur de la Tremouille. He repaired, therefore, immediately to his hotel, and caused himself to be announced. The two nobles saluted each other politely, for if no friendship existed between them there was at least esteem. Both were men of courage and honour, and as Monsieur de la Tremouille, a Protestant, and seeing the king seldom, was of no party, he did not, in general, carry any bias into his social relations. This time, however, his address, although polite, was cooler than usual. Monsieur said Monsieur de Treville, we fancy that we have each cause to complain of the other, and I am come to endeavour to clear up this affair. I have no objection, replied Monsieur de la Tremouille, but I warn you that I am well informed, and all the fault is with your musketeers. You are too just and reasonable a man, Monsieur, said Treville, not to accept the proposal I am about to make to you. Make it, Monsieur, I listen. How is Monsieur Bernageau, your esquire's relative? Why, Monsieur, very ill indeed. In addition to the sword thrust in his arm, which is not dangerous, he has received another right through his lungs, of which the doctor says bad things. But the wounded man retained his senses? Perfectly. Does he talk? With difficulty, but he can speak. Well, Monsieur, let us go to him. Let us adjure him, in the name of the God before whom he must perhaps appear, to speak the truth. I will take him for judge in his own cause, Monsieur, and will believe what he will say. Monsieur de la Tremouille reflected for an instant. Then, as it was difficult to suggest a more reasonable proposal, he agreed to it. Both descended to the chamber in which the wounded man lay. The latter, on seeing these two noble lords who came to visit him, endeavoured to raise himself up in his bed, but he was too weak and exhausted by the effort. He fell back again almost senseless. Monsieur de la Tremouille approached him and made him inhale some salts which recalled him to life. Then Monsieur de Treville, unwilling that it should be thought that he had influenced the wounded man, requested Monsieur de la Tremouille to interrogate him himself. That happened which Monsieur de Treville had foreseen. Placed between life and death, as Bernageau was, he had no idea for a moment of concealing the truth, and he described to the two nobles the affair exactly as it had passed. This was all that Monsieur de Treville wanted. He wished Bernageau a speedy convalescence, took leave of Monsieur de la Tremouille, returned to his hotel, and immediately sent word to the four friends that he awaited their company at dinner. Monsieur de Treville entertained good company, wholly anti-cardinalist, though. It may be easily understood, therefore, 
the conversation during the whole of dinner turned upon the two checks that his eminence's guardsmen had received now as d'artagnan had been the hero of these two fights it was upon him that all felicitations fell which athos porthos and aramis abandoned to him not only as good comrades but as men who had so often had their turn that they could very well afford him his Toward six o'clock Monsieur de Treville announced that it was time to go to the Louvre, but as the hour of the audience granted by His Majesty was past, instead of claiming the entry by the back stairs, he placed himself with the four young men in the antechamber. The king had not yet returned from hunting. Our young men had been waiting about half an hour amid a crowd of courtiers, when all the doors were thrown open and His Majesty was announced. At his announcement D'Artagnan felt himself tremble to the very marrow of his bones. The coming instant would in all probability decide the rest of his life. His eyes, therefore, were fixed in a sort of agony upon the door through which the king must enter. Louis the Thirteenth appeared walking fast. He was in hunting costume, covered with dust, wearing large boots, and holding a whip in his hand. At the first glance, D'Artagnan judged that the mind of the king was stormy. This disposition, visible as it was in his majesty, did not prevent the courtiers from ranging themselves along his pathway. In royal antechambers, it is worth more to be viewed with an angry eye than not to be seen at all. The three musketeers, therefore, did not hesitate to make a step forward. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, remained concealed behind them, but although the king knew Athos, Porthos, and Aramis personally, he passed before them without speaking, or looking, indeed, as if he had ever seen them before. As for Monsieur de Treville, when the eyes of the king fell upon him, he sustained the look with so much firmness that it was the king who dropped his eyes, after which his majesty, grumbling, entered his apartment. "'Matters go but badly,' said Athos, smiling, "'and we shall not be made chevaliers of the order this time.' "'Wait here ten minutes,' said Monsieur de Treville, "'and if at the expiration of ten minutes you do not see me come out, "'return to my hotel, for it will be useless for you to wait for me longer.' "'The four young men waited ten minutes, a quarter of an hour, twenty minutes, "'and seeing that Monsieur de Treville did not return, "'went away very uneasy as to what was going to happen.' Monsieur de Treville entered the king's cabinet boldly, and found his majesty in a very ill humor, seated on an armchair, beating his boot with the handle of his whip. This, however, did not prevent his asking, with the greatest coolness, after his majesty's health. "'Bad, Monsieur, bad,' replied the king, "'I am bored.' This was, in fact, the worst complaint of Louis the Thirteenth, who would sometimes take one of his courtiers to a window and say, Monsieur so-and-so, let us weary ourselves together. How, your majesty is bored, have you not enjoyed the pleasures of the chase to-day? A fine pleasure, indeed, Monsieur. Upon my soul, everything degenerates, and I don't know whether it is the game which leaves no scent, or the dogs that have no noses. We started a stag of ten branches, we chased him for six hours, and when he was near being taken, when St. Simon was already putting his horn to his mouth to sound the mort, crack! All the pack takes the wrong scent and sets off after a two-year-older. I shall be obliged to give up hunting, as I have given up hawking. Ah, I am an unfortunate king, Monsieur de Treville. I had but one gerfalcon, and he died day before yesterday. Indeed, sire, I wholly comprehend your disappointment. The misfortune is great, but I think you still have a good number of falcons, sparrow-hawks, and tear-sets. And not a man to instruct them. Falconers are declining. I know no one but myself who is acquainted with the noble art of venery. After me it will all be over, and people will hunt with gins, snares, and traps. If I had but the time to train pupils! But there is the cardinal, always at hand, who does not leave me a moment's repose, who talks to me about Spain, who talks to me about Austria, who talks to me about England. Ah! A propos of the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville, I am vexed with you. This was the chance at which Monsieur de Treville waited for the king. He knew the king of old, and he knew that all these complaints were but a preface, a sort of excitation to encourage himself, and that he had now come to his point at last. "'And in what have I been so unfortunate as to displease your majesty?' asked Monsieur de Treville, feigning the most profound astonishment. 
"'Is it thus you perform your charge, monsieur?' continued the king, without directly replying to de Treville's question. "'Is it for this I name you captain of my musketeers, that they should assassinate a man, disturb a whole quarter, and endeavour to set fire to Paris, without your saying a word?' but yet continued the king undoubtedly my haste accuses you wrongfully without doubt the rioters are in prison and you come to tell me justice is done sire replied monsieur de treville calmly on the contrary i come to demand it of you and against whom cried the king against calumniators said monsieur de treville ah this is something new replied the king will you tell me that your three damned musketeers athos porthos and aramis and your youngster from berne have not fallen like so many furies upon poor bernajot and have not maltreated him in such a fashion that probably by this time he is dead will you tell me that they did not lay siege to the hotel of duc de la tremouille and that they did not endeavour to burn it which would not perhaps have been a great misfortune in time of war seeing that it is nothing but a nest of huguenots but which is in time of peace a frightful example tell me now can you deny all this and who told you this fine story sire asked treville quietly who has told me this fine story monsieur who should it be but he who watches while i sleep who labours while i amuse myself who conducts everything at home and abroad in france as in europe your majesty probably refers to god said monsieur de treville for i know no one except god who can be so far above your majesty no monsieur i speak of the prop of the state of my only servant of my only friend of the cardinal his eminence is not his holiness sire what do you mean by that monsieur that it is only the pope who is infallible and that this infallibility does not extend to cardinals you mean to say that he deceives me you mean to say that he betrays me you accuse him then come speak avow freely that you accuse him no sire but i say that he deceives himself i say that he is ill-informed i say that he has hastily accused your majesty's musketeers toward whom he is unjust and that he has not obtained his information from good sources the accusation comes from monsieur de la tremouille from the duke himself what do you say to that i might answer sire that he is too deeply interested in the question to be a very impartial witness but so far from that sire i know the duke to be a royal gentleman and i refer the matter to him but upon one condition sire what it is that your majesty will make him come here will interrogate him yourself tete a tete without witnesses and that i shall see your majesty as soon as you have seen the duke what then you will bind yourself cried the king by what monsieur de la tremouille shall say yes sire you will accept his judgment undoubtedly and you will submit to the reparation he may require certainly la chesne said the king la chesne louis the thirteenth's confidential valet who never left the door entered in reply to the call la chesne said the king let some one go instantly and find monsieur de la tremouille i wish to speak with him this evening your majesty gives me your word that you will not see any one between monsieur de la tremouille and myself nobody by the faith of a gentleman to-morrow then sire to-morrow monsieur at what o'clock please your majesty at any hour you will but in coming too early i should be afraid of awakening your majesty awaken me do you think i ever sleep then i sleep no longer monsieur i sometimes dream that's all come then as early as you like at seven o'clock but beware if you and your musketeers are guilty if my musketeers are guilty sire the guilty shall be placed in your majesty's hands who will dispose of them at your good pleasure does your majesty require anything further speak i am ready to obey no monsieur no i am not called louis the just without reason to-morrow then monsieur to-morrow till then god preserve your majesty however ill the king might sleep monsieur de treville slept still worse he had ordered his three musketeers and their companion to be with him at half-past six in the morning he took them with him without encouraging them or promising them anything and without concealing from them that their luck and even his own depended upon the cast of the dice arrived at the front of the back stairs he desired them to wait if the king was still irritated against them they would depart without being seen if the king consented to see them they would only have to be called 
on arriving at the king's private antechamber monsieur de treville found la chesnay who informed him that they had not been able to find monsieur de la tremouille on the preceding evening at his hotel that he returned too late to present himself at the louvre that he had only that moment arrived and that he was at that very hour with the king this circumstance pleased monsieur de treville much as he thus became certain that no foreign suggestion could insinuate itself between monsieur de la tremouille's testimony and himself in fact ten minutes had scarcely passed away when the door of the king's closet opened and monsieur de treville saw monsieur de la tremouille come out the duke came straight up to him and said monsieur de treville his majesty has just sent for me in order to inquire respecting the circumstances which took place yesterday at my hotel i have told him the truth that is to say that the fault lay with my people and that i was ready to offer you my excuses since i have the good fortune to meet you i beg you to receive them and to hold me always as one of your friends monsieur the duke said monsieur de treville i was so confident of your loyalty that i required no other defender before his majesty than yourself i find that i have not been mistaken and i thank you that there is still one man in france of whom may be said without disappointment what i have said of you that's well said cried the king who had heard all these compliments through the open door only tell him treville since he wishes to be considered your friend that i also wish to be one of his but he neglects me that it is nearly three years since i have seen him and that i never do see him unless i send for him tell him all this for me for these are things which a king cannot say for himself thanks sire thanks said the duke but your majesty may be assured that it is not those i do not speak of monsieur de treville whom your majesty sees at all hours of the day that are most devoted to you ah you have heard what i said so much the better duke so much the better said the king advancing toward the door ah it is you treville where are your musketeers i told you the day before yesterday to bring them with you why have you not done so they are below sire and with your permission la chesnay will bid them come up yes yes let them come up immediately it is nearly eight o'clock and at nine i expect a visit go monsieur duke and return often come in treville the duke saluted and retired at the moment he opened the door the three musketeers and d'artagnan conducted by la chesnay appeared at the top of the staircase come in my braves said the king come in i am going to scold you the musketeers advanced bowing d'artagnan following closely behind them what the devil continued the king seven of his eminence's guards placed hors de combat by you four in two days that's too many gentlemen too many if you go on so his eminence will be forced to renew his company in three weeks and i to put the edicts in force in all their rigour one now and then i don't say too much about but seven in two days i repeat it is too many it is far too many therefore sire your majesty sees that they are come quite contrite and repentant to offer you their excuses quite contrite and repentant hm said the king i place no confidence in their hypocritical faces in particular there is one yonder of a gascon look come hither monsieur d'artagnan who understood that it was to him this compliment was addressed approached assuming a most deprecating air why you told me he was a young man this is a boy treville a mere boy do you mean to say that it was he who bestowed that severe thrust at Jusac? and those two equally fine thrusts at bernajot truly without reckoning said athos that if he had not rescued me from the hands of cahusac i should not now have the honor of making my very humble reverence to your majesty why he is a very devil this bernay vent saint gris monsieur de treville as the king my father would have said but at this sort of work many doublets must be slashed and many swords broken now gascons are always poor are they not sire i can assert that they have hitherto discovered no gold mines in their mountains though the lord owes them this miracle in recompense for the manner in which they supported the pretensions of the king your father which is to say that the gascons made a king of me myself seeing that i am my father's son is it not treville well happily i don't say nay to it la chesnay go and see if by rummaging all my pockets you can find forty pistoles and if you can find them bring them to me and now let us see young man with your hand upon your conscience how did all this come to pass 
D'Artagnan related the adventure of the preceding day in all its details, how, not having been able to sleep for the joy he felt in the expectation of seeing His Majesty, he had gone to his three friends three hours before the hour of audience, how they had gone together to the tennis court, and how, upon the fear he had manifested lest he receive a ball in the face, he had been jeered at by Bernajot, who had nearly paid for his jeer with his life, and Monsieur de la Tremouille, who had nothing to do with the matter, with the loss of his hotel. "'This is all very well,' murmured the king. "'Yes, this is just the account the duke gave me of the affair. "'Poor cardinal! Seven men in two days, and those of his very best! "'But that's quite enough, gentlemen, please, to understand. "'That's enough. "'You have taken your revenge for the Rue Ferro, and even exceeded it. "'You ought to be satisfied.' "'If your majesty is so,' said Treville, "'we are.' "'Oh, yes, I am.' added the king, taking a handful of gold from La Chesnay, and putting it into the hand of D'Artagnan. Here, said he, is a proof of my satisfaction. At this epoch the ideas of pride which are in fashion in our days did not prevail. A gentleman received from hand to hand money from the king, and was not the least in the world humiliated. D'Artagnan put his forty pistoles into his pocket without any scruple, on the contrary thanking his majesty greatly. "'There,' said the king, looking at a clock. "'There, now. As it is half-past eight, you may retire, for, as I told you, I expect some one at nine. Thanks for your devotedness, gentlemen. I may continue to rely upon it, may I not?' "'Oh, sire!' cried the four companions, with one voice. "'We would allow ourselves to be cut to pieces in your majesty's service. "'Well, well, but keep whole. That will be better, and you will be as more useful to me.' treville added the king in a low voice as the others were retiring as you have no room in the musketeers and as we have besides decided that a novitiate is necessary before entering that corps place this young man in the company of the guards of monsieur dessessar your brother-in-law ah pardieu treville i enjoy beforehand the face of the cardinal will make he will be furious but i don't care i am doing what is right the king waved his hand to Treville, who left him and rejoined the musketeers, whom he found sharing the forty pistoles with D'Artagnan. The cardinal, as his majesty had said, was really furious, so furious that during eight days he absented himself from the king's gaming table. This did not prevent the king from being as complacent to him as possible whenever he met him, or from asking in the kindest tone, "'Well, monsieur cardinal, how fair is it with the poor Jusac and that poor Bernajot of yours?' End of chapter 6《This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. • Recorded by Kevin Kivico • The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas • Chapter 7 • The Interior of the Musketeers • When D'Artagnan was out of the Louvre, and consulted his friends upon the use he had best make of his share of the forty pistoles, Athos advised him to order a good repast at the Pomme de Pin, Porthos to engage a lackey, and Aramis to provide himself with a suitable mistress. The repast was carried into effect that very day, and the lackey waited at table. The repast had been ordered by Athos, and the lackey furnished by Porthos. He was a Picard, whom the glorious musketeer had picked up at the bridge tournelle, making rings and plashing in the water. Porthos pretended that this occupation was proof of a reflective and contemplative organization, and he had brought him away without any other recommendation. The noble carriage of this gentleman, for whom he believed himself to be engaged, had one planchet. That was the name of the Picard. He felt a slight disappointment, however, when he saw that this place was already taken by a compeer named Mousqueton, and when Porthos signified to him that this state of his household, though great, would not support two servants, and that he must enter into the service of D'Artagnan. Nevertheless, when he waited at the dinner given by his master, and saw him take out a handful of gold to pay for it, he believed his fortune made, and returned thanks to heaven for having thrown him into the service of such a Croesus. He preserved this opinion even after the feast, with the remnants of which he repaired his own long abstinence, but when in the evening he made his master's bed, the chimeras of Planchet faded away. 
the bed was the only one in the apartment which consisted of an antechamber and a bedroom planchet slept in the antechamber upon a coverlet taken from the bed of d'artagnan and which d'artagnan from that time made shift to do without athos on his part had a valet whom he had trained in his service in a thoroughly peculiar fashion and who was named grimaud he was very taciturn this worthy seigneur be it understood we are speaking of athos during the five or six years that he had lived in the strictest intimacy with his companions porthos and aramis they could remember having often seen him smile but had never heard him laugh his words were brief and expressive conveying all that was meant and no more no embellishments no embroidery no arabesques his conversation a matter of fact without a single romance although athos was scarcely thirty years old and was of great personal beauty and intelligence of mind no one knew whether he had ever had a mistress he had never spoken of women he certainly did not prevent others from speaking of them before him although it was easy to perceive that this kind of conversation in which he only mingled by bitter words and misanthropic remarks was very disagreeable to him his reserve his roughness and his silence made almost an old man of him he had then in order not to disturb his habits accustomed grimaud to obey him upon a simple gesture or upon a simple movement of his lips he never spoke to him except under the most extraordinary occasions sometimes grimaud who feared his master as he did fire while entertaining a strong attachment to his person and a great veneration for his talents believed he perfectly understood what he wanted flew to execute the order received and did precisely the contrary athos then shrugged his shoulders and without putting himself in a passion thrashed grimaud on these days he spoke a little porthos as we have seen had a character exactly opposite to that of athos he not only talked much but he talked loudly little caring we must render him that justice whether anybody listened to him or not he talked for the pleasure of talking and for the pleasure of hearing himself talk he spoke upon all subjects except the sciences alleging in this respect the inveterate hatred he had borne to scholars from his childhood he had not so noble an air as athos and the commencement of their intimacy often rendered him unjust toward that gentleman whom he endeavored to eclipse by his splendid dress but with his simple musketeer's uniform and nothing but the manner in which he threw back his head and advanced his foot athos instantly took the place which was his due and consigned the ostentatious porthos to the second rank porthos consoled himself by filling the antechamber of m de Tourville and the guard-room of the louvre with the accounts of his love scrapes after having passed from professional ladies to military ladies from the lawyer's dame to the baroness there was question of nothing less with porthos than a foreign princess who was enormously fond of him an old proverb says like master like man let us pass then from the valet of athos to the valet of porthos from grimaud to mousqueton mousqueton was a norman whose specific name of boniface his master had changed into the infinitely more sonorous name of mousqueton he had entered the service of porthos upon condition that he should only be clothed and lodged though in a handsome manner but he claimed two hours a day to himself consecrated to an employment which would provide for his other wants porthos agreed to the bargain the thing suited him wonderfully well he had doublets cut out of his old clothes and cast off cloaks for mousqueton and thanks to a very intelligent tailor who made his clothes look as good as new by turning them and whose wife was suspected of wishing to make porthos descend from his aristocratic habits mousqueton made a very good figure when attending on his master as for aramis of whom we believe we have sufficiently explained the character a character which like that of his lackey was called bazin thanks to the hopes which his master entertained of some day entering into orders he was always clothed in black 
as became the servant of a churchman. He was a Berichon, thirty-five or forty years old, mild, peaceable, sleek, employing the leisure his master left him in the perusal of pious works, providing rigorously for two a dinner of few dishes, but excellent. For the rest he was dumb, blind, and deaf, and of unimpeachable fidelity. And now that we are acquainted, superficially at least, with the masters and the valets, let us pass on to the dwellings occupied by each of them. Athos dwelt in the Rue Ferru, within two steps of the Luxembourg. His apartment consisted of two small chambers, very nicely fitted up, in a furnished house, the hostess of which, still young and still really handsome, cast tender glances uselessly at him. Some fragments of past splendor appeared here and there upon the walls of this modest lodging. A sword, for example, richly embossed, which belonged by its make to the times of Francis I, the hilt of which alone, encrusted with precious stones, might be worth two hundred pistoles and which nevertheless in his moments of greatest distress athos had never pledged or offered for sale it had long been an object of ambition for porthos porthos would have given ten years of his life to possess this sword one day when he had an appointment with the duchess he endeavored even to borrow it of athos Athos, without saying anything, emptied his pockets, got together all his jewels, purses, aiguillettes, and gold chains, and offered them all to Porthos. But as to the sword, he said it was sealed to its place and should never quit it, until its master should call himself quit his lodgings. In addition to the sword, there was a portrait representing a nobleman of the time of Henry the Third, dressed with the greatest elegance, and who wore the order of the Holy Ghost. And this portrait had certain resemblances of lines with Athos, certain family likenesses which indicated that this great noble, a knight of the order of the king, was his ancestor. Besides these, a casket of magnificent gold work, with the same arms as the sword and the portrait, formed a middle ornament to the mantelpiece, and assorted badly with the rest of the furniture. Athos always carried the key of this coffer about him. But he one day opened it before Porthos, and Porthos was convinced that this coffer contained nothing but letters and papers, love letters and family papers, no doubt. Porthos lived in an apartment large in size and of very sumptuous appearance in the Rue du Vieux Colombier. Every time he passed with a friend before his windows, at one of which Mousqueton was sure to be placed in full livery, Porthos raised his head and his hand and said, That is my abode. But he was never to be found at home, he never invited anybody to go up with him, and no one could form an idea of what his sumptuous apartment contained in the shape of real riches. As to Aramis, he dwelt in a little lodging composed of a boudoir, an eating-room, and a bedroom, which room, situated as the others were on the ground floor, looked out upon a little fresh green garden, shady and impenetrable to the eyes of his neighbors. With regard to D'Artagnan, we know how he was lodged, and we have already made acquaintance with his lackey, Master Planchet. D'Artagnan, who was by nature very curious, as people generally are who possess the genius of intrigue, did all he could to make out who Athos, Porthos, and Aramis really were, for under these pseudonyms each of these young men concealed his family name, Athos in particular, who a league away savored of nobility. He addressed himself then to Porthos to gain information respecting Athos and Aramis, and to Aramis in order to learn something of Porthos. Unfortunately, Porthos knew nothing of the life of his silent companion but what revealed itself. It was said Athos had met with great crosses in love, and that a frightful treachery had forever poisoned the life of this gallant man. What could this treachery be? All the world was ignorant of it. 
as to porthos except his real name as was the case with those of his two comrades his life was very easily known vain and indiscreet it was as easy to see through him as through a crystal the only thing to mislead the investigator would have been belief in all the good things he said of himself with respect to aramis though having the air of having nothing secret about him he was a young fellow made up of mysteries answering little to questions put to him about others and having learned from him the report which prevailed concerning the success of the musketeer with a princess wished to gain a little insight into the amorous adventures of his interlocutor and you my dear companion said he you speak of the baronesses countesses and princesses of others Pardieu, I spoke of them because Porthos talked of them himself, because he had paraded all these fine things before me. But be assured, my dear Monsieur d'Artagnan, that if I had obtained them from any other source, or if they had been confided to me, there exists no confessor more discreet than myself. Oh, I don't doubt that, replied d'Artagnan. "'But it seems to me that you are terribly familiar with coats of arms. "'A certain embroidered handkerchief, for instance, "'to which I owe the honor of your acquaintance.' "'This time Aramis was not angry, "'but assumed the most modest air and replied in a friendly tone, "'My dear friend, do not forget that I wish to belong to the church "'and that I avoid all mundane opportunities. "'The handkerchief you saw had not been given to me but it had been forgotten and left at my house by one of my friends i was obliged to pick it up in order not to compromise him and the lady he loves as for myself i neither have nor desire to have a mistress following in that respect the very judicious example of athos who has none any more than i have but what the devil you are not a priest you are a musketeer a musketeer for a time my friend as the cardinal says a musketeer against my will but a churchman at heart believe me athos and porthos dragged me into this to occupy me i had at the moment of being ordained a little difficulty with but but that would not interest you and i am taking up your valuable time oh, not at all it interests me very much cried d'artagnan and at this moment I have absolutely nothing to do. Yes, but I have my breviary to repeat, answered Aramis. Then some verses to compose, which Madame d'Aguillon begged of me. Then I must go to Rue Saint-Honoré in order to purchase some rouge for Madame de Chevreuse. So you see, my dear friend, that if you are not in a hurry, I am very much in a hurry. Aramis held out his hand in a cordial manner to his young companion and took leave of him notwithstanding all the pains he took d'artagnan was unable to learn any more concerning his three new-made friends he formed therefore the resolution of believing for the present all that was said of their past hoping for more certain and extended revelations in the future in the meanwhile he looked upon athos as an achilles porthos as an ajax and aramis as a joseph as to the rest the life of the four young friends was joyous enough athos played and that as a rule unfortunately nevertheless he never borrowed a sou of his companions although his purse was ever at their service and when he had played upon honor he always awakened his creditor by six o'clock the next morning to pay his debt of the preceding evening porthos had his fits on the days when he won he was insolent and ostentatious. If he lost, he disappeared completely for several days, after which he reappeared with a pale face and thinner person, but with money in his purse. As to Aramis, he never played. He was the worst musketeer and the most unconvivial companion imaginable. He had always something or other to do, sometimes in the midst of dinner, when everyone, under the attraction of wine and in the warmth of conversation, believed they had two or three hours longer to enjoy themselves at table, Aramis looked at his watch, arose with a bland smile, and took leave of the company to go, as he said, to consult a casuist with whom he had an appointment. 
At other times he would return home to write a treatise, and requested his friends not to disturb him. At this Athos would smile with his charming, melancholy smile, which so became his noble countenance, and Porthos would drink, swearing that Aramis would never be anything but a village cure. Planchet, d'Artagnan's valet, supported his good fortune nobly. He received a thirty sous per day, and for a month he returned to his lodgings, gay as a chaffinch, and affable toward his master. When the wind of adversity began to blow upon the housekeeping of the Rue des Fossoyeurs, that is to say, when the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth were consumed, or nearly so, he commenced complaints, which Athos thought nauseous, Porthos indecent, and Aramis ridiculous. Athos counseled D'Artagnan to dismiss the fellow. Porthos was of the opinion that he should give him a good thrashing first, and Aramis contended that a master should never attend to anything but the civilities paid to him. "'This is all very easy for you to say,' replied D'Artagnan, "'for you, Athos, who live like a dumb man with Grimaud, who forbid him to speak and consequently never exchange ill words with him, for you, Porthos, who carry matters in such a magnificent style, and are a god to your valet, Mousqueton, and for you, Aramis, who always abstracted by your theological studies inspire your servant, Bazin, a mild, religious man with a profound respect. But for me, who am without any settled means and without resources, for me, who am neither a musketeer nor even a guardsman, what am I to do to inspire either the affection, the terror, or the respect in Planchet? this is serious answered the three friends it is a family affair it is with valets as with wives they must be placed at once upon the footing in which you wish them to remain reflect upon it d'artagnan did reflect and resolved to thrash planchet provisionally which he did with the conscientiousness that d'artagnan carried into everything after having well beaten him he forbade him to leave his service without his permission for added he the future cannot fail to mend i inevitably look for better times your fortune is therefore made if you remain with me and i am too good a master to allow you to miss such a chance by granting you the dismissal you require this manner of acting roused much respect for d'artagnan's policy among the musketeers planchet was equally seized with admiration, and said no more about going away. The life of the four young men had become fraternal. D'Artagnan, who had no settled habits of his own, as he came from his province into the midst of his world quite new to him, fell easily into the habits of his friends. They rose about eight o'clock in the winter, about six in the summer, and went to take the countersign and see how things went on at Monsieur de Treville's. D'Artagnan, although he was not a musketeer, performed the duty of one with remarkable punctuality. He went on guard because he always kept company with whoever of his friends was on duty. He was well known at the hotel of the musketeers, where everyone considered him a good comrade. Monsieur de Treville, who had appreciated him at the first glance, and who bore him a real affection, never ceased recommending him to the king. On their side, the three musketeers were much attached to their young comrade. The friendship which united these four men, and the need they felt of seeing another three or four times a day, whether for dueling, business, or pleasure, caused them to be continually running after one another like shadows, and the inseparables were constantly to be met with seeking one another. From the Luxembourg to the Place Saint-Sulpice, or from the Rue de vieux Colombier to the Luxembourg. In the meanwhile, the promises of Monsieur de Treville went on prosperously. One fine morning the king commanded Monsieur de Chevalier d'Essersart to admit d'artagnan as a cadet in his company of guards d'artagnan with a sigh donned his uniform which he would have exchanged for that of a musketeer at the expense of ten years of his existence but monsieur de treville 
promised this favor after a novitiate of two years a novitiate which might besides be abridged if an opportunity should present itself for d'artagnan to render the king any signal service or to distinguish himself by some brilliant action upon this promise d'artagnan withdrew and the next day he began his service then it became the turn of athos porthos and aramis to mount guard with d'artagnan when he was on duty the company of monsieur le chevalier des Ersart thus received four instead of one when it admitted d'artagnan chapter eight of the three musketeers this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 8 Concerning a Court Intrigue In the meantime, the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth, like all other things of this world, after having had a beginning, had an end, and after this end our four companions began to be somewhat embarrassed. At first Athos supported the association for a time with his own means. Porthos succeeded him, and thanks to one of those disappearances to which he was accustomed, he was able to provide for the wants of all for a fortnight. At last it became Aramis's turn, who performed it with a good grace, and who succeeded, as he said by selling some theological books, in procuring a few pistoles. Then, as they had been accustomed to do, they had recourse to M. de Treville, who made some advances on their pay. But these advances could not go far with three musketeers who were already much in arrears, and a guardsman who as yet had no pay at all. At length, when they found they were likely to be really in want, they got together, as a last effort, eight or ten pistoles, with which Porthos went to the gambling table. Unfortunately he was in a bad vein. He lost all, together with twenty-five pistoles for which he had given his word. Then the inconvenience became distress. The hungry friends, followed by their lackeys, were seen haunting the quays and guard-rooms, picking up among their friends abroad all the dinners they could meet with, for according to the advice of Aramis it was prudent to sow repasts right and left in prosperity in order to reap a few in time of need. Athos was invited four times, and each time took his friends and their lackeys with him, Porthos had six occasions, and contrived in the same manner that his friends should partake of them. Aramis had eight of them. He was a man, as must have been already perceived, who made but little noise, and yet was much sought after. As to D'Artagnan, who as yet knew nobody in the capital, he only found one chocolate breakfast at the house of a priest of his own province, and one dinner at the house of a cornet of the guards. He took his army to the priests, where they devoured as much provision as would have lasted him for two months, and to the cornets, who performed wonders. But, as Planchet said, people do not eat once for all time, even when they eat a good deal. D'Artagnan thus felt himself humiliated in having only procured one meal and a half for his companions, as the breakfast at the priests could only be counted as half a repast, in return for the feasts which Athos, Porthos, and Aramis had procured him. He fancied himself a burden to the society, forgetting in his perfectly juvenile good faith that he had fed this society for a month. And he set his mind actively to work. He reflected that this coalition of four young, brave, enterprising, and active men ought to have some other object than swaggering walks, fencing lessons, and practical jokes, more or less witty. In fact, four men such as they were, four men devoted to one another, from their purses to their lives, 
four men always supporting one another, never yielding, executing singly or together the resolutions formed in common, four arms threatening the four cardinal points, or turning toward a single point, must inevitably, either subterraneously, in open day, by mining, in the trench, by cunning or by force, open themselves away toward the object they wish to attain, however well it might be defended, or however distant it may seem. The only thing that astonished D'Artagnan was that his friends had never thought of this. He was thinking by himself, and even seriously racking his brain to find a direction for this single force four times multiplied, with which he had no doubt, as with the lever for which Archimedes sought, they should succeed in moving the world, when someone tapped gently at his door. D'Artagnan awakened Planchet and ordered him to open it. From this phrase, D'Artagnan awakened Planchet, the reader must not suppose it was night, or that day was hardly come. No, it had just struck four. Planchet, two hours before, had asked his master for some dinner, and he had answered him with the proverb, He who sleeps dines, and Planchet dined by sleeping. A man was introduced, of simple mien, who had the appearance of a tradesman. Planchet, by way of dessert, would have liked to hear the conversation, but the citizen declared to D'Artagnan that, what he had to say being important and confidential, he desired to be left alone with him. D'Artagnan dismissed Planchet, and requested his visitor to be seated. There was a moment of silence, during which the two men looked at each other, as if to make a preliminary acquaintance, after which D'Artagnan bowed, as a sign that he listened. "'I have heard Monsieur D'Artagnan spoken of as a very brave young man,' said the citizen, "'and this reputation which he justly enjoys has decided me to confide a secret to him.' "'Speak, monsieur, speak,' said D'Artagnan, who instinctively scented something advantageous. The citizen made a fresh pause, and continued, "'I have a wife who is seamstress to the queen, monsieur, and who is not deficient in either virtue or beauty. I was induced to marry her about three years ago, although she had but very little dowry, because monsieur Laporte, the queen's cloak-bearer, is her godfather, and befriends her. "'Well, monsieur?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Well,' resumed the citizen, "'well, monsieur, my wife was abducted yesterday morning, as she was coming out of her workroom. "'And by whom was your wife abducted?' "'I know nothing surely, monsieur, but I suspect someone.' And who is the person whom you suspect? A man who has pursued her for a long time. The devil! But allow me to tell you, monsieur, continued the citizen, that I am convinced that there is less love than politics in all this. Less love than politics, replied D'Artagnan, with a reflective air. And what do you suspect? I do not know whether I ought to tell you what I suspect. Monsieur, I beg you to observe that I ask you absolutely nothing. It is you who have come to me. It is you who have told me that you had a secret to confide in me. Act, then, as you think proper. There is still time to withdraw. Uh, no, monsieur, no, no, no. You appear to be an honest young man, and I will have confidence in you. I believe, then, that it is not on account of any intrigues of her own that my wife has been arrested, but because of those of a lady much greater than herself. Ah, ah, can it be on account of the amours of Madame de Boitracy? said D'Artagnan, wishing to have the air, in the eyes of the citizen, of being posted as to court affairs. Higher, monsieur, higher! "'Of Madame d'Auguillon? 
still higher, of Madame de Chevreuse, of the... D'Artagnan checked himself. Yes, monsieur, replied the terrified citizen, in a tone so low that he was scarcely audible. And with whom? With whom can it be, if not the Duke of... The Duke of... Yes, monsieur, replied the citizen, giving a still fainter intonation to his voice. But how do you know all this? How do I know? Yes, how do you know it? No half-confidence, or... You understand? I know it from my wife, monsieur, from my wife herself. Who learns it from whom? From monsieur Laporte. Did I not tell you that she was the goddaughter of Monsieur Laporte, the confidential man of the Queen? Well, Monsieur Laporte placed her near Her Majesty in order that our poor Queen might at least have someone in whom she could place confidence. Abandoned as she is by the King, watched as she is by the Cardinal, betrayed as she is by everybody. "'Ah, ah, it begins to develop itself,' said D'Artagnan. "'Now, my wife came home four days ago, monsieur. "'One of her conditions was that she should come home and see me twice a week. "'For, as I had the honour to tell you, my wife loves me dearly. "'My wife, then, came and confided to me that the Queen, at that very moment—' entertained great fears truly yes the cardinal as it appears pursues her and persecutes her more than ever he cannot pardon her the history of the sarabande you know the history of the sarabande pardieu know it replied d'artagnan who knew nothing about it but who wished to appear to know everything that was going on so that now it is no longer hatred, but vengeance. Indeed. And the queen believes... Well, what does the queen believe? She believes that someone has written to the Duke of Buckingham in her name. In the queen's name? Yes, to make him come to Paris. And when once come to Paris to draw him into some snare. The devil! But your wife, monsieur, what has she to do with all this? Her devotion to the queen is known, and they wish either to remove her from her mistress, or to intimidate her, in order to obtain her majesty's secrets, or to seduce her and make use of her as a spy. That is likely, said D'Artagnan. But the man who has abducted her, do you know him? I have told you that I believe I know him. His name? I do not know that. What I do know is that he is a creature of the cardinal, his evil genius. But you have seen him. Yes, my wife pointed him out to me one day. Has he anything remarkable about him by which one may recognize him? Oh, certainly, he is a noble of very lofty carriage, black hair, swarthy complexion, piercing eye, white teeth, and has a scar on his temple. A scar on his temple, cried D'Artagnan, and with that, white teeth, a piercing eye, dark complexion, black hair, and haughty carriage. Why, that's my man of Mung. He is your man, do you say? Yes, yes. But that has nothing to do with it. No, no, I'm wrong. On the contrary, that simplifies the matter greatly. If your man is mine, with one blow I shall obtain two revenges. That's all. But where to find this man? I know not. Have you no information as to his abiding place? None. One day, as I was conveying my wife back to the Louvre, he was coming out as she was going in, and she showed him to me. The devil, the devil, murmured D'Artagnan. All this is vague enough, 
From whom have you learned of the abduction of your wife? From Monsieur Laporte. Did he give you any details? He knew none himself. And you have learned nothing from any other quarter? Yes, I have received... What? I fear I am committing a great imprudence. You always come back to that. But I must make you see this time that it is too late to retreat. I do not retreat. Mordieu! cried the citizen, swearing, in order to rouse his courage. Besides, by the faith of Bonacieux... You call yourself Bonacieux? interrupted D'Artagnan. Yes, that is my name. Ah, you said then, by the word of Bonacieux. Uh, pardon me for interrupting you, but it appears to me that the name is familiar to me. Possibly, monsieur. I am your landlord. Ah, ah, said D'Artagnan, half rising and bowing. You are my landlord? Yes, monsieur, yes. And as it is three months since you have been here, and though distracted as you must be in your important occupations, you have forgotten to pay me my rent, as I say, I have not tormented you a single instant. I thought you would appreciate my delicacy. How can it be otherwise, my dear Bonacieux? replied D'Artagnan. Trust me, I am fully grateful for your unparalleled conduct. And if, as I told you, I can be of any service to you... I believe you, monsieur, I believe you. And as I was about to say, by the word of Bonacieux, I have confidence in you. Finish, then, what you were about to say. The citizen took a paper from his pocket and presented it to D'Artagnan. A letter, said the young man, which I received this morning. D'Artagnan opened it, and as the day was beginning to decline, he approached the window to read it. The citizen followed him. Do not seek your wife, read D'Artagnan. She will be restored to you when there is no longer occasion for her. If you make a single step to find her, you are lost. That's pretty positive, continued D'Artagnan. But after all, it is but a menace. Yes, but that menace terrifies me. I am not a fighting man at all, monsieur. I am afraid of the Bastille. Hm, said D'Artagnan. I have no greater regard for the Bastille than you. If it were nothing but a sword thrust, why then? I have counted upon you on this occasion, monsieur. Yes? Seeing you constantly surrounded by musketeers of a very superb appearance, and knowing that these musketeers belonged to Monsieur de Treville, and were consequently enemies of the cardinal, I thought that you and your friends, while rendering justice to your poor queen, would be pleased to play his eminence an ill turn. Without doubt. And then I have thought that considering three months' lodging, about which I have said nothing, yes, yes, you have already given me that reason, and I find it excellent. Reckoning still further that as long as you do me the honour to remain in my house, I shall never speak to you about rent. Very kind. And uh, adding to this, if there be need of it, uh, meaning to offer you fifty pistoles, if, against all probability, uh, you should be short at the present moment? Admirable. You are rich, then, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux? I am comfortably off, Monsieur, that is all. I have uh, scraped together some such thing as an income of two or three thousand crowns at the abadashery business, but more particularly in venturing some funds in the last voyage of the celebrated navigator Jean Moquet. So that you understand, monsieur. But, cried the citizen, what? demanded D'Artagnan. Whom do I see yonder? Where? In the street, facing the window, in the embrasure of that door. A man wrapped in a cloak. It is he, cried D'Artagnan, and the citizen at the same time, each having recognized his man. 
"'Ah, this time!' cried D'Artagnan, springing to his sword. "'This time he will not escape me!' Drawing his sword from its scabbard, he rushed out of the apartment. On the staircase he met Athos and Porthos, who were coming to see him. They separated, and D'Artagnan rushed between them like a dart. "'Pah! Where are you going?' cried the two musketeers in a breath. "'The man of Mung!' replied D'Artagnan, and disappeared." d'artagnan had more than once related to his friends his adventure with the stranger as well as the apparition of the beautiful foreigner to whom this man had confided some important missive the opinion of athos was that d'artagnan had lost his letter in the skirmish a gentleman in his opinion and according to d'artagnan's portrait of him the stranger must be a gentleman would be incapable of the baseness of stealing a letter Porthos saw nothing in all this but a love-meeting, given by a lady to a cavalier, or by a cavalier to a lady, which had been disturbed by the presence of D'Artagnan and his yellow horse. Aramis said that as these sorts of affairs were mysterious, it was better not to fathom them. They understood, then, from the few words which escaped from D'Artagnan, what affair was in hand and as they thought that overtaking his man, or losing sight of him, D'Artagnan would return to his rooms, they kept on their way. When they entered D'Artagnan's chamber, it was empty. The landlord, dreading the consequences of the encounter which was doubtless about to take place between the young man and the stranger, had, consistent with the character he had given himself, judged it prudent to decamp. End of chapter 8。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Simon Taylor. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 9. D'Artagnan shows himself. As Athos and Porthos had foreseen, at the expiration of a half hour, D'Artagnan returned. He had again missed his man, who had disappeared as if by enchantment. D'Artagnan had run, sword in hand, through all the neighboring streets, but had found nobody resembling the man he sought for. Then he came back to the point where, perhaps, he ought to have begun. And that was to knock at the door against which the stranger had leaned. But this proved useless, for though he knocked ten or twelve times in succession, no one answered, and some of the neighbors, who put their noses out of their windows or were brought to their doors by the noise, had assured him that that house, all the openings of which were tightly closed, had not been inhabited for six months. While d'Artagnan was running through the streets and knocking at doors, Aramis had joined his companions. So that on returning home, D'Artagnan found the reunion complete. Well, cried the three musketeers all together on seeing D'Artagnan enter with his brow covered with perspiration and his countenance upset with anger. Well, cried he, throwing his sword upon the bed, this man must be the devil in person. He has disappeared like a phantom, like a shade, like a spectre. Do you believe in apparitions? asked Athos of Porthos. I never believe in anything I have not seen, and as I never have seen apparitions, I don't believe in them. The Bible, said Aramis, make our belief in them a law. The ghost of Samuel appeared to Saul, and it is an article of faith that I should be very sorry to see any doubt thrown upon Porthos. At all events, man or devil, body or shadow, illusion or reality, this man is born for my damnation. For his flight has caused us to miss a glorious affair, gentlemen, an affair by which there were a hundred pistoles and perhaps more to be gained. How is that? cried Porthos and Aramis in a breath. As to Athos, faithful to his system of reticence, he contented himself with interrogating D'Artagnan by a look. Planchet! Said D'Artagnan to his domestic, who just then insinuated his head through the half-open door in order to catch some fragments of the conversation. 
Go down to my landlord, Monsieur Bonacieux, and ask him to send me half a dozen bottles of Beaujolais wine. I prefer that. Ah, ah, you have credit with your landlord then? Asked Porthos. Yes, replied D'Artagnan. From this very day, and mind, if the wine is bad, we will send him to find better. We must use and not abuse," said Aramis sententiously. "I always said that D'Artagnan had the longest head of the four," said Athos, who, having uttered his opinion, to which D'Artagnan replied with a bow, immediately resumed his accustomed silence. "But come, what is this about?" asked Porthos. "Yes," said Aramis. Impart it to us, my dear friend. Unless the honor of any lady be hazarded by this confidence, in that case you would do better to keep it to yourself. Be satisfied," replied D'Artagnan. "The honor of no one will have cause to complain of what I have to tell." He then related to his friends, word for word, all that had passed between him and his host, and how the man who had abducted the wife of his worthy landlord was the same with whom he had had the difference at the hostelry of the Jolly Miller. Your affair is not bad," said Athos, after having tasted like a connoisseur and indicated by a nod of his head that he thought the wine good. And one may draw fifty or sixty pistoles from this good man. Then there only remains to ascertain whether these fifty or sixty pistoles are worth the risk of four heads. But observe," cried D'Artagnan, "that there is a woman in the affair, a woman carried off, a woman who is doubtless threatened, tortured perhaps, and all because she is faithful to her mistress." Beware, D'Artagnan. Beware," said Aramis. "You grow a little too warm, in my opinion, about the fate of Madame Bonacieux. Woman was created for our destruction, and it is from her we inherit all our miseries." At this speech of Aramis, the brow of Athos became clouded, and he bit his lips. "It is not Madame Bonacieux about whom I am anxious," cried D'Artagnan. But the queen, whom the king abandons, whom the cardinal persecutes, and who sees the heads of all her friends fall one after the other. But why does she love what we hate most in the world, the Spaniards and the English? Spain is her country," replied D'Artagnan, "and it is very natural that she should love the Spanish, who are the children of the same soil as herself. As to the second reproach, I have heard it said that she does not love the English, but an English man. Well, and by my faith," said Athos, "it must be acknowledged that this Englishman is worthy of being loved. I never saw a man with a nobler air than his. Without reckoning that he dresses as nobody else can," said Porthos. "I was at the Louvre on the day when he scattered his pearls, and Padre, I picked up two that I sold for ten pistoles each. Do you know him, Aramis?" As well as you do, gentlemen, for I was among those who seized him in the garden at Amiens, into which Monsieur Putange, the Queen's equerry, introduced me. I was at school at the time, and the adventure appeared to me to be cruel for the King. Which would not prevent me," said D'Artagnan, "if I knew where the Duke of Buckingham was, from taking him by the hand and conducting him to the Queen, were it only to enrage the Cardinal. And if we could find means to play him a sharp turn, I vow that I would voluntarily risk my head in doing it." And did the mercer," rejoined Athos, "tell you, D'Artagnan, that the Queen thought that Buckingham had been brought over by a forged letter?" She is afraid so. Wait a minute, then," said Aramis. "What for?" demanded Porthos. "Go on, while I endeavor to recall circumstances." And now I am convinced," said D'Artagnan, "that this abduction of the Queen's woman is connected with the events of which we are speaking, and perhaps with the presence of Buckingham in Paris. The Gascon is full of ideas," said Porthos with admiration. I like to hear him talk," said Athos. "His dialect amuses me." "Gentlemen," cried Aramis, "listen to this." "Listen to Aramis," said his three friends. "Yesterday I was at the house of a doctor of theology, whom I sometimes consult about my studies." Athos smiled. "He resides in a quiet corner," continued Aramis. "His tastes and his profession require it." Now, at the moment when I left his house, 
Here Aramis paused. Well, cried his auditors, at the moment you left his house. Aramis appeared to make a strong inward effort, like a man who, in the full relation of a falsehood, finds himself stopped by some unforeseen obstacle. But the eyes of his three companions were fixed upon him, their ears were wide open, and there were no means of retreat. This doctor has a niece, continued Aramis. Ah, he has a niece, interrupted Porthos. A very respectable lady, said Aramis. The three friends burst into laughter. Uh, if you laugh, you doubt me, replied Aramis. You shall know nothing. We believe like Mohammedans, and are as mute as tombstones, said Athos. I will continue then, resumed Aramis. This niece comes sometimes to see her uncle, and by chance was there yesterday at the same time that I was, and it was my duty to offer to conduct her to her carriage. Ah, she has a carriage then, this niece of the doctor, interrupted Porthos, one of whose faults was a great looseness of tongue. A nice acquaintance, my friend. Porthos, replied Aramis. I have had the occasion to observe to you more than once that you are very indiscreet, and that is injurious to you among the women. Gentlemen, gentlemen, cried D'Artagnan, who began to get a glimpse of the result of the adventure. The thing is serious. Let us try not to jest, if we can. Go on, Aramis, go on. All at once a tall, dark gentleman, just like yours, D'Artagnan. The same, perhaps, said he. Possibly, continued Aramis, came toward me, accompanied by five or six men, who followed about ten paces behind him, and in the politest tone, Monsieur Duke, said he to me, and you, madame, continued he, addressing the lady on my arm, the doctor's niece. Hold your tongue, Porthos, said Athos, you are insupportable. Will you enter this carriage in that without offering the least resistance, without making the least noise? He took you for Buckingham, cried D'Artagnan. I believe so, replied Aramis. But the lady? asked Porthos. He took her for the Queen, said D'Artagnan. Just so, replied Aramis. The Gascon is the devil, cried Athos. Nothing escapes him. The fact is, said Porthos, Aramis is of the same height, and something of the shape of the duke, but it nevertheless appears to me that the dress of a musketeer, I wore an enormous cloak, said Aramis. In the month of July? The devil, said Porthos. Is the doctor afraid that you may be recognized? I can comprehend that the spy may have been deceived by the person, but the face— I had a large hat, said Aramis. Oh, good Lord, cried Porthos, what precautions for the study of theology. Gentlemen, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan, do not let us lose our time in jesting. Let us separate and let us seek the mercer's wife. That is the key of the intrigue. A woman of such inferior condition, can you believe so? said Porthos, protruding his lips with contempt. She is goddaughter to Laporte, the confidential valet of the Queen. Have I not told you so, gentlemen? Besides, it has perhaps been Her Majesty's calculation to seek on this occasion for support so lowly. High heads expose themselves from afar, and the Cardinal is long-sighted. Well, said Porthos, in the first place make a bargain with the mercer, and a good bargain. That's useless, said D'Artagnan, for I believe if he does not pay us, we shall be well enough paid by another party. At this moment— a sudden noise of footsteps was heard upon the stairs. The door was thrown violently open, and the unfortunate mercer rushed into the chamber in which the council was held. "'Save me, gentlemen, for the love of heaven, save me!' cried he. "'There are four men come to arrest me. Save me! Save me!' Porthos and Aramis arose. "'A moment!' cried D'Artagnan, making them a sign to replace in the scabbard their half-drawn swords. "'It is not courage that is needed, it is prudence.' And yet, cried Porthos, we will not leave. You will leave D'Artagnan to act as he thinks proper, said Athos. He has, I repeat, the longest head of the four, and for my part, I declare that I will obey him. Do as you think best, D'Artagnan. At this moment, the four guards appeared at the door of the antechamber, but seeing four musketeers standing and their swords by their sides, they hesitated about going further. Come in, gentlemen, come in, called D'Artagnan. 
You are here in my apartment, and we are all faithful servants of the king and cardinal. Then, gentlemen, you will not oppose our executing the orders we have received? asked one, who appeared to be the leader of the party. On the contrary, gentlemen, we would assist you if it were necessary. What does he say? grumbled Porthos. You are a simpleton, said Athos. Silence! But you promised me, whispered the poor mercer. We can only save you by being free ourselves, replied D'Artagnan in a rapid low tone, and if we appear inclined to defend you, they will arrest us with you. It seems nevertheless. Come, gentlemen, come, said D'Artagnan aloud. I have no motive for defending monsieur. I saw him today for the first time, and he can tell you on what occasion. He came to demand the rent of my lodging. Is that not true, monsieur Bonacieux? Answer. It is the very truth, cried the mercer, but monsieur does not tell you. Silence! With respect to me, silence. With respect to my friends, silence about the queen above all, or you will ruin everybody without saving yourself. Come, come, gentlemen, remove the fellow. And D'Artagnan pushed the half stupefied mercer among the guards, saying to him, You are a shabby old fellow, my dear. You come to demand money of me, of a musketeer, to prison with him. Gentlemen, once more, take him to prison and keep him out of key as long as possible. That will give me time to pay him. The officers were full of thanks and took away their prey. As they were going down, D'Artagnan laid his hand on the shoulder of their leader. May I not drink to your health and you to mine? said D'Artagnan, filling two glasses with the Beaugency wine, which he had obtained from the liberality of Monsieur Bonacieux. That will do me great honour, said the leader of the posse, and I accept thankfully. Then to yours, Monsieur, what is your name? Beaurenard. Monsieur. Beaurenard. To yours, my gentleman. What is your name in your turn, if you please? D'Artagnan. To yours, monsieur. And above all others, cried D'Artagnan, as if carried away by his enthusiasm, to that of the king and the cardinal. And the leader of the posse would perhaps have doubted the sincerity of D'Artagnan if the wine had been bad. But the wine was good, and he was convinced. What diabolical villainy you've performed here, said Porthos, when the officer had rejoined his companions and the four friends found themselves alone. Shame, shame for four musketeers to allow an unfortunate fellow who cried for help to be arrested in their midst, and a gentleman to hobnob with a bailiff. Porthos, said Aramis, Athos has already told you that you are a simpleton, and I am quite of his opinion. D'Artagnan, you are a great man. And when you occupy Monsieur de Treville's place, I will come and ask your influence to secure me an abbey. Well, I am in a maze, said Porthos. Do you approve of what D'Artagnan has done? Parbleu! Indeed I do, said Athos. I not only approve of what he has done, but I congratulate him upon it. And now, gentlemen, said D'Artagnan, without stopping to explain his conduct to Porthos. All for one, one for all, that is our motto, is it not? And yet... Said Porthos. Hold out your hand and swear, cried Athos and Aramis at once. Overcome by example, grumbling to himself, nevertheless Porthos stretched out his hand, and the four friends repeated with one voice the formula dictated by D'Artagnan. All for one! One for all! That's well. Now, let us every one retire to his own home, said D'Artagnan, as if he had done nothing but command all his life. And attention! For from this moment, we are at feud with the Cardinal. End of chapter 9。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes. Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 10 A Mouse Trap in the Seventeenth Century. The invention of the mouse trap does not date from our days. As soon as societies, in forming, had invented any kind of police, that police invented mouse traps. As perhaps our readers are not familiar with the slang of the Rue de Jerusalem, and as it is fifteen years since we applied this word for the first time to this thing, allow us to explain to them what is a mouse trap. When in a house, of whatever kind it may be, an individual suspected of any crime is arrested, the arrest is held secret. 
Four or five men are placed in an ambuscade in the front room. The door is opened to all who knock. It is closed after them, and they are arrested, so that at the end of two or three days they have in their power almost all the habitues of the establishment. And that is a mouse trap. The apartment of Monsieur Bonacieux, then, became a mouse trap, and whoever appeared there was taken and interrogated by the cardinal's people. It must be observed that, as a separate passage led to the first floor in which D'Artagnan lodged, those who called on him were exempted from this detention. Besides, nobody came thither but the three musketeers. They had all been engaged in earnest search and inquiries, but had discovered nothing. Athos had even gone so far as to question Monsieur de Treville, a thing which, considering the habitual reticence of the worthy musketeer, had very much astonished his captain. But Monsieur de Treville knew nothing, except that the last time he had seen the cardinal, the king, and the queen, the cardinal looked very thoughtful, the king uneasy, and the redness of the queen's eyes donated that she had been sleepless or tearful. But this last circumstance was not striking, as the queen, since her marriage, had slept badly and wept much. Monsieur de Treville requested Athos, whatever might happen, to be observant of his duty to the king, but particularly to the queen, begging him to convey his desires to his comrades. As to D'Artagnan, he did not budge from his apartment. He converted his chamber into an observatory. From his windows he saw all the visitors who were caught. Then, having removed a plank from his floor, and nothing much remaining but a simple ceiling between him and the room beneath in which the interrogatories were made, he heard all that passed between the inquisitors and the accused. The interrogatories, preceded by a minute search operated upon the persons arrested, were almost always framed thus— has Madame Bonacieux sent anything to you for her husband, or any other person? Has Monsieur Bonacieux sent anything to you for his wife, or for any other person? Has either of them confided anything to you by word of mouth? If they knew anything, they would not question people in this manner, said D'Artagnan to himself. Now, what is it they want to know? Why, they want to know if the Duke of Buckingham is in Paris, and if he has had, or is likely to have, an interview with the Queen." D'Artagnan held on to this idea, which, from what he had heard, was not wanting in probability. In the meantime, the mouse-trap continued in operation, and likewise D'Artagnan's vigilance. On the evening of the day after the arrest of poor Bonacieux, as Athos had just left D'Artagnan to report at Monsieur de Treville's, and as nine o'clock had just struck, and as Planchette, who had not yet made the bed, was beginning his task, a knocking was heard at the street door. The door was instantly opened and shut, Someone was taken in the mouse-trap. D'Artagnan flew to his hole, laid himself down on the floor at full length, and listened. Cries were soon heard, and then moans, which someone appeared to be endeavoring to stifle. There were no questions. "'The devil!' said D'Artagnan to himself. "'It seems like a woman. They search her, she resists, they use force, the scoundrels!' In spite of his prudence, D'Artagnan restrained himself with great difficulty from taking a part in the scene that was going on below. "'But I tell you that I am the mistress of this house, gentlemen! I tell you I am Madame Bonacieux! I tell you I belong to the Queen!' cried the unfortunate woman. "'Madame Bonacieux!' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Can I be so lucky as to find what everybody is seeking for?' The voice became more and more indistinct. A tumultuous movement shook the partition. The victim resisted as much as a woman could resist four men. "'Pardon, gentlemen, par murmured the voice, which could now only be heard in inarticulate sounds. "'They are binding her! They are going to drag her away!' cried D'Artagnan to himself, springing up from the floor. "'My sword! Good, it is by my side. Planchet! Monsieur, run and seek Athos, Porthos, and Aramis!' One of the three will certainly be at home, perhaps all three. Tell them to take arms, to come here, and to run. Ah, I remember, Athos is at Monsieur de Treville's. But where are you going, Monsieur? Where are you going? I am going down by the window, in order to be there the sooner, cried D'Artagnan. You put back the boards, sweep the floor, go out at the door, and run as I told you. Oh, Monsieur, Monsieur, you will kill yourself, cried Planchet. "'Hold your tongue, stupid fellow,' said D'Artagnan, 
and laying hold of the casement he let himself gently down from the first story, which fortunately was not very elevated, without doing himself the slightest injury. He then went straight to the door and knocked, murmuring, "'I will go myself, and be caught in the mouse-trap. But woe be to the cats that shall pounce upon such a mouse!' The knocker had scarcely sounded under the hand of the young man before the tumult ceased, steps approached, the door was opened, and D'Artagnan, sword in hand, rushed into the rooms of M. Bonacieux, the door of which, doubtless acted upon by a spring, closed after him. Then those who dwelt in Bonacieux's unfortunate house, together with the nearest neighbors, heard loud cries, stamping of feet, clashing of swords, and breaking of furniture. A moment after, those who, surprised by this tumult, had gone to their windows to learn the cause of it, saw the door open, and four men, clothed in black, not come out of it, but fly, like so many frightened crows, leaving on the ground and on the corners of the furniture feathers from their wings, that is to say, patches of their clothes and fragment of their cloaks. D'Artagnan was conqueror, without much effort, it must be confessed, for only one of the officers was armed, and even he defended himself for form's sake. It is true that the three others had endeavoured to knock the young man down with chairs, stools, and crockery, but two or three scratches made by Gascon's blade terrified them. Ten minutes sufficed for their defeat, and D'Artagnan remained master of the field of battle. The neighbours who had opened their windows, with the coolness particular to the inhabitants of Paris in these times of perpetual riots and disturbances, closed them again as soon as they saw the four men in black flee, their instinct telling them that for the time all was over. Besides, it began to grow late, and then, as to-day, people went to bed early in the quarter of Luxembourg. On being left alone with Madame Bonacieux, D'Artagnan turned toward her. The poor woman reclined where she had been left, half fainting upon an armchair. D'Artagnan examined her with a rapid glance. She was a charming woman of twenty-five or twenty-six years, with dark hair, blue eyes, and a nose slightly turned up, admirable teeth, and a complexion marbled with rose and opal. There, however, ended the signs which might have confounded her with a lady of rank. The hands were white, but without delicacy. The feet did not bespeak the woman of quality. Happily, D'Artagnan was not yet acquainted with such niceties. While D'Artagnan was examining Madame Bonacieux, and was, as we have said, close to her, he saw on the ground a fine cambric handkerchief, which he picked up, as was his habit, and at the corner of which he recognized the same cipher he had seen on the handkerchief which had nearly caused him and Aramis to cut each other's throat. From that time D'Artagnan had been cautious with respect to handkerchiefs with arms on them, and he therefore placed in the pocket of Madame Bonacieux the one he had just picked up. At that moment Madame Bonacieux recovered her senses. She opened her eyes, looked around her with terror, saw that the apartment was empty and that she was alone with her liberator. She extended her hands to him with a smile. Madame Bonacieux had the sweetest smile in the world. "'Ah, monsieur,' said she, "'you have saved me. Permit me to thank you.' "'Madame,' said D'Artagnan, "'I have only done what every gentleman would have done in my place. You owe me no thanks.' "'Oh, yes, monsieur, oh, yes, and I hope to prove to you that you have not served an ingrate.' But what could these men, whom I at first took for robbers, want with me? And why is Monsieur Bonacieux not here? Madame, these men were more dangerous than any robbers could have been, for they are the agents of the cardinal. And as to your husband, Monsieur Bonacieux, he is not here because he was yesterday evening conducted to the Bastille. My husband in the Bastille! cried Madame Bonacieux. Oh, my God, what has he done? "'Poor dear man! He is innocence itself!' And something like a faint smile lighted the still terrified features of the young woman. "'What has he done, madam?' said D'Artagnan. "'I believe that his only crime is to have at the same time the good fortune and the misfortune to be your husband.' "'But, monsieur, you know, then—' "'I know that you have been abducted, madame.' "'And by whom? Do you know him? Oh, if you know him, tell me!' by a man of from forty to forty-five years, with black hair, a dark complexion, and a scar on his left temple. "'That is he, that is he, but his name!' 
"'Ah, his name! I do not know that.' "'And did my husband know I had been carried off?' "'He was informed of it by a letter, written to him by the abductor himself.' "'And does he suspect,' said Madame Bonacieux, with some embarrassment, "'the cause of this event?' "'He attributed it, I believe, to a political cause.' "'I doubted from the first, and now I think entirely as he does. "'Then my dear Monsieur Bonacieux has not suspected me a single instant.' "'So far from it, madame, he was too proud of your prudence, and above all, of your love.' A second smile, almost imperceptible, stole over the rosy lips of the pretty young woman. "'Continued D'Artagnan, how did you escape?' "'I took advantage of a moment when they left me alone, "'and as I had known since morning the reason of my abduction, "'with the help of the sheets I let myself down from the window. "'Then, as I believed my husband would be at home, I hastened hither. "'To place yourself under his protection? "'Oh, no, poor dear man! "'I knew very well that he was incapable of defending me, "'but as he could serve us in other ways— I wished to inform him. Of what? Oh, that is not my secret. I must not, therefore, tell you. Besides, said D'Artagnan, pardon me, madame, if, guardsman as I am, I remind you of prudence. Besides, I believe we are not here in a very proper place for imparting confidences. The men I have put to flight will return reinforced. If they find us here, we are lost." I have sent for three of my friends, but who knows whether they were at home. "'Yes, yes, you are right,' cried the affrighted Madame Bonacieux. "'Let us fly! Let us save ourselves!' At these words she passed her arm under that of D'Artagnan, and urged him forward eagerly. "'But whither shall we fly? Whither escape?' "'Let us first withdraw from this house. Afterward we shall see.' The young man and the young woman, without taking the trouble to shut the door after them, descended into the Rue des Fossoyeurs rapidly, turned into the Rue des Fossés Monsieur le Prince, and did not stop till they came to the Place Saint-Sulpice. "'And now what are we to do? And where do you wish me to conduct you?' asked D'Artagnan. "'I am quite at a loss how to answer you, I admit,' said Madame Bonacieux. "'My intention was to inform Monsieur Laporte, through my husband,' in order that M. Laporte might tell us precisely what had taken place at the Louvre in the last three days, and whether there is any danger in presenting myself there. "'But I,' said D'Artagnan, "'can go and inform M. Laporte.' "'No doubt you could. Only there is one misfortune, and that is that M. Bonacieux is known at the Louvre, and would be allowed to pass, whereas you are not known there, and the gate would be closed against you.' "'Ah, bah!' said D'Artagnan. "'You have at some wicked of the Louvre a concierge who is devoted to you, "'and who, thanks to a password, would—' "'Madame Bonacieux looked earnestly at the young man. "'And if I give you this password,' said she, "'would you forget it as soon as you used it?' "'By my honour, by the faith of a gentleman,' said D'Artagnan, "'with an accent so truthful that no one could mistake it. "'Then I believe you. "'You appear to be a brave young man.' "'Besides, your fortune may perhaps be the result of your devotedness.' "'I will do, without a promise and voluntarily, "'all that I can do to serve the king and be agreeable to the queen. "'Dispose of me, then, as a friend.' "'But I, where shall I go meanwhile?' "'Is there nobody from whose house Monsieur Laporte can come and fetch you?' "'No, I can trust nobody.' "'Stop,' said D'Artagnan. "'We are near Athos's door.' "'Yes, here it is. "'Who is this Athos? "'One of my friends. "'But if he should be at home and see me... "'He is not at home, and I will carry away the key, "'after having placed you in his apartment. "'But if he should return... "'Oh, he won't return, and if he should, "'he will be told that I have brought a woman with me, "'and that woman is in his apartment. "'But that will compromise me sadly, you know.' "'Of what consequence? Nobody knows you. "'Besides, we are in a situation to overlook ceremony.' "'Come, then. Let us go to your friend's house. Where does he live?' "'Rue for Rue, two steps from here. Let us go.' Both resumed their way. As D'Artagnan had foreseen, 
Athos was not within. He took the key, which was customarily given him as one of the family, ascended the stairs, and introduced Madame Bonacieux into the little apartment, of which we have given a description. "'You are at home,' said he. "'Remain here, fasten the door inside, and open it to nobody unless you hear three taps like this,' and he tapped thrice, two taps close together, and pretty hard, the other after an interval, and lighter. "'That is well,' said Madame Bonacieux. "'Now, in my turn, let me give you my instructions.' I am all attention. Present yourself at the wicket of the Louvre, on the side of the Rue de l'Echelle, and ask for Germain. Well, and then? He will ask you what you want, and you will answer by these two words, Tours and Brussels. He will at once put himself at your orders. And what shall I command him? To go and fetch Monsieur Laporte, the Queen's valet de chamber and when he shall have informed him and Monsieur Laporte is come, you will send him to me. That is well, but where and how shall I see you again? Do you wish to see me again? Certainly. Well, let that care be mine, and be at ease. I depend upon your word. You may. D'Artagnan bowed to Madame Bonacieux, darting at her the most loving glance that he could possibly concentrate upon her charming little person, and while he descended the stairs he heard the door closed and double-locked. In two bounds he was at the Louvre, as he entered the wicket of the shell, ten o'clock struck. All the events we have described had taken place within a half-hour. Everything fell out as Madame Bonacieux prophesied. On hearing the password, Germain bowed. In a few minutes Laporte was at the lodge. In two words, D'Artagnan informed him where Madame Bonacieux was. Laporte assured himself, by having it twice repeated, of the accurate address, and set off at a run. Hardly, however, had he taken ten steps, before he returned. "'Young man,' said he to D'Artagnan, "'a suggestion.' "'What?' "'You may get into trouble by what has taken place.' "'You believe so?' "'Yes.' "'Have you any friend whose clock is too slow?' "'Well?' "'Go and call upon him, in order that he may give evidence of your having been with him at half-past nine. In a court of justice that is called an alibi.' D'Artagnan found his advice prudent. He took to his heels, and was soon at M. de Treville's, but instead of going into the saloon with the rest of the crowd, he asked to be introduced to M. de Treville's office. As D'Artagnan so constantly frequented the hotel, no difficulty was made in complying with his request, and a servant went to inform M. de Treville that his young compatriot, having something important to communicate, solicited a private audience. Five minutes after, M. de Treville was asking D'Artagnan what he could do to serve him, and what caused his visit at so late an hour. "'Pardon me, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan who had profited by the moment he had been left alone, to put back M. de Treville's clock three-quarters of an hour. But I thought, as it was yet only twenty-five minutes past nine, it was not too late to wait upon you. Twenty-five minutes past nine! cried M. de Treville, looking at the clock. Why, that's impossible! Look rather, monsieur, said D'Artagnan. The clock shows it. That's true, said M. de Treville. I believed it later— "'But what can I do for you?' "'Then D'Artagnan told M. de Treville a long history about the Queen. "'He expressed to him the fears he entertained with respect to Her Majesty. "'He related to him what he had heard of the projects of the Cardinal with regard to Buckingham, "'and all with a tranquillity and candour of which M. de Treville was more the dupe, "'from having himself, as we had said, observed something fresh between the Cardinal, the King, and the Queen. "'As ten o'clock was striking,' D'Artagnan left M. de Treville, who thanked him for his information, recommended him to have the service of the king and queen always at heart, and returned to the saloon. But at the foot of the stairs, D'Artagnan remembered he had forgotten his cane. He consequently sprang up again, re-entered the office, with a turn of his finger set the clock right again, that it might not be perceived the next day that it had been put wrong, and certain from that time that he had a witness to prove his alibi, he ran downstairs, and soon found himself in the street. End of chapter 10
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 11 In Which the Plot Thickens. His visit to M. de Treville being paid, the pensive D'Artagnan took the longest way homeward. On what was D'Artagnan thinking, that he strayed thus from his path, gazing at the stars of heaven, and sometimes sighing, sometimes smiling? He was thinking of Madame Bonacieux. For an apprentice musketeer, the young woman was almost an ideal of love. Pretty, mysterious, initiated in almost all the secrets of the court, which reflected such a charming gravity over her pleasing features, it might be surmised that she was not wholly unmoved. And this is an irresistible charm to novices in love. Moreover, D'Artagnan had delivered her from the hands of the demons who wished to search and ill-treat her, and this important service had established between them one of those sentiments of gratitude which so easily assume a more tender character. D'Artagnan already fancied himself, so rapid is the flight of our dreams upon the wings of imagination, accosted by a messenger from the young woman, who brought him some billet appointing a meeting, a gold chain, or a diamond. We have observed that young cavaliers received presents from their king without shame. Let us add that in these times of lax morality they had no more delicacy with respect to the mistresses, and that the latter almost always left them valuable and durable remembrances, as if they essayed to conquer the fragility of their sentiments by the solidity of their gifts. Without a blush, men made their way in the world by the means of women blushing. Such as were only beautiful gave their beauty, whence, without doubt, comes the proverb, the most beautiful girl in the world can only give what she has. Such as were rich gave, in addition, a part of their money, and a vast number of heroes of that gallant period may be cited who would neither have won their spurs in the first place, nor their battles afterward, without the purse, more or less furnished, which their mistress fastened the saddle-bow. D'Artagnan owned nothing. Provincial diffidence, that slight varnish, the ephemeral flower, that down of the peach, had evaporated to the winds through the little orthodox counsels which the three musketeers gave their friend. D'Artagnan, following the strange custom of the times, considered himself at Paris as on a campaign, neither more nor less than if he had been in Flanders, Spain yonder, woman here. In each there was an enemy to contend with, and contributions to be levied. But we must say, at the present moment, D'Artagnan was ruled by a feeling much more noble and disinterested. The mercer had said that he was rich. The young man might easily guess that, with so weak a man as Madame Bonacieux, an interest was almost foreign to this commencement of love, which had been the consequence of it. We say almost, for the idea that a young, handsome, kind, and witty woman is at the same time rich, takes nothing from the beginning of love, but on the contrary strengthens it. There are, in affluence, a crowd of aristocratic cares and caprices which are highly becoming to beauty. A fine and white stocking, a silken robe, a lace kerchief, a pretty slipper on the foot, a tasty ribbon on the head, do not make an ugly woman pretty, but they make a pretty woman beautiful, without reckoning the hands, which gain by all this. The hands, among women particularly, to be beautiful, must be idle." Then D'Artagnan, as the reader from whom we have not concealed the state of his fortune very well knows, D'Artagnan was not a millionaire. He hoped to become one some day, but the time which in his own mind he fixed upon for this happy change was still far distant. In the meanwhile, how disheartening to see the woman one loves long for those thousands of nothings which constitute a woman's happiness, and be unable to give her those thousands of nothings. At least, when the woman is rich and the lover is not, that which he cannot offer she offers to herself, and although it is generally with her husband's money that she procures herself this indulgence, the gratitude for it seldom reverts to him. Then D'Artagnan, disposed to become the most tender of lovers, 
was at the same time a very devoted friend. In the midst of his amorous projects for the mercer's wife, he did not forget his friends. The pretty Madame Bonacieux was just the woman to walk with in the plain St. Denis, or in the fair of St. Germain, in company with Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, to whom D'Artagnan had often remarked this. Then one could enjoy charming little dinners, where one touches on one side of the hand of a friend, and on the other the foot of a mistress. Besides, on pressing occasions, in extreme difficulties, D'Artagnan would become the preserver of his friends. And M. Bonacieux, whom D'Artagnan had pushed into the hands of the officers, denying him aloud, although he had promised in a whisper to save him. We are compelled to admit to our readers that D'Artagnan thought nothing about him in any way, or that if he did think of him, it was only to say to himself that he was very well where he was, wherever it might be. Love is the most selfish of all the passions. Let our readers reassure themselves. If D'Artagnan forgets his host, or appears to forget him, under the pretense of not knowing where he has been carried, we will not forget him, and we know where he is. But, for the moment, let us do as did the amorous Gascon. We will see, after the worthy mercer, later. D'Artagnan, reflecting on his future amours, addressing himself to the beautiful night, and smiling at the stars, ascended the Rue Cherish Midi, or Chase Midi, as it was then called. As he found himself in the quarter in which Aramis lived, he took it into his head to pay his friend a visit in order to explain the motives which had led him to said Planchet with a request that he would come immediately into the mousetrap. Now, if Aramis had been at home when Planchet came to his abode, he had doubtless hastened to the Rue des Fossoyeurs, and finding nobody there but his other two companions, perhaps, they would not be able to conceive what all this meant. This mystery required an explanation." At least, so D'Artagnan declared to himself. He likewise thought this was an opportunity for talking about pretty little Madame Bonacieux, of whom his head, if not his heart, was already full. We must never look for discretion in first love. First love is accompanied by such excessive joy that unless the joy be allowed to overflow, it will stifle you. Paris, for two hours past, had been dark and seemed a desert, Eleven o'clock sounded from all the clocks in the Faubourg Saint-Germain. It was delightful weather. D'Artagnan was passing along a lane, on the spot where the Rue des Sas is now situated, breathing the balmy emanations which were borne upon the wind from the Rue de Vaugirard, and which arose from the gardens, refreshed by the dews of evening and the breeze of night. From a distance resounded, deadened, however, by good shutters, the songs of the tipplers, enjoying themselves in the cabarets scattered along the plain. Arrived at the end of the lane, D'Artagnan turned to the left. The house in which Aramis dwelt was situated between the Rue Cassette and the Rue Servandoni. D'Artagnan had just passed the Rue Cassette, and had already perceived the door of his friend's house, shaded by a mass of sycamores and clematis which formed a vast arch opposite the front of it, when he perceived something like a shadow issuing from the Rue Servandoni. This something was enveloped in a cloak, and D'Artagnan at first believed it was a man. But by the smallness of the form, the hesitation of the walk, and the indecision of the step, he soon discovered that it was a woman. Further, this woman, as if not certain of the house she was seeking, lifted up her eyes to look around her, stopped, went backward, and then returned again. D'Artagnan was perplexed. "'Shall I go and offer her my services?' thought he. "'By her step she must be young. "'Perhaps she is pretty. "'Oh, yes. "'But a woman who wanders in the streets at this hour "'only ventures out to meet her lover. "'If I should disturb a rendezvous, "'that would not be the best means of commencing an acquaintance.' "'Meantime, the young woman continued to advance, "'counting the houses and windows. "'This was neither long nor difficult.' There were but three hotels in this part of the street, and only two windows looking toward the road, one of which was in a pavilion parallel to that which Aramis occupied, the other belonging to Aramis himself. Pardieu, said D'Artagnan to himself, to whose mind the niece of the theologian reverted. Pardieu, 
"'It would be droll if this belated dove should be in search of our friend's house. "'But on my soul it looks so. "'Ah, my dear Aramis, this time I shall find you out.' "'And D'Artagnan, making himself as small as he could, "'concealed himself in the darkest side of the street, "'near a stone bench placed at the back of a niche. "'The young woman continued to advance, "'and in addition to the lightness of her step which had betrayed her, she emitted a little cough which denoted a sweet voice. D'Artagnan believed this cough to be a signal. Nevertheless, whether the cough had been answered by a similar signal which had fixed the irresolution of the nocturnal seeker, or whether without this aid she saw that she had arrived at the end of her journey, she resolutely drew near to Aramis's shutter, and tapped, at three equal intervals, with her bent finger. "'This is all very fine, dear Aramis,' murmured D'Artagnan. "'Ah, oh, monsieur hypocrite, I understand how you study theology.' The three blows were scarcely struck, when the inside blind was opened, and a light appeared through the panes of the outside shutter. "'Ah, ah,' said the listener, "'not through doors, but through windows. "'Ah, this visit was expected. "'We shall see the windows open, and the lady enter by escalade. "'Very pretty.' but, to the great astonishment of D'Artagnan, the shutter remained closed. Still more, the light which had shone for an instant disappeared, and all was again in obscurity. D'Artagnan thought this could not last long, and continued to look with all his eyes and listen with all his ears. He was right. At the end of some seconds, two sharp taps were heard inside. The young woman in the street replied by a single tap, and the shutter was opened a little way. It may be judged whether D'Artagnan looked or listened with avidity. Unfortunately, the light had been removed into another chamber. But the eyes of the young man were accustomed to the night. Besides, the eyes of the Gascons have, as it is asserted, like those of cats, the faculty of seeing in the dark. D'Artagnan then saw that the young woman took from her pocket a white object, which she unfolded quickly, and which took the form of a handkerchief. She made her interlocutor observe the corner of this unfolded object. This immediately recalled to D'Artagnan's mind the handkerchief which he had found at the feet of Madame Bonacieux, which had reminded him of that which he had dragged from under the feet of Aramis. What the devil could that handkerchief signify? Placed where he was, D'Artagnan could not perceive the face of Aramis. We say Aramis, because the young man entertained no doubt that it was his friend who held this dialogue from the interior with the lady of the exterior. Curiosity prevailed over prudence, and profiting by the preoccupation into which the sight of the handkerchief appeared to have plunged the two personages now on the scene, he stole from his hiding-place, and quick as lightning, but stepping with utmost caution, he ran and placed himself close to the angle of the wall, from which his eyes could pierce the interior of Aramis's room. Upon gaining this advantage, D'Artagnan was near uttering a cry of surprise. It was not Aramis who was conversing with the nocturnal visitor. It was a woman. D'Artagnan, however, could only see enough to recognize the form of her vestments, not enough to distinguish her features. At the same instant, the woman inside drew a second handkerchief from her pocket, and exchanged it for that which had just been shown to her. Then some words were spoken by the two women— at length the shutter closed. The woman who was outside the window turned round and passed within four steps of D'Artagnan, pulling down the hood of her mantle. But the precaution was too late. D'Artagnan had already recognized Madame Bonacieux. Madame Bonacieux! The suspicion that it was she had crossed the mind of D'Artagnan when she saw the handkerchief from her pocket. But what probability was there that Madame Bonacieux, who had sent for Monsieur Laporte in order to be reconducted to the Louvre, should be running about the streets of Paris at half-past eleven at night, at the risk of being abducted a second time? This must be, then, an affair of importance. And what is the most important affair to a woman of twenty-five? Love. But was it on her own account, or on account of another, that she exposed herself to such hazards? This was a question the young man asked himself, whom the demon of jealousy already gnawed, being in heart neither more nor less than an accepted lover. There was a very simple means of satisfying himself whether Madame Bonacieux was going. That was to follow her. 
This method was so simple that D'Artagnan employed it quite naturally and instinctively. But at the sight of the young man, who detached himself from the wall like a statue walking from its niche, and at the noise of the steps which she heard resound behind her, Madame Bonacieux uttered a little cry and fled. D'Artagnan ran after her. It was not difficult for him to overtake a woman embarrassed with her cloak. He came up with her before she had traversed a third of the street. The unfortunate woman was exhausted, not by fatigue, but by terror, and when D'Artagnan placed his hand upon her shoulder, she sank upon one knee, crying in a choking voice, "'Kill me if you please! You shall know nothing!' D'Artagnan raised her by passing his arm round her waist, but as he felt by her weight she was on the point of fainting, he made haste to reassure her by protestations of devotedness. These protestations were nothing for Madame Bonacieux, for such protestations may be made with the worst intentions in the world, but the voice was all. Madame Bonacieux thought she recognized the sound of that voice. She reopened her eyes, cast a quick glance upon the man who had terrified her so, and at once, perceiving it was D'Artagnan, she uttered a cry of joy. "'Oh, it is you! It is you! Thank God! Thank God!' "'Yes, it is I,' said D'Artagnan. "'It is I, whom God has sent to watch over you.' "'Was it with that intention you followed me?' asked the young woman, with a coquettish smile, whose somewhat bantering character resumed its influence, and with whom all fear had disappeared from the moment in which she recognized a friend in one she had taken for an enemy. "'No,' said D'Artagnan. "'No, I confess it. It was chance that threw me in your way. I saw a woman knocking at the window of one of my friends.' "'One of your friends?' interrupted Madame Bonacieux. "'Without doubt. Aramis is one of my best friends.' "'Aramis? Who is he?' "'Come, come, you won't tell me you don't know Aramis. "'This is the first time that I ever heard his name pronounced.' "'It is the first time, then, that you ever went to that house?' "'Undoubtedly.' "'And you did not know that it was inhabited by a young man?' "'No.' "'By a musketeer? No, indeed. "'It was not he, then, that you came to seek? "'Not the least in the world. "'Besides, you must have seen that the person to whom I spoke was a woman. "'That is true, but this woman is a friend of Aramis. "'I know nothing of that, since she lodges with him. "'That does not concern me. "'But who is she? "'Oh, that is not my secret.' "'My dear Madame Bonacieux, you are charming, but at the same time you are one of the most mysterious women. "'Do I lose by that?' "'No, you are, on the contrary, adorable. "'Give me your arm, then. "'Most willingly. And now?' "'Now escort me.' "'Where?' "'Where I am going. "'But where are you going?' "'You will see, because you will leave me at the door.' "'Shall I wait for you? "'That will be useless. "'You will return alone, then? "'Perhaps yes, perhaps no. "'But will the person who shall accompany you afterward "'be a man or a woman? "'I don't know yet. "'But I will know it. "'How so? "'I will wait until you come out. "'In that case, adieu. "'Why so? "'I do not want you. "'But you have claimed— the aid of a gentleman, not the watchfulness of a spy. The word is rather hard. How are they called who follow others in spite of them? They are indiscreet. The word is too mild. Well, madame, I perceive I must do as you wish. Why did you deprive yourself of the merit of doing so at once? Is there no merit in repentance? And do you really repent— I know nothing about it myself, but what I know is that I promise to do all that you wish if you allow me to accompany you where you are going. And you will leave me then? Yes. Without waiting for my coming out again? Yes. Word of honor? By the faith of a gentleman. Take my arm and let us go. D'Artagnan offered his arm to Madame Monacieux, who willingly took it, half laughing, half trembling, and both gained the top of the Rue de la Harpe. Arriving there, the young woman seemed to hesitate, as she had done before in the Rue Vaugirard. She seemed, however, by certain signs, to recognize a door, and approaching that door, "'And now, monsieur,' said she, 
"'It is here I have business. "'A thousand thanks for your honourable company, "'which has saved me from all the dangers "'to which, alone, I was exposed. "'But that moment is come to keep your word. "'I have reached my destination.' "'And you will have nothing to fear on your return?' "'I shall have nothing to fear but robbers.' "'And that is nothing? "'What could they take from me? "'I have not a penny about me.' "'You forget that beautiful handkerchief with the coat of arms.' "'Which?' "'That which I found at your feet and replaced in your pocket.' "'Hold your tongue, imprudent man! "'Do you wish to destroy me?' "'You see very plainly that there is still danger for you.' since a single word makes you tremble, and you confess that if that word were heard you would be ruined. "'Come, come, madame,' cried D'Artagnan, seizing her hands and surveying her with an ardent glance. "'Come, be more generous. Confide in me. Have you not read in my eyes that there is nothing but devotion and sympathy in my heart?' "'Yes,' replied madame Bonacieux. "'Therefore ask my own secrets, and I will reveal them to you. But those of others—' "'That is quite another thing.' "'Very well,' said D'Artagnan. "'I shall discover them. "'As these secrets may have an influence over your life, "'these secrets must become mine.' "'Beware of what you do!' cried the young woman, "'in a manner so serious as to make D'Artagnan start in spite of himself. "'Oh, meddle in nothing which concerns me. "'Do not seek to assist me in that matter which I am accomplishing. "'This I ask of you in the name of the interest with which I inspire you— "'in the name of the service you have rendered me, "'and which I shall never forget while I have life. "'Rather, place faith in what I tell you. "'Have no more concern about me. "'I exist no longer for you, "'any more than if you had never seen me.' "'Must Aramis do as much as I, madame?' "'said D'Artagnan, deeply piqued. "'This is the second or third time, monsieur, "'that you have repeated that name, "'and yet I have told you that I do not know him.' "'You do not know the man at whose shutter you have just knocked. "'Indeed, madame, you believe me too credulous. "'Confess that it is for the sake of making me talk "'that you invent this story and create this personage. "'I invent nothing, madame. I create nothing. "'I only speak the exact truth. "'And you say that one of your friends lives in that house?' "'I say so, and I repeat it for the third time. "'That house is one inhabited by my friend, and that friend is Aramis.' "'All this will be cleared up at a later period,' murmured the young woman. "'No, monsieur, be silent.' "'If you could see my heart,' said D'Artagnan, "'you would there read so much curiosity that you would pity me, "'and so much love that you would instantly satisfy my curiosity. "'We have nothing to fear from those who love us.' "'You speak very suddenly of love,' said the young woman, shaking her head. "'That is because love has come suddenly upon me, and for the first time, and because I am only twenty. The young woman looked at him furtively. "'Listen, I am already upon the scent,' resumed D'Artagnan. "'About three months ago I was near having a duel with Aramis concerning a handkerchief resembling the one you showed to the woman in his house. For a handkerchief marked in the same manner, I am sure.' Monsieur, said the young woman, you weary me very much, I assure you, with your questions. But you, madame, prudent as you are, think, if you were to be arrested with that handkerchief, and that handkerchief were to be seized, would you not be compromised? In what way? The initials are only mine, C.B. Constance Bonacieux. Or Camille de bois Tracy. Silence, monsieur! Once again, silence! "'Ah, oh, since the dangers I incur on my own account cannot stop you, "'think of those you may yourself run.' "'Me?' "'Yes, there is peril of imprisonment, risk of life in knowing me.' "'Then I will not leave you.' "'Monsieur,' said the young woman, supplicating him and clasping her hands together, "'Monsieur, in the name of heaven, by the honour of a soldier, by the courtesy of a gentleman, depart. "'There, there midnight sounds.' "'That is the hour when I am expected.' "'Madame,' said the young man, bowing, "'I can refuse nothing asked of me thus. "'Be content. I will depart. "'But you will not follow me. You will not watch me. "'I will return home instantly. "'Ah, I was quite sure you were a good and brave young man,' "'said Madame Bonacieux, holding out her hand to him, 
and placing the other upon the knocker of a little door almost hidden in the wall. D'Artagnan seized the hand held out to him, and kissed it ardently. "'Ah! Oh, I wish I had never seen you!' cried D'Artagnan, with that ingenuous roughness which women often prefer to the affectations of politeness, because it betrays the depths of the thought, and proves that feeling prevails over reason. "'Well,' resumed Madame Bonacieux, in a voice almost caressing, and pressing the hand of D'Artagnan, who had not relinquished hers, "'Well, I will not say as much as you do. What is lost for to-day may not be lost for ever. Who knows when I shall be at liberty that I may not satisfy your curiosity?' "'And will you make the same promise to my love?' cried D'Artagnan, beside himself with joy. "'Oh, as to that, I do not engage myself. That depends upon the sentiments with which you may inspire me.' Then to-day, madame! Oh, to-day, I am no further than gratitude. Ah, you are too charming, said D'Artagnan sorrowfully, and you abuse my love. No, I use your generosity, that's all. But be of good cheer. With certain people everything comes round. Oh, you render me the happiest of men. Do not forget this evening. Do not forget that promise. Be satisfied. In the proper time and place I will remember everything. Now then, go, go, in the name of heaven. I was expected at sharp midnight, and I am late. By five minutes. Yes, but in certain circumstances five minutes are five ages. When one loves. Well, and who told you I had no affair with a lover? It is a man, then, who expects you? cried D'Artagnan. A man? "'The discussion is going to begin again,' said Madame Bonacieux, with a half-smile, which was not exempt from a tinge of impatience. "'No, no, I go, I depart. I believe in you, and I would have all the merit of my devotion, even if that devotion were stupidity. Adieu, madame, adieu.' And as if he only felt strength to detach himself by a violent effort from the hand he held, he sprang away, running, while Madame Bonacieux knocked, as at the shutter, three light and regular taps. When he had gained the angle of the street, he turned. The door had been opened and shut again. The mercer's pretty wife had disappeared. D'Artagnan pursued his way. He had given his word not to watch Madame Bonacieux, and if his life had depended upon the spot to which she was going or upon the person who should accompany her, D'Artagnan would have returned home, since he had so promised. Five minutes later he was in the Rue de Fossoyeurs. "'Poor Athos,' said he, "'he will never guess what all this means. "'He will have fallen asleep waiting for me, "'or else he will have returned home, "'where he will have learned that a woman had been there. "'A woman with Athos! "'After all,' continued D'Artagnan, "'there was certainly one with Aramis. "'All this is very strange, "'and I am curious to know how it will end.' "'Badly, monsieur, badly,' replied a voice, "'which the young man recognized as that of Planchet, for, soliloquizing aloud, as very preoccupied people do, he had entered the alley, at the end of which were the stairs which led to his chamber. "'How badly! What do you mean by that, you idiot?' asked D'Artagnan. "'What has happened?' "'All sorts of misfortunes.' "'What?' "'In the first place, Monsieur Athos is arrested.' "'Arrested? Athos arrested? What for?' "'He was found in your lodging. They took him for you.' "'And by whom was he arrested?' "'By guards brought by the men in black whom you put to flight. "'Why did he not tell them his name? "'Why did he not tell them he knew nothing about this affair?' "'He took care not to do so, monsieur. "'On the contrary, he came up to me and said, "'It is your master that needs his liberty at this moment, and not I, "'since he knows everything and I know nothing. "'They will believe he is arrested, and that will give him time.' In three days I will tell them who I am, and they cannot fail to let me go. "'Brave Athos! Noble heart!' murmured D'Artagnan. "'I know him well there. And what did the officers do?' Four conveyed him away, I don't know where, to the Bastille or Fort Levesque. Two remained with the men in black, who rummaged every place and took all the papers. The last two mounted guard at the door during this examination. Then, when all was over, they went away, leaving the house empty and exposed. And Porthos and Aramis? I could not find them. They did not come. 
"'But they may come any moment, for you left word that I awaited them.' "'Yes, monsieur.' "'Well, don't budge, then. If they come, tell them what has happened. Let them wait for me at the Pomme de Pin. Here it would be dangerous. The house may be watched. I will run to Monsieur de Treville to tell them all this, and will meet them there.' "'Very well, monsieur,' said Planchet. "'But you will remain. You are not afraid,' said D'Artagnan, coming back to recommend courage to his lackey. "'Be easy, monsieur,' said Planchet. "'You do not know me yet. I am brave when I set about it. It is all in beginning. Besides, I am a Picard.' "'Then it is understood,' said D'Artagnan. "'You would rather be killed than desert your post?' "'Yes, monsieur.' and there is nothing I would not do to prove to monsieur that I am attached to him. Good, said D'Artagnan to himself. It appears that the method I have adopted with this boy is decidedly the best. I shall use it again upon occasion. And with all the swiftness of his legs, already a little fatigued, however, with the perambulations of the day, D'Artagnan directed his course toward monsieur de Treville's. Monsieur de Treville was not at his hotel. His company was on guard at the Louvre, he was at the Louvre with his company. It was necessary to reach M. de Treville. It was important that he should be informed of what was passing. D'Artagnan resolved to try and enter the Louvre. His costume of guardsman in the company of M. de Cessart ought to be his passport. He therefore went down the Rue de Petit Augustine and came up to the quay in order to take the new bridge. He had at first an idea of crossing by the ferry, but on gaining the riverside he had mechanically put his hand into his pocket, and perceived that he had not wherewithal to pay his passage. As he gained the top of the Rue Guenegard, he saw two persons coming out of the Rue Dauphine, whose appearance very much struck him. Of the two persons who composed this group, one was a man, and the other a woman. The woman had the outline of Madame Bonacieux. The man resembled Aramis, so much as to be mistaken for him. Besides, the woman wore that black mantle which D'Artagnan could still see outlined on the shutter of the Rue de Vaugirard, and on the door of the Rue de la Harpe. Still further, the man wore the uniform of a musketeer. The woman's hood was pulled down, and the man held a handkerchief to his face. Both, as this double precaution indicated, had an interest in not being recognized. They took the bridge. That was D'Artagnan's road, as he was going to the Louvre. D'Artagnan followed them. He had not gone twenty steps before he became convinced that the woman really was Madame Bonacieux, and that the man was Aramis. He felt, at that instant, all the suspicions of jealousy agitating his heart. He felt himself doubly betrayed, by his friend, and by her whom he already loved like a mistress. Madame Bonacieux had declared to him, by all the gods, that she did not know Aramis, and a quarter of an hour after having made this assertion, he found her hanging on the arm of Aramis. D'Artagnan did not reflect that he had only known the mercer's pretty wife for three hours, that she owed him nothing but a little gratitude for having delivered her from the men in black, who wished to carry her off, and that she had promised him nothing. He considered himself an outraged, betrayed, and ridiculed lover. Blood and anger mounted to his face. He was resolved to unravel the mystery." the young man and young woman perceived they were watched, and redoubled their speed. D'Artagnan determined upon his course. He passed them, then returned so as to meet them exactly before the Samaritan, which was illuminated by a lamp which threw its light all over that part of the bridge. D'Artagnan stopped before them, and they stopped before him. "'What do you want, monsieur?' demanded the musketeer, recoiling a step, and with a foreign accent, which proved to D'Artagnan that he was deceived in one of his conjectures. "'It is not Aramis,' cried he. "'No, monsieur, it is not Aramis, and by your exclamation I perceive you have mistaken me for another, and pardon you.' "'You pardon me?' cried D'Artagnan. "'Yes,' replied the stranger. "'Allow me, then, to pass on, since it is not with me you have anything to do.' "'You are right, monsieur. It is not with you that I have anything to do. It is with madame.' "'With madame? You do not know her,' replied the stranger. "'You are deceived, monsieur. I know her very well.' "'Ah!' said madame Bonacieux, in a tone of reproach. "'Ah, monsieur, I had your promise as a soldier and your word as a gentleman. I hoped to be able to rely upon that.' "'And I, madame,' said D'Artagnan, embarrassed, "'you promised me.' 
"'Take my arm, madame,' said the stranger, "'and let us continue our way.' D'Artagnan, however, stupefied, cast down, annihilated by all that happened, stood, with crossed arms, before the musketeer and Madame Bonacieux. The musketeer advanced two steps, and pushed D'Artagnan aside with his hand. D'Artagnan made a spring backward, and drew his sword. At the same time, with the rapidity of lightning, the stranger drew his. "'In the name of heaven, my lord!' cried Madame Bonacieux, throwing herself between the combatants, and seizing the swords with her hands. "'My lord!' cried D'Artagnan, enlightened by a sudden idea. "'My lord! Pardon me, monsieur, but you are not—' "'My lord, the Duke of Buckingham,' said Madame Bonacieux in an undertone, "'and now you may ruin us all.' "'My lord, madame, I ask a hundred pardons. "'But I love her, my lord, and was jealous. "'You know what it is to love, my lord. "'Pardon me, and then tell me how I can risk my life to serve your grace.' "'You are a brave young man,' said Buckingham, holding out his hand to D'Artagnan, who pressed it respectfully. "'You offer me your services. With the same frankness, I accept them. "'Follow us at a distance of twenty paces, as far as the Louvre, and if anyone watches us, slay him.' D'Artagnan placed his naked sword under his arm, allowed the Duke and Madame Bonacieux to take twenty steps ahead, and then followed them, ready to execute the instructions of the noble and elegant minister of Charles I. Fortunately, he had no opportunity to give the duke this proof of his devotion, and the young woman and the handsome musketeer entered the Louvre by the wicket of the Echelle without any interference. As for D'Artagnan, he immediately repaired to the cabaret of the Pomme du Pin, where he found Porthos and Aramis awaiting him. Without giving them any explanation of the alarm and inconvenience he had caused them, he told them that he had terminated the affair alone, in which he had for a moment believed he should need their assistance. Meanwhile, carried away as we are by our narrative, we must leave our three friends to themselves, and follow the Duke of Buckingham and his guide through the labyrinths of the Louvre. End of chapter 11 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 12 George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham Mademoiselle Bonacieux and the Duke entered the Louvre without difficulty. Mademoiselle Modacier was known to belong to the Queen. The Duke wore the uniform of the musketeers of Monsieur de Treville, who, as we have said, were that evening on guard. Besides, Germain was in the interests of the Queen, and if anything should happen, Mademoiselle Bonacieux would be accused of having introduced her lover into the Louvre, that was all. She took the risk upon herself. Her reputation would be lost, it is true but of what value in the world was the reputation of the little wife of a mercer. Once within the interior of the court, the duke and the young woman followed the wall for the space of about twenty-five steps. This space passed, Mademoiselle Bonacieux pushed the little servant's door, open by day, but generally closed at night. The door yielded. Both entered, and found themselves in darkness. But Mademoiselle Bonacieux was acquainted with all the turnings and windings of this part of the Louvre, appropriated for the people of the household. She closed the door after her, took the Duke by the hand, and after a few experimental steps, grasped a balustrade, put her foot upon the bottom step, and began to ascend the staircase. The Duke counted two stories. She then turned to the right, followed the course of a long corridor, descended to flight, went a few steps farther, introduced a key into a lock, opened a door, and pushed the duke into an apartment lighted only by a lamp, saying, "'Remain here, my lord duke. Someone will come.' She then went out by the same door, which she locked, so that the duke found himself literally a prisoner. Nevertheless, isolated as he was, we must say that the Duke of Buckingham did not experience an instant of fear. One of the salient points of his character 
was the search for adventures and a love of romance. Brave, rash, and enterprising, this was not the first time he had risked his life in such attempts. He had learned that the pretended message from Anne of Austria, upon the faith of which he had come to Paris, was a snare. But instead of regaining England, he had, abusing the position in which he had been placed, declared to the Queen that he would not depart without seeing her. The Queen had at first positively refused, but at length became afraid that the Duke, if exasperated, would commit some folly. She had already decided upon seeing him, and urging his immediate departure, when, on the very evening of coming to this decision, Mademoiselle Bonacieux, who was charged with going to fetch the Duke and conducting him to the Louvre, was abducted. For two days no one knew what had become of her, and everything remained in suspense. But once free, and placed in communication with Laporte, matters resumed their course, and she accomplished the perilous enterprise which, but for her arrest, would have been executed three days earlier. Buckingham, left alone, walked toward a mirror. His musketeer's uniform became him marvellously. At thirty-five, which was then his age, he passed, with just title, for the handsomest gentleman and the most elegant cavalier of France or England. The favourite of two kings, immensely rich, all-powerful in the kingdom which he disordered at his fancy, and calmed again at his caprice, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, had lived one of those fabulous existences which survive in the course of centuries to astonish posterity. Sure of himself, convinced of his own power, certain that the laws which rule other men could not reach him, he went straight to the object he aimed at, even where this object were so elevated and so dazzling, that it would have been madness for any other man to have contemplated it. It was thus he had succeeded in approaching several times the beautiful and proud Anne of Austria, and in making himself loved by dazzling her. George Villiers placed himself before the glass, as we have said, restored the undulations to his beautiful hair, which the weight of his hat had disordered, twisted his moustache, and, his heart swelling with joy, happy and proud at being near the moment he had so long sighed for, he smiled upon himself with pride and hope. At this moment a door concealed in the tapestry opened, and a woman appeared. Buckingham saw this apparition in the glass. He uttered a cry. It was the Queen! Anne of Austria was then twenty-six or twenty-seven years of age. That is to say, she was in the full splendour of her beauty. Her carriage was that of a queen or a goddess. Her eyes, which cast the brilliancy of emeralds, were perfectly beautiful, and yet were at the same time full of sweetness and majesty. Her mouth was small and rosy, and although her underlip, like that of all princes of the House of Austria, protruded slightly beyond the other, it was eminently lovely in its smile, but as profoundly disdainful in its contempt. Her skin was admired for its velvety softness. Her hands and arms were of surpassing beauty, all the poets of the time singing them as incomparable. Lastly, her hair, which, from being light in her youth, had become chestnut, and which she wore curled very plainly and with much powder, admirably set off her face, in which the most rigid critic could only have desired a little less rouge and the most fastidious sculptor a little more fineness in the nose. Buckingham remained for a moment dazzled. Never had Anna of Austria appeared to him so beautiful, amid balls, fetes, or carousels, as she appeared to him at this moment, dressed in a simple robe of white satin, and accompanied by Donna Estefania, the only one of her Spanish women who had not been driven from her, by the jealousy of the king, or by the persecutions of Richelieu. Anne of Austria took two steps forward. Buckingham threw himself at her feet, and before the queen could prevent him, kissed the hem of her robe. Duke, you already know that it is not I who caused you to be written to. Yes, yes, madame, yes, your majesty, cried the duke. 
I know that I must have been mad, senseless, to believe that snow would become animated or marble warm. But what then? They who love believe easily in love. Besides, I have lost nothing by this journey because I see you. Yes, replied Anne, but you know why, and how I see you. Because, insensible to all my sufferings, you persist in remaining in a city where, by remaining, you run the risk of your life, and make me run the risk of my honour. I see you to tell you that everything separates us, the depths of the sea, the enmity of kingdoms, the sanctity of vows. It is sacrilege to struggle against so many things, my lord. In short, I see you to tell you that we must never see each other again." "'Speak on, madam, speak on, queen,' said Buckingham. "'The sweetness of your voice covers the harshness of your words. You talk of sacrilege. Why, the sacrilege is the separation of two hearts formed by God for each other. "'My lord,' cried the queen, "'you forget that I have never said that I love you.' "'But you have never told me that you did not love me, and truly, to speak such words to me would be, on the part of your majesty, too great an ingratitude. For tell me, where can you find a love like mine, a love which neither time nor absence nor despair can extinguish?' A love which contents itself with a lost ribbon, a stray look, or a chance word. It is now three years, madame, since I saw you for the first time, and during those three years I have loved you thus. Shall I tell you each ornament of your toilette? Mark, I see you now. You were seated upon cushions in the Spanish fashion. You wore a robe of green satin embroidered with gold and silver, hanging sleeves knotted upon your beautiful arms, those lovely arms, with large diamonds. You wore a close ruff, a small cap upon your head of the same color as your robe, and in that cap a heron's feather. Hold, hold! I shut my eyes, and I can see you as you were then. I open them again, and I see what you are now, a hundred times more beautiful. What folly! murmured Anne of Austria, who had not the courage to find fault with the duke for having so well preserved her portrait in his heart. What folly to feed a useless passion with such remembrances! And upon what, then, must I live? I have nothing but memory. It is my happiness, my treasure, my hope. Every time I see you is a fresh diamond, which I enclose in the casket of my heart. This is the fourth which you have let fall, and I have picked up. For in three years, madame, I have only seen you four times. The first which I have described to you, the second at the mansion of Madame de Chevreuse, the third in the gardens of Amiens. Duke, said the queen, blushing, never speak of that evening. Oh, let us speak of it! On the contrary, let us speak of it! That is the most happy and brilliant evening of my life! You remember what a beautiful night it was? How soft and perfumed was the air! How lovely the blue heavens and star enameled sky! Ah! Then, madame, I was able for one instant to be alone with you. Then you were about to tell me all the isolation of your life, the griefs of your heart. You leaned upon my arm. Upon this, madame, I felt, in bending my head toward you, your beautiful hair touch my cheek. And every time that it touched me, I trembled from head to foot. Oh, queen, queen, you, you do not know what felicity from heaven, what joys from paradise, are comprised in a moment like that. Take my wealth, my fortune, my glory, all the days I have to live, for such an instant, for a night like that. For that night, madame, that night you love me, I will swear it. My lord, yes. It is possible that the influence of the place— 
the charm of the beautiful evening, the fascination of your look, the thousand circumstances, in short, which sometimes unite to destroy a woman, were grouped around me on that fatal evening. But, my lord, you saw the queen come to the aid of the woman who faltered. At the first word you dared to utter, at the first freedom to which I had to reply, I called for help. Yes, yes, that is true. And any other love but mine would have sunk beneath this ordeal. But my love came out from it more ardent and more eternal. You believed that you would fly from me by returning to Paris. You believed that I would not dare to quit the treasure over which my master had charged me to watch. What to me were all the treasures in the world, or all the kings of the earth? Eight days after I was back again, madame. That time you had nothing to say to me. I had risked my life in favour to see you, but for a second. I did not even touch your hand, and you pardoned me on seeing me so submissive and so repentant. Yes, but calumny seized upon all those follies in which I took no part, as you know well, my lord. The king, excited by the cardinal, made a terrible clamour. Madame de Vernet was driven from me. Putange was exiled. Madame de Chevreuse fell into disgrace, and when you wished to come back as ambassador to France, the king himself, remember, my lord, the king himself opposed to it. Yes, and France is about to pay for her king's refusal, with a war. I am not allowed to see you, madame, but you shall every day hear of me. What object, think you, have this expedition to Ray, and this league with the Protestants of La Rochelle, which I am projecting? The pleasure of seeing you. I have no hope of penetrating, sword in hand, to Paris, I know that well. But this war may bring round a peace. This peace will require a negotiator. That negotiator will be me. They will not dare to refuse me then, and I will return to Paris and will see you again, and will be happy for an instant. Thousands of men, it is true, will have to pay for my happiness with their lives. But what is that to me? Provided I see you again. All this is perhaps folly, perhaps insanity. But tell me, what woman has a lover more truly in love? What queen, a servant more ardent? My lord, my lord! You invoke in your defence things which accuse you more strongly. All these proofs of love which you would give me are almost crimes. Because you do not love me, madame. If you loved me, you would view all this otherwise. If you loved me, if you loved me, that would be too great of happiness, and I should run mad. Ah, madame de Chevreuse was less cruel than you. Holland loved her and she responded to his love. Madame de Chevreuse was not queen, murmured Anne of Austria, overcome in spite of herself by the expression of so profound a passion. You would love me, then, if you were not queen. Madame, say that you would love me then. I can believe that it is the dignity of your rank alone which makes you cruel to me. I can believe that, had you been Madame de Chevreuse, Poor Buckingham might have hoped. Thanks for those sweet words. Oh, my beautiful sovereign, a hundred times thanks. Oh, my lord, you have ill understood, wrongly interpreted. I did not mean to say— Silence, silence, cried the duke. If I am happy in an error, do not have the cruelty to lift me from it. You have told me yourself, madame, that I have been drawn into a snare. I perhaps may leave my life in it, although it may be strange. I have for some time had a presentiment that I should shortly die." And the Duke smiled, with a smile at once sad and charming. "'Oh, my God!' cried Anne of Austria, with an accent of terror, which proved how much greater an interest she took in the Duke than she ventured to tell. "'I do not tell you this, madame, to terrify you. No, it is even ridiculous for me to name it to you. And believe me, I take no heed of such dreams. But the words you have just spoken, the hope you have almost given me, will have richly paid all, were it my life. 
"'Oh, but I—' said Anne. "'I also, Duke, have had presentiments. I also have had dreams. I dream—I dream that I saw you lying bleeding, wounded—' "'In the left side, was it not, and with a knife?' interrupted Buckingham. "'Yes, it was so, my lord, it was so, in the left side, and with a knife. Who can possibly have told you I had that dream? I have imparted it to no one but my God, and that in my prayers. I ask for no more. You love me, madame. It is enough. I love you? I? Yes, yes. Would God said the same dreams to you as to me if you did not love me? Should we have the same presentiments if our existences did not touch at the heart? You love me, my beautiful queen, and you will weep for me? Oh, my God, my God, cried Anne of Austria, this is more than I can bear. In the name of heaven, duke, leave me, go. I do not know whether I love you or love you not, but what I know is that I will not be perjured. Take pity on me, then, and go. Oh, if you are struck in France, if you die in France, if I could imagine that your love for me was the cause of your death, I could not console myself. I should run mad. Depart, then. Depart, I implore you. Oh, how beautiful you are thus! Oh, how I love you! said Buckingham. Go, go, I implore you, and return hereafter. Come back as ambassador. Come back as minister. Come back surrounded with guards who will defend you, with servants who will watch over you, and then I shall no longer fear for your days, and I shall be happy in seeing you. Oh, is this true what you say? Yes. Oh, then some pledge of your indulgence, some object which came from you, and may remind me that I have not been dreaming, something you have worn, and that I may wear in my turn. A ring, a necklace, a chain. Will you depart if I give you your demand? Yes. This very instant? Yes. You will leave France? You will return to England? I will, I swear to you. Wait, then, wait. Anne of Austria re-entered her apartment, and came out again almost immediately, holding a rosewood casket in her hand, with her cipher encrusted with gold. "'Here, my lord, here,' said she, "'keep this in memory of me.' Buckingham took the casket, and fell a second time on his knees. "'You have promised me to go,' said the queen. "'And I keep my word. Your hand, madame, your hand, and I depart.' Anne of Austria stretched forth her hand, closing her eyes, and leaning with the other upon Estefania, for she felt that her strength was about to fail her. Buckingham pressed his lips passionately to that beautiful hand, and then, rising, said, "'Within six months, if I am not dead, I shall have seen you again, madame, even if I have to overturn the world.' And, faithful to the promise he had made, he rushed out of the apartment. In the corridor he met Mademoiselle Bonacieux, who waited for him, and who, with the same precautions and the same good luck, conducted him out of the Louvre. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 13 Monsieur Bonacieux. There was in all this, as may have been observed, one personage concerned of whom, notwithstanding his precarious position, we have appeared to take but very little notice. This personage was Monsieur Bonacieux, the respectable martyr of the political and amorous intrigues which entangled themselves so nicely together at this gallant and chivalric period. Fortunately, the reader may remember, or may not remember, we have promised not to lose sight of him. The officers who arrested him conducted him straight to the Bastille, where he passed trembling before a party of soldiers who were loading their muskets. 
Thence, introduced into a half-subterranean gallery, he became, on the part of those who had brought him, the object of the grossest insults and the harshest treatment. The officers perceived that they had not to deal with a gentleman, and they treated him like a very peasant. At the end of half an hour or thereabouts, a clerk came to put an end to his tortures, but not to his anxiety, by giving the order to conduct M. Bonacieux to the chamber of examination. Ordinarily, prisoners were interrogated in their cells, but they did not do so with M. Bonacieux. Two guards attended the mercer, who made him traverse a court and enter a corridor in which there were three sentinels, opened a door and pushed him unceremoniously into a low room, where the only furniture was a table, a chair, and a commissary. The commissary was seated in the chair, and was writing at the table. The two guards led the prisoner toward the table, and upon a sign from the commissary drew back so far as to be unable to hear anything. The commissary, who had till this time held his head down over his papers, looked up to see what sort of person he had to do with. This commissary was a man of very repulsive mien, with a pointed nose, with yellow and salient cheekbones, with eyes small but keen and penetrating, and an expression of countenance resembling at once the polecat and the fox. His head, supported by a long and flexible neck, issued from his large black robe, balancing itself with a motion very much like that of the tortoise thrusting his head out of his shell. He began by asking M. Bonacieux his name, age, condition, and abode. The accused replied that his name was Jacques Michel Bonacieux, that he was fifty-one years old, a retired mercer, and lived at Rue de Fossoyeur, numero quatorze. The commissary then, instead of continuing to interrogate him, made a long speech upon the danger there is for an obscure citizen to meddle with public matters. He complicated this exordium by an exposition in which he painted the power and the deeds of the cardinal, that incomparable minister, that conqueror of past ministers, that example for ministers to come, deeds and power which none could thwart with impunity. After this second part of his discourse, fixing his hawk's eye upon poor Bonacieux, he bade him reflect upon the gravity of his situation. The reflections of the mercer were already made. He cursed the instant with M. Laporte formed the idea of marrying him to his goddaughter, and particularly the moment when that goddaughter had been received as Lady of the Linen to Her Majesty. At bottom, the character of M. Bonacieux was one of profound selfishness, mixed with sordid avarice, the whole seasoned with extreme cowardice. The love with which his young wife had inspired him was a secondary sentiment, and was not strong enough to contend with the primitive feelings we have just enumerated. Bonacieux, indeed, reflected upon what had just been said to him. "'But, Monsieur Commissary, said he calmly, believe that I know and appreciate, more than anybody, the merit of the incomparable eminence by whom we have the honour to be governed. Indeed, asked the commissary, with an air of doubt, if that is really so, how came you to the Bastille? How came I there, or rather why I am there, replied Bonacieux. That is entirely impossible for me to tell you, because I don't know myself but to a certainty it is not for having, knowingly at least, disobliged Monsieur de Cardinal. You must, nevertheless, have committed a crime, since you are here and are accused of high treason. Of high treason! cried Bonacieux, terrified. Of high treason! How is it possible for a poor mercer, who detests Huguenots and who abhors Spaniards, to be accused of high treason? Consider, monsieur, the thing is absolutely impossible. Monsieur Bonacieux, said the commissary, looking at the accused as if his little eyes had the faculty of reading to the very depths of hearts, you have a wife? Yes, monsieur, replied the mercer in a tremble, feeling that it was at this point affairs were likely to become perplexing. 
that is to say, I had one. What? You had one? What have you done with her, then, if you have her no longer? They have abducted her, monsieur. They have abducted her? Ha! Benacio inferred from this ah that the affair grew more and more intricate. They have abducted her, added the commissary. And do you know the man who has committed this deed? I think I know him. Who is he? Remember that I affirm nothing, Monsieur de Commissary, and that I only suspect. Whom do you suspect? Come, answer freely. Monsieur Bonacieux was in the greatest perplexity possible. Had he better deny everything, or tell everything? By denying all, it might be suspected that he must know too much to avow. By confessing all, he might prove his good will. He decided, then, to tell all. I suspect, said he, a tall, dark man, of lofty carriage, who has the air of a great lord. He has followed us several times, I think, when I have waited for my wife at the wicket of the Louvre to escort her home. The commissary now appeared to experience a little uneasiness. And his name? said he. Oh, as to his name, I know nothing about it but if I were ever to meet him I should recognize him in an instant. I will answer for it were he among a thousand persons." The face of the commissary grew still darker. "'You should recognize him among a thousand, say you,' continued he. "'That is to say,' cried Bonacio, who saw he had taken a false step, "'that is to say—' "'You have answered that you should recognize him,' said the commissary. "'That is all very well, and enough for to-day. Before we proceed further, someone must be informed that you know the ravisher of your wife. But I have told you I don't know him, cried Bonacio in despair. I have told you, on the contrary— Take away the prisoner, said the commissary to the two guards. Where must we place him? demanded the chief. In a dungeon. Which? Good Lord, in the first one handy, provided it is safe— said the commissary, with an indifference which penetrated poor Bonacio with horror. "'Alas! alas!' said he to himself. "'Misfortune is over my head. My wife must have committed some frightful crime. They believe me her accomplice, and will punish me with her. She must have spoken. She must have confessed everything. A woman is so weak. A dungeon! The first he comes to! That's it. A night is soon passed, and to-morrow to the wheel, to the gallows. Oh, my God, my God, have pity on me!" Without listening the least in the world to the lamentations of M. Bonacieux, lamentations to which, besides, they must have been pretty well accustomed, the two guards took the prisoner each by an arm, and led him away, while the commissary wrote a letter in haste and dispatched it by an officer in waiting. Bonacio could not close his eyes not because his dungeon was so very disagreeable, but because his uneasiness was so great. He sat all night on his stool, starting at the least noise, and when the first rays of the sun penetrated into his chamber, the dawn itself appeared to him to have taken funereal tints. All at once he heard his bolts drawn, and made a terrified bound. He believed they were come to conduct him to the scaffold so that when he saw merely and simply, instead of the executioner he expected, only his commissary of the preceding evening, attended by his clerk, he was ready to embrace them both. "'Your affair has become more complicated since yesterday evening, my good man, and I advise you to tell the whole truth, for your repentance alone can remove the anger of the cardinal.' "'Why, I—' I am ready to tell everything," cried Bonacio. At least all that I know. Interrogate me, I entreat you. Where is your wife, in the first place? Why, did I not tell you she'd been stolen from me? Yes, but yesterday at five o'clock in the afternoon, thanks to you, she escaped. My wife escaped? cried Bonacio. Oh, unfortunate creature! Monsieur! If she has escaped, it is not my fault, I swear. 
What business had you, then, to go into the chamber of Monsieur d'Artagnan, your neighbor, with whom you had a long conference during the day? Ah, yes, Monsieur Commissary, yes, that is true, and, and I confess I was in the wrong. I did go to Monsieur d'Artagnan's. What was the aim of that visit? To beg him to assist me in finding my wife. I believed I had a right to endeavor to find her. I was deceived, as it appears, and I ask your pardon. And what did Monsieur d'Artagnan reply? Monsieur d'Artagnan uh, promised me his assistance, but I soon found out that he was betraying me. You impose upon justice. Monsieur d'Artagnan made a compact with you, and in virtue of that compact put to flight the police who had arrested your wife, and has placed her beyond reach. Fortunately, Monsieur d'Artagnan is in our hands, and you shall be confronted with him. By my faith, I ask no better, cried Bonacieux. I shall not be sorry to see the face of an acquaintance. Bring in the Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the commissary to the guards. The two guards led in Athos. Monsieur d'Artagnan, said the commissary, addressing Athos, declare all that has passed yesterday between you and Monsieur. But, cried Bonacieux, this is not Monsieur d'Artagnan who you show me. What? Not Monsieur d'Artagnan? exclaimed the commissary. Not the least in the world, replied Bonacieux. What is this gentleman's name? asked the commissary. I cannot tell you. I don't know him. How? You don't know him? No. Did you never see him? Y yes, I have seen him, but I don't know what he calls himself. Your name, replied the commissary. Athos, replied the musketeer. But that is not a man's name. It is the name of a mountain, cried the poor questioner, who was beginning to lose his head. That is my name, said Athos quietly. But you said that your name was D'Artagnan. Who? I? Yes, you. Somebody said to me, You are Monsieur D'Artagnan? I answered, You think so? My guards exclaimed that they were sure of it. I did not wish to contradict them. Besides, I might be deceived. Monsieur, you insult the majesty of justice. Not at all, said Athos calmly. You are Monsieur d'Artagnan. You see, Monsieur, that you say it again. But I tell you, Monsieur Commissary, cried Bonacieux in his turn, there is not the least doubt about the matter. Monsieur d'Artagnan is my tenant, although he does not pay me my rent, and even better on that account ought I know him. Monsieur d'Artagnan is a young man, scarcely nineteen or twenty, and this this gentleman must be thirty at least. Monsieur d'Artagnan is in Monsieur Dessessart's guards, and this gentleman is in the company of Monsieur de Treville's musketeers. Look at his uniform, Monsieur Commissary. Look at his uniform. That's true, murmured the commissary. Pardieu, that's true. At this moment the door was opened quickly, and a messenger, introduced by one of the gatekeepers of the Bastille, gave a letter to the commissary. "'Oh, unhappy woman!' cried the commissary. "'How? What do you say? Of whom do you speak? It is not my wife, I hope.' "'On the contrary, it is of her. Yours is a pretty business.' "'But,' said the agitated mercer, "'do me the pleasure, monsieur, to tell me how my own proper affair can become worse by anything my wife does while I am in prison?' "'Because that which she does is part of a plan concerted between you, of an infernal plan. I swear to you, Monsieur Commissary, that you are in the profoundest error, that I know nothing in the world about what my wife had to do, that I am entirely a stranger to what she has done, and that if she has committed any follies, I renounce her, I abjure her, I curse her. Bah! said Athos to the Commissary. If you have no more need of me, send me somewhere. Your Monsieur Bonacio is very tiresome. The commissary, designated by the same gesture, Athos and Bonacieux, let them be guarded more closely than ever. And yet, said Athos, with his habitual calmness, 
If it is Monsieur d'Artagnan who is concerned in this matter, I do not perceive how I can take his place. Do as I bade you, cried the commissary, and preserve absolute secrecy. You understand. Athos shrugged his shoulders, and followed his guard silently, while Monsieur Bonacieux uttered lamentations enough to break the heart of a tiger. They locked the mercer in the same dungeon where he had passed the night, and left him to himself during the day. Bonacieux wept all day, like a true mercer, not being at all a military man, as he himself informed us. In the evening, about nine o'clock, at the moment he had made up his mind to go to bed, he heard steps in his corridor. These steps drew near to his dungeon, the door was thrown open, and the guards appeared. "'Follow me,' said an officer, who came up behind the guards. "'Follow you?' cried Bonacio. "'Follow you at this hour? Where, my God?' "'Where we have orders to lead you.' "'But that is not an answer.' "'It is, nevertheless, the only one we can give.' "'Ah, my God, my God!' murmured the poor mercer. "'Now, indeed, I am lost.' And he followed the guards who came for him, mechanically, and without resistance. He passed along the same corridor as before, crossed one court, then a second side of a building. At length, at the gate of the entrance court, he found a carriage surrounded by four guards on horseback. They made him enter this carriage. The officer placed himself by his side. The door was locked, and they were left in a rolling prison. The carriage was put in motion as slowly as a funeral car. Through the closely fastened windows, the prisoner could perceive the houses and the pavement, that was all. But, true Parisian as he was, Bonacio could recognize every street by the milestones, the signs, and the lamps. At the moment of arriving at St. Paul, the spot where such as were condemned at the Bastille were executed, he was near fainting and crossed himself twice. He thought the carriage was about to stop there. The carriage, however, passed on. Farther on, a still greater terror seized him on passing by the cemetery of Saint-Jean, where state criminals were buried. One thing, however, reassured him. He remembered that before they were buried their heads were generally cut off, and he felt that his head was still on his shoulders. But when he saw the carriage take the way to La Greve, where he perceived the pointed roof of the Hôtel de Ville, and the carriage passed under the arcade, he believed it was over with him. He wished to confess to the officer, and upon his refusal uttered such pitiable cries that the officer told him that if he continued to deafen him thus, he should put a gag in his mouth. This measure somewhat reassured Bonacio. If they meant to execute him at La Greve, it could scarcely be worth while to gag him, as they had nearly reached the place of execution. Indeed, the carriage crossed the fatal spot without stopping. There remained, then, no other place to fear but the traitor's cross. The carriage was taking the direct road to it. This time there was no longer any doubt. It was at the traitor's cross that lesser criminals were executed. Panacio had flattered himself in believing himself worthy of St. Paul, or of the Place de Greve. It was the, the traitor's cross that his journey and his destiny were about to end. He could not yet see that dreadful cross, but he felt somehow as if it were coming to meet him. When he was within twenty paces of it, he heard a noise of people, and the carriage stopped. This was more than poor Bonacio could endure, depressed as he was by the successive emotions which he had experienced. He uttered a feeble groan, which might have been taken for the last sigh of a dying man, and fainted. End of chapter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 14 The Man of Myung The crowd was caused, not by the expectation of a man to be hanged, but by the contemplation of a man who was hanged. 
The carriage, which had been stopped for a minute, resumed its way, passed through the crowd, threaded the Rue Saint Honore, turned into the Rue des Bons Enfants, and stopped before a low door. The door opened. Two guards received Bonacieux and their arms from the officer who supported him. They carried him through an alley, up a flight of stairs, and deposited him in an antechamber. All these movements had been effected mechanically, as far as he was concerned. He had walked as one walks in a dream. He had a glimpse of objects as through a fog. His ears had perceived sounds without comprehending them. He might have been executed at that moment without his making a single gesture in his own defence, or uttering a cry to implore mercy. He remained on the bench, with his back leaning against the wall and his hands hanging down, exactly on the spot where the guards placed him. On looking around him, however, as he could perceive no threatening object, as nothing indicated that he ran any real danger, as the bench was comfortably covered with a well-stuffed cushion, as the wall was ornamented with a beautiful Cordova leather, and as large red damask curtains, fastened back by gold clasps, floated before the window, he perceived by degrees that his fear was exaggerated, and he began to turn his head to the right and to the left, upward and downward. At this movement, which nobody opposed, he resumed a little courage, and ventured to draw up one leg and then the other. At length, with the help of his two hands, he lifted himself from the bench, and found himself on his feet. At this moment, an officer with a pleasant face opened a door, continued to exchange some words with a person in the next chamber, and then came up to the prisoner. "'Is your name Bonacio?' said he. "'Yes, monsieur, officer,' stammered the mercer, more dead than alive. "'At your service.' "'Come in,' said the officer." and he moved out of the way to let the mercer pass. The latter obeyed without reply, and entered the chamber, where he appeared to be expected. It was a large cabinet, close and stifling, with the walls furnished with arms offensive and defensive, and in which there was already a fire, although it was scarcely the end of the month of September. A square table, covered with books and papers, upon which was unrolled an immense plan of the city of La Rochelle, occupied the centre of the room. Standing before the chimney was a man of middle height, of a haughty, proud mien, with piercing eyes, a large brow, and a thin face, which was made still longer by a royal, or an imperial, as it is now called, surmounted by a pair of moustaches. Although this man was scarcely thirty-six or thirty-seven years of age, hair, moustaches, and royal, all began to be grey. This man, except a sword, had all the appearances of a soldier, and his buff boots, still slightly covered with dust, indicated that he had been on horseback in the course of the day. This man was Armand Jean Duplessis, Cardinal de Richelieu, not such as he is now represented. Broken down like an old man, suffering like a martyr, his body bent, his voice failing, buried in a large armchair as in an anticipated tomb, no longer living but by the strength of his genius, and no longer maintaining the struggle with Europe but by the eternal application of his thoughts. But such as he really was at this period, that is to say, an active and gallant cavalier, already weak of body, but sustained by that moral power which made of him one of the most extraordinary men that ever lived preparing, after having supported the Duc de Nevers in his Duchy of Mantua, after having taken Nîmes, Castres, and Ouse, to drive the English from the Isle of Ré and lay siege to La Rochelle. At first sight nothing denoted the cardinal, and it was impossible for those who did not know his face to guess in whose presence they were. The poor mercer remained standing at the door, while the eyes of the personage we have just described were fixed upon him, and appeared to wish to penetrate even into the depths of the pass. "'Is this that Bonacieux?' asked he, after a moment of silence. "'Yes, Monseigneur,' replied the officer. "'That's well. Give me those papers, and leave us.' 
The officer took from the table the papers pointed out, gave them to him who asked for them, bowed to the ground, and retired. Bonacieux recognized in those papers his interrogatories of the Bastille. From time to time the man by the chimney raised his eyes from the writings, and plunged them like poniards into the heart of the poor mercer. At the end of ten minutes of reading, and ten seconds of examination, the cardinal was satisfied. "'That head has never conspired,' murmured he. "'But it matters not. We will see.' "'You are accused of high treason,' said the cardinal, slowly. "'So I have been told already, Monseigneur,' cried Bonacieux, giving his interrogator the title he had heard the officer give him. "'But I swear to you I know nothing about it.' The cardinal repressed a smile. "'You have conspired with your wife.' with Madame de Chevreuse, and with my lord Duke of Buckingham. "'Indeed, Monseigneur,' responded the mercer, "'I have heard her pronounce all those names.' "'And on what occasion?' "'She said that the Cardinal de Richelieu had drawn the Duke of Buckingham to Paris, to ruin him, and to ruin the Queen.' "'She said that!' cried the Cardinal, with violence. "'Yes, Monseigneur, but I told her she was wrong to talk about such things.' and that his eminence was incapable— Hold your tongue! You are stupid! replied the cardinal. That's exactly what my wife said, Monseigneur. Do you know who carried off your wife? No, Monseigneur. You have suspicions, nevertheless? Yes, Monseigneur. But these suspicions appeared to be disagreeable to Monsieur de Commissary, and I no longer have them. Your wife escaped. Did you know that? No, Monseigneur. I learned it since I have been in prison, and that from the conversation of Monsieur de Commissary, an amiable man. The Cardinal repressed another smile. Then you are ignorant of what has become of your wife since your flight. Absolutely, Monseigneur. But she has most likely returned to the Louvre. At one o'clock this morning she had not returned. My God! What can have become of her, then? We shall know, be assured. Nothing is concealed from the Cardinal. The Cardinal knows everything. In that case, Monseigneur, do you believe the Cardinal will be so kind as to tell me what has become of my wife? Perhaps he may. But you must, in the first place, reveal to the Cardinal all you know of your wife's relations with Madame de Chevreuse. But, Monseigneur, I know nothing about them. I have never seen her. When you went to fetch your wife from the Louvre, did you always return directly home? Scarcely ever. She had business to transact with linen drapers, to whose houses I conducted her. And how many were there of these linen drapers? Two, Monseigneur. And where did they live? One in Rue de Vaugirard, and the other Rue de la Harpe. Did you go into these houses with her? Never, Monseigneur. I waited at the door. And what excuse did she give you for entering all alone? She gave me none. She told me to wait, and I waited. You are a very complacent husband, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, said the Cardinal. He calls me his dear Monsieur, said the mercer to himself. Pest! Matters are going all right. Should you know those doors again? Yes. Do you know the numbers? Yes. What are they? Number 25 in Rue de Vaugirard, 75 in Rue de la Harpe. That's well, said the cardinal. At these words he took up a silver bell and rang it. The officer entered. Go, said he, in a subdued voice, and find Rochefort. Tell him to come to me immediately, if he has returned. The count is here, said the officer, and request to speak with your eminence instantly. "'Let him come in, then,' said the cardinal quickly. The officer sprang out of the apartment with that alacrity which all the servants of the cardinal displayed in obeying him. "'To your eminence,' murmured Bonacio, rolling his eyes round in astonishment. Five seconds had scarcely elapsed since after the disappearance of the officer, when the door opened and a new personage entered. "'It is he!' cried Bonacio. "'He? What he?' asked the cardinal. THE MAN WHO ABDUCTED MY WIFE! The cardinal rang a second time. 
the officer reappeared. "'Place this man in the care of his guards again, and let him wait till I send for him.' "'No, Monseigneur, no, it is not he,' cried Bonacio. "'No, I, I was deceived. This is quite another man, and does not resemble him at all. Monsieur is, I'm sure, an honest man.' "'Take away that fool,' said the cardinal. The officer took Bonacio by the arms, and led him into the antechamber where he found his two guards. The newly introduced personage followed Bonacio impatiently with his eyes till he had gone out, and the moment the door closed, "'They have seen each other,' said he, approaching the cardinal eagerly. "'Who?' asked his eminence. "'He and she.' "'The queen and the duke?' cried Richelieu. "'Yes.' "'Where?' "'At the Louvre.' "'Are you sure of it?' "'Perfectly sure.' Who told you of it? Madame de Lannoy, who is devoted to your eminence, as you know. Why did she not let me know sooner? Whether by chance or mistrust, the queen made Madame de Sergy sleep in her chamber, and detained her all day. Well, we are beaten. Now let us try to take our revenge. I will assist you with all my heart, Monseigneur. Be assured of that. How did it come about? At half-past twelve the queen was with her women. Where? In her bedchamber. Go on. When someone came and brought her a handkerchief from her laundress. And then? The queen immediately exhibited strong emotion, and despite the rouge with which her face was covered, evidently turned pale. And then, and then! She then arose, and with altered voice, Ladies, said she, wait for me ten minutes, I shall soon return. Then she opened the door of her alcove and went out. Why did not Madame de Lannoy come and inform you instantly? Nothing was certain. Besides, Her Majesty had said, Ladies, wait for me, and she did not dare to disobey the Queen. How long did the Queen remain out of the chamber? Three quarters of an hour. None of her women accompanied her? only Donna Estefania. Did she afterward return? Yes, but only to take a little rosewood casket, with her cipher upon it, and went out again immediately. And when she finally returned, did she bring that casket with her? No. Does Madame de Lannoy know what was in that casket? Yes, the diamond studs which His Majesty gave the Queen. And she came back without this casket. Yes. Madame de Lannoy, then, is of opinion that she gave them to Buckingham? She is sure of it. How can she be so? In the course of the day, Madame de Lannoy, in her quality of tirewoman of the Queen, looked for this casket, appeared uneasy at not finding it, and at length asked information of the Queen. And then the Queen? the queen became exceedingly red, and replied that having in the evening broken one of those studs, she had sent it to her goldsmith to be repaired. He must be called upon, and so ascertain if the thing be true or not. I have just been with him. And the goldsmith? The goldsmith has heard nothing of it. Well, well, Rochefort, all is not lost, and perhaps— Perhaps everything is for the best. The fact is that I do not doubt your eminence's genius. Will repair the blunders of his agent, is that it? That is exactly what I was going to say, if your eminence had let me finish my sentence. Meanwhile, do you know where the Duchesse de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham are now concealed? No, Monseigneur, my people could tell me nothing on that head. But I know. You, Monseigneur? Yes, or at least I guess. They were, one in the Rue de Vaugirard, number 25, the other in the Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Does your eminence command that they both be instantly arrested? It will be too late. They will be both gone. But still, we can make sure that they are so. Take ten men of my guardsmen, and search the two houses thoroughly. Instantly, Monseigneur and Rochefort went hastily out of the apartment. 
The cardinal being left alone, reflected for an instant, and then rang the bell a third time. The same officer appeared. "'Bring the prisoner in again,' said the cardinal. M. Bonacieux was introduced afresh, and upon a sign from the cardinal, the officer retired. "'You have deceived me,' said the cardinal sternly. "'I,' cried Bonacieux, "'I deceive your eminence?' "'Your wife, in going to Rue de Vaugirard and Rue de la Harpe, did not go to find linen drapers.' "'Then why did she go, just God?' She went to meet the Duchesse de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham. Yes, cried Bonacieux, recalling all his remembrances of the circumstances. Yes, that's it. Your eminence is right. I told my wife several times that it was surprising that linen drapers should live in such houses as those, in houses that had no signs, but she always laughed at me. Ah, Monseigneur, continued Bonacieux throwing himself at his eminence's feet. Ah, how truly you are the cardinal, the great cardinal, the man of genius whom all the world reveres! The cardinal, however contemptible might be the triumph gained over so vulgar a being as Bonacieux, did not the less enjoy it for an instant. Then, almost immediately, as if a fresh thought had occurred, a smile played upon his lips, and he said, offering his hand to the mercer, Rise, my friend. You are a worthy man. The cardinal has touched me with his hand. I have touched the hand of the great man, cried Bonacieux. The great man has called me his friend. Yes, my friend, yes, said the cardinal, with that paternal tone which he sometimes knew how to assume, but which deceived none who knew him. And as you have been unjustly suspected, well, you must be indemnified. Here, Take this purse of a hundred pistoles, and pardon me. I pardon you, Monseigneur, cried Bonacieux, hesitating to take the purse, fearing, doubtless, that this pretended gift was but a pleasantry. But you are able to have me arrested. You are able to have me tortured. You are able to have me hanged. You are the master, and I could not have the least word to say. Pardon you, Monseigneur, you cannot mean that. Ah, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, you are generous in this matter. I see it, and I thank you for it. Thus, then, you will take this bag, and you will go away without being too malcontent. I go away enchanted. Farewell, then, or rather, au revoir. And the cardinal made him a sign with his hand, to which Bonacieux replied by bowing to the ground. He then went out backward and when he was in the antechamber the cardinal heard him, in his enthusiasm, crying aloud, "'Long life to the Monseigneur! Long life to his eminence! Long life to the great cardinal!' The cardinal listened with a smile to this vociferous manifestation of the feelings of Monsieur Bonacieux, and then, when Bonacieux's cries were no longer audible, "'Good,' said he, "'that man will henceforward lay down his life for me.' and the cardinal began to examine with the greatest attention the map of La Rochelle, which, as we have said, lay open on the desk, tracing with a pencil the line in which the famous dyke was to pass, which, eighteen months later, shut up the port of the besieged city. As he was in the deepest of his strategic meditations, the door opened, and Rochefort returned. "'Well,' said the cardinal, eagerly, rising with a promptitude which proved the degree of importance he attached to the commission with which he had charged the count. Well, said the latter, a young woman of about twenty-six or twenty-eight years of age, and a man of from thirty-five to forty, have indeed lodged at the two houses pointed out by your eminence. But the woman left last night, and the man this morning. It was they, cried the cardinal, looking at the clock. It is now too late to have them pursued. Mm. The Duchesse is at Tours, and the Duke at Boulogne. It is in London they must be found. What are your eminence's orders? Not a word of what is past. Let the Queen remain in perfect security. Let her be ignorant that we know her secret. Let her believe that we are in search of some conspiracy or other. Send me the keeper of the seals, Seguier. 
and that man what has your eminence done with him what man asked the cardinal that bonacieux i have done with him all that could be done i have made him a spy upon his wife the comte de rochefort bowed like a man who acknowledges the superiority of the master as great and retired left alone the cardinal seated himself again and wrote a letter which he secured with his special seal then he rang the officer entered for the fourth time tell vitre to come to me said he and tell him to get ready for a journey an instant after the man he asked for was before him booted and spurred vitre said he you will go with all speed to london you must not stop an instant on the way you will deliver this letter to milady here is an order for two hundred pistoles call upon my treasure and get the money you shall have as much again if you are back within six days and have executed your commission well the messenger without replying a single word bowed took the letter with the order for the two hundred pistoles and retired here is what the letter contained milady be at the first ball at which the duke of buckingham shall be present he will wear on his doublet twelve diamond studs get as near to him as you can and cut off two as soon as these studs shall be in your possession inform me end of chapter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org the three musketeers by alexander dumas chapter 15 men of the robe and men of the sword on the day after these events had taken place, Athos, not having reappeared, Monsieur de Treville was informed by D'Artagnan and Porthos of the circumstance. As to Aramis, he had asked for leave of absence for five days, and was gone, it was said, to Rouen on family business. Monsieur de Treville was the father of his soldiers. The lowest or the least known of them, as soon as he assumed the uniform of the company, was as sure of his aid and support as if he had been his own brother. He repaired then instantly to the office of the lieutenant criminal. The officer who commanded the post of the Red Cross was sent for, and by successive inquiries they learned that Athos was then lodged in the Fort Levesque. Athos had passed through all the examinations we have seen Bonacieux undergo. We were present at the scene in which the two captives were confronted with each other. Athos, who had till that time said nothing for fear that D'Artagnan, interrupted in his turn, should not have the time necessary from this moment declared that his name was Athos, and not D'Artagnan. He added that he did not know either Monsieur or Madame Bonacieux, that he had never spoken to one or the other, that he had come, at about ten o'clock in the evening, to pay a visit to his friend Monsieur D'Artagnan, but that till that hour he had been at Monsieur de Treville's, where he had dined. Twenty witnesses, added he, could attest the fact, and he named several distinguished gentlemen. Among them was Monsieur le Duc de la Troimie. The second commissary was as much bewildered as the first had been by the simple and firm declaration of the musketeer, upon whom he was anxious to take the revenge which men of the robe like, at all times, to gain over men of the sword. But the name of Monsieur de Treville, and that of Monsieur de la Troimie, commanded a little reflection. Athos was then sent to the cardinal, but unfortunately the cardinal was at the Louvre with the king. It was precisely at this moment that M. de Treville, on leaving the residence of the lieutenant criminel and the governor of the Fort Levesque without being able to find Athos, arrived at the palace. As captain of the musketeers, M. de Treville had the right of entry at all times. It is well known how violent the king's prejudices were against the queen, and how carefully these prejudices were kept up by the cardinal, who in affairs of intrigue mistrusted women infinitely more than men. One of the grand causes of this prejudice was the friendship of Anne of Austria for Madame de Chevreau. These two women gave him more uneasiness than the war with Spain, the quarrel with England, or the embarrassment of the finances. In his eyes, and to his conviction, Madame de Chevreau not only served the Queen in her political intrigues, but what tormented him still more, in her amorous intrigues. At the first word the Cardinal spoke of Madame de Chevreau, who, though exiled to Tours and believed to be in that city, had come to Paris, remained there five days, and outwitted the police, 
The king flew into a furious passion. Capricious and unfaithful, the king wished to be called Louis the Just and Louis the Chaste. Posterity will find a difficulty in understanding this character, which history explains only by facts and never by reason. But when the cardinal added that not only Madame de Chevreau had been in Paris, but still further, that the queen had renewed with her one of those mysterious correspondences which at that time was named a cabal, when he affirmed that he, the cardinal, was about to unravel the most closely twisted thread of this intrigue, that at the moment of arresting in the very act, with all the proofs about her, the queen's emissary to the exiled duchess, a musketeer had dared to interrupt the course of justice violently, by falling sword in hand upon the honest men of the law, charged with investigating impartially the whole affair, in order to place it before the eyes of the king. Louis the Thirteenth could not contain himself, and he made a step toward the queen's apartment with that pale and mute indignation which, when it broke out, led this prince to the commission of the most pitiless cruelty. And yet in all this the cardinal had not yet said a word about the Duke of Buckingham. At this instant M. de Treville entered, cool, polite, and in irreproachable costume. Informed of what had passed by the presence of the cardinal, and the alteration in the king's countenance, M. de Treville felt himself something like Samson before the Philistines. Louis the Thirteenth had already placed his hand on the knob of the door. At the noise of M. de Treville's entrance he turned round. "'You arrive in good time, monsieur,' said the king, who, when his passions were raised to a certain point, could not dissemble. "'I have learned some fine things concerning your musketeers.' "'And I,' said Treville coldly, I have some pretty things to tell your majesty concerning these gownsmen. What? said the king, with hauteur. I have the honour to inform your majesty, continued M. de Treville in the same tone, that a party of procurers, commissaries, and men of the police, very estimable people, but very inveterate, as it appears, against the uniform, have taken it upon themselves to arrest in a house, to lead away through the open street, and throw into the Fort Levesque, all upon an order which they have refused to show me, one of my, or rather your, musketeers, sire, of irreproachable conduct, of an almost illustrious reputation, and whom your majesty knows favourably, Monsieur Athos. Athos, said the king mechanically, yes, certainly I know that name. Let your majesty remember, said Trevi, that Monsieur Athos is the musketeer who, in the annoying duel which you are acquainted with, had the misfortune to wound Monsieur de Caussac so seriously. A propos, Monseigneur, continued Trevi, addressing the cardinal, Monsieur de Caussac is quite recovered, is he not? Thank you, said the cardinal, biting his lips with anger. Athos, then, went to pay a visit to one of his friends absent at the time, continued Trevi, Two young Bernays, a cadet in His Majesty's guards, the company of Monsieur Dessessart, but scarcely had he arrived at his friends and taken up a book while waiting his return, when a mixed crowd of bailiffs and soldiers came and laid siege to the house, broke open several doors. The cardinal made the king a sign, which signified, That was on account of the affair about which I spoke to you. We all know that, interrupted the king, for all that was done for our service. Then, said Trevi, it was also for your majesty's service that one of my musketeers, who was innocent, has been seized, that he has been placed between two guards like a malefactor, and that this gallant man, who has ten times shed his blood in your majesty's service and is ready to shed it again, has been paraded through the midst of an insolent populace. Bah! said the king, who began to be shaken. Was it so managed? Monsieur de Chavy, said the cardinal, with the greatest phlegm, does not tell your majesty that this innocent musketeer, this gallant man, had only an hour before attacked, sword in hand, four commissaries of enquiry, who were delegated by myself to examine into an affair of the highest importance. I defy your eminence to prove it, cried Trevi, with his Gascon freedom and military frankness. For one hour before, Monsieur Athos, who, I will confide it to your majesty, is really a man of the highest quality, did me the honour, after having dined with me, to be conversing in the saloon of my hotel with the Duc de la Tremouille and the Comte de Chaloux, who happened to be there. The king looked at the cardinal. A written examination attests to it, said the cardinal replying aloud to the mute interrogation of his majesty, and the ill-treated people have drawn up the following, which I have the honour to present to your majesty. And is the written report of the gownsman to be placed in comparison with the word of honour of a swordsman? replied Treville haughtily. Come, come, Treville, hold your tongue, said the king. If his eminence entertains any suspicion against one of my musketeers, said Treville, the justice of Monsieur the Cardinal is so well known that I demand an inquiry. 
"'In the house in which the judicial inquiry was made,' continued the impassive cardinal, "'there lodges, I believe, a young Bernays, a friend of the musketeer.' "'Your eminence means Monsieur d'Artagnan.' "'I mean the young man whom you patronize, Monsieur de Treville.' "'Yes, Your Eminence, it is the same. "'Do you not suspect this young man of having given bad counsel?' "'To Athos, a man double his age,' interrupted Treville. "'No, Monseigneur. Besides, D'Artagnan passed the evening with me.' "'Well,' said the Cardinal, "'everybody seems to have passed the evening with you.' "'Does Your Eminence doubt my word?' said Treville, with a brow flushed with anger. "'No, God forbid,' said the Cardinal. "'Only at what hour was he with you?' "'Oh, as to that I can speak positively, Your Eminence, "'for as he came in I remarked that it was but half-past nine by the clock, "'although I had believed it to be later. "'At what hour did he leave your hotel?' "'At half-past ten, an hour after the event.' "'Well,' replied the Cardinal, "'who could not for an instant suspect the loyalty of Treville, "'and who felt that the victory was escaping him. "'Well, but Athos was taken in the house at the Rue de Fossillors. "'Is one friend forbidden to visit another?' or a musketeer of my company to fraternize with a guard of Dessessart's company? Yes, when the house where he fraternizes is suspected. That house is suspected, Treville, said the king. Perhaps you did not know it. Indeed, sire, I did not. The house may be suspected, but I deny that it is so in the part of it inhabited by my Monsieur d'Artagnan, for I can affirm, sire, if I can believe what he says, that there does not exist a more devoted servant of your majesty, or a more profound admirer of Monsieur the Cardinal. Was it not this D'Artagnan who wounded Jussac one day, in that unfortunate encounter which took place near the convent of the Carme de Sachaux? asked the king, looking at the cardinal, who coloured with vexation. And the next day Bernajoux? Yes, sire, yes, it is the same. Your majesty has a good memory. Come, how shall we decide? said the king. That concerns your majesty more than me, said the cardinal. I should affirm the culpability. And I deny it, said Treville. "'But his majesty has judges, and these judges will decide.' "'That is best,' said the king. "'Send the case before the judges. "'It is their business to judge, and they shall judge.' "'Only,' replied Treville, "'it is a sad thing that in the unfortunate times in which we live, "'the purest life, the most incontestable virtue, "'cannot exempt a man from infamy and persecution. "'The army, I will answer for it, "'will be but little pleased at being exposed to rigorous treatment "'on account of police affairs.' The expression was imprudent, but M. de Treville launched it with knowledge of his cause. He was desirous of an explosion, because in that case the mind throws forth fire, and fire enlightens. "'Police affairs!' cried the king, taking up Treville's words. "'Police affairs! And what do you know about them, monsieur? Meddle with your musketeers, and do not annoy me in this way. It appears, according to your account, that if by mischance a musketeer is arrested, France is in danger.' What a noise about a musketeer! I would arrest ten of them, a hundred, even all the company, and I would not allow a whisper. From the moment they are suspected by your majesty, said Treville, the musketeers are guilty. Therefore you see me prepared to surrender my sword. For after having accused my soldiers, there can be no doubt that Monsieur the Cardinal will end by accusing me. It is best to constitute myself at once a prisoner with Athos, who is already arrested, and with D'Artagnan, who will most probably be arrested. Gascon-headed man, will you have done— said the king. Sire, replied Treville, without lowering his voice in the least, either order my musketeer to be restored to me, or let him be tried. He shall be tried, said the cardinal. Well, so much the better, for in that case I shall demand of his majesty permission to plead for him. The king feared an outbreak. If his eminence, said he, did not have personal motives, the cardinal saw what the king was about to say, and interrupted him. Pardon me, said he, but the instant your majesty considers me a prejudiced judge, I withdraw. Come, said the king, will you swear by my father that Athos was at your residence during the event, and that he took no part in it? By your glorious father and by yourself, whom I love and venerate above all the world, I swear it. Be so kind as to reflect, sire, said the cardinal. If we release the prisoner thus, we shall never know the truth. Athos may always be found, replied Treville, ready to answer, when it shall please the gownsman to interrogate him. He will not desert, Monsieur the Cardinal, be assured of that. I will answer for him. No, he will not desert, said the king. He can always be found, as Treville said. Besides, added he, lowering his voice and looking with a suppliant air at the Cardinal, let us give them apparent security. That is policy. This policy of Louis the Thirteenth made Richelieu smile. Order it as you please, sire. You possess the right of pardon. 
The right of pardoning only applies to the guilty, said Treville, who was determined to have the last word, and my musketeer is innocent. It is not mercy, then, that you are about to accord, sire. It is justice. And he is in the Fort Levesque, said the king. Yes, sire, in solitary confinement, in a dungeon, like the lowest criminal. The devil, murmured the king, what must be done? Sign an order for his release, and all will be said, replied the cardinal. I believe with your majesty that Monsieur de Treville's guarantee is more than sufficient. Treville bowed very respectfully, with a joy that was not unmixed with fear. He would have preferred an obstinate resistance on the part of the cardinal to this sudden yielding. The king signed the order for release, and Treville carried it away without delay. As he was about to leave the presence, the cardinal gave him a friendly smile, and said, A perfect harmony reigns, sire, between the leaders and the soldiers of your musketeers, which must be profitable for the service, and honourable to all. He will play me some dog's trick or other, and that immediately, said Treville. One never has the last word with such a man. But let us be quick. The king may change his mind in an hour, and at all events it is more difficult to replace a man in the Fort Levesque or the Bastille who has got out, than to keep a prisoner there who is in. M. de Treville made his entrance triumphantly into the Fort Levesque, whence he delivered the musketeer, whose peaceful indifference had not for a moment abandoned him. The first time he saw D'Artagnan, "'You have come off well,' said he to him. "'There is your Jussac thrust paid for. There still remains that of Bernajoux, but you must not be too confident.' As to the rest, M. de Treville had good reason to mistrust the cardinal, and to think that all was not over for scarcely had the captain of the musketeers closed the door after him, than his eminence said to the king, "'Now that we are at length by ourselves, we will, if your majesty pleases, converse seriously. Sire, Buckingham has been in Paris five days, and only left this morning.'" End of chapter 15「フォーマーズ・ド・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッドル・ウィッグ・ラッド Buckingham in Paris, cried he, and why does he come? To conspire, no doubt, with your enemies, the Huguenots and the Spaniards. No, pardieu, no, to conspire against my honour with Madame de Chevreux, Madame de Longueville, and the Condes. Oh, sire, what an idea! The Queen is too virtuous, and besides, loves your Majesty too well. Woman is weak, Monsieur Cardinal, said the King, and as to loving me much, I have my own opinion as to that love. I none the less maintain, said the Cardinal, that the Duke of Buckingham came to Paris for a project wholly political. And I am sure that he came for quite another purpose, Monsieur de Cardinal. But if the Queen be guilty, let her tremble. Indeed, said the Cardinal, whatever repugnance I may have to directing my mind to such a treason, your Majesty compels me to think of it. Madame de Lunoy, whom, according to your Majesty's command, I have frequently interrogated, told me this morning that the night before last her Majesty sat up very late, that this morning she wept much, and that she was writing all day. That's it, cried the King, to him, no doubt. Cardinal, I must have the Queen's papers. But how to take them, sire? It seems to me that it is neither your Majesty nor myself who can charge himself with such a mission. How did they act with regard to the Marechal d'Ancre? cried the King, in the highest state of choler. First her closets were searched, and then she herself. The Marechal d'Ancre was no more than the Marechal d'Ancre, a Florentine adventurer, sire, and that is all, while the august spouse of your Majesty is Anne of Austria, Queen of France, that is to say, one of the greatest princesses in the world. She is none the less guilty, Monsieur Duke. The more she has forgotten the high position in which she was placed, the more degrading is her fall. Besides, I long ago determined to put an end to all these petty intrigues of policy and love. She has near her a certain Laporte, who, I believe, is the mainspring of all this, I confess, said the Cardinal. You think, then, as I do, that she deceives me, said the King. I believe, and I repeat to your Majesty, that the Queen conspires against the power of the King, but I have not said against his honour. And I, I tell you both, I tell you the Queen does not love me. I tell you she loves another. I tell you she loves that infamous Buckingham. Why do you not have him arrested while he is in Paris? Arrest the Duke? Arrest the Prime Minister of King Charles I? 
Think of it, sire, what a scandal! And if the suspicions of your majesty, which I still continue to doubt, should prove to have any foundation, what a terrible disclosure! What a fearful scandal! But as he exposed himself like a vagabond or a thief, he should have been— Louis the Thirteenth stopped, terrified at what he was about to say, while Richelieu, stretching out his neck, waited uselessly for the word which should have died on the lips of the king. He should have been— Nothing, said the king, nothing. But all the time he was in Paris, you, of course, did not lose sight of him. No, sire. Where did he lodge? Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Where is that? By the side of the Luxembourg. And you are certain that the queen and he did not see each other? I believe the queen to have too high a sense of duty, sire. But they have corresponded. It is to him that the queen has been writing all the day. Monsieur le duc, I must have those letters. Sire, notwithstanding. Monsieur, at whatever price it may be, I will have them. I would, however, beg your majesty to observe. Do you then also join in betraying me, Monsieur Cardinal, by thus always opposing my will? Are you also in accord with Spain and England, with Madame de Chevreau and the Queen? Sire, replied the cardinal, sighing, I believed myself secure from such a suspicion. Monsieur Cardinal, you heard me. I will have those letters. There is but one way. What is that? That would be to charge Monsieur de Segur, the keeper of the seals, with this mission. The matter enters completely into the duties of the post. Let him be sent for instantly. He is most likely at my hotel. I requested him to call, and when I came to the Louvre I left orders, if he came, to desire him to wait. Let him be sent for instantly. Your Majesty's orders shall be executed, but— But what? But the Queen will perhaps refuse to obey. My orders? Yes, if she is ignorant that these orders come from the King. Well, that she may have no doubt on that head, I will go and inform her myself. Your Majesty will not forget that I have done everything in my power to prevent a rupture. Yes, Duke, yes, I know you are very indulgent toward the Queen. Too indulgent, perhaps. We shall have occasion, I warn you, at some future period to speak of that. Whenever it shall please Your Majesty. But I shall always be happy and proud, sire, to sacrifice myself to the harmony which I desire to see reign between you and the Queen of France. Very well, Cardinal, very well. But in the meantime, send for Monsieur the Keeper of the Seals. I will go to the Queen. And Louis the Thirteenth, opening the door of communication, passed into the corridor which led from his apartments to those of Anne of Austria. The Queen was in the midst of her women, Madame de Guiteau, Madame de Sable, Madame de Montbazon, and Madame du Gamin. In a corner was the Spanish companion, Dona Estefania, who had followed her from Madrid. Madame Gamin was reading aloud, and every one was listening to her with attention, with the exception of the Queen, who had, on the contrary, desired this reading, in order that she might be able, while feigning to listen, to pursue the thread of her own thoughts. These thoughts, as they were, gilded by a last reflection of love, were not the less sad. Anne of Austria, deprived of the confidence of her husband, pursued by the hatred of the cardinal, who could not pardon her for having repulsed a more tender feeling, having before her eyes the example of the queen-mother, whom that hatred had tormented all her life, though Marie de' Medici, if the memoirs of the time are to be believed, had begun by according to the cardinal that sentiment which Anne of Austria always refused him, Anne of Austria had seen her most devoted servants fall around her, her most intimate confidants, her dearest favourites. Like those unfortunate persons endowed with a fatal gift, she brought misfortune upon everything she touched. Her friendship was a fatal sign which called down persecution. Madame de Chevreau and Madame de Bernay were exiled, and Laporte did not conceal from his mistress that he expected to be arrested every instant. It was at the moment when she was plunged in the deepest and darkest of these reflections that the door of the chamber opened, and the king entered. The reader hushed herself instantly. All the ladies rose, and there was a profound silence. As to the king, he made no demonstration of politeness, only stopping before the queen. Madame, said he, you are about to receive a visit from the Chancellor, who will communicate certain matters to you with which I have charged him. The unfortunate queen, who was constantly threatened with divorce, exile, and trial even, turned pale under her rouge, and could not refrain from saying, But why this visit, sire? What can the Chancellor have to say to me that your Majesty could not say yourself? The king turned upon his heel without reply, and almost at the same instant the captain of the guards, M. de Guiton, announced the visit of the Chancellor. When the Chancellor appeared, the king had already gone out by another door. The Chancellor entered, half smiling, half blushing. As we shall probably meet with him again in the course of our history, it may be well for our readers to be made at once acquainted with him. 
This Chancellor was a pleasant man. He was de Roche de la Masse, canon of Notre Dame, who had formerly been a valet of the bishop, who introduced him to his eminence as a perfectly devout man. The cardinal trusted him, and therein found his advantage. There are many stories related of him, and among them this. After a wild youth he had retired into a convent, there to expiate, at least for some time, the follies of adolescence. On entering this holy place, the poor penitent was unable to shut the door so close as to prevent the passions he fled from entering with him. He was incessantly attacked by them, and the superior to whom he had confided this misfortune, wishing as much as in him lay to free him from them, had advised him, in order to conjure away the tempting demon, to have recourse to the bell-rope, and ring with all his might. At the denunciating sound, the monks would be rendered aware that temptation was besieging a brother, and all the community would go to prayer. This advice appeared good to the future chancellor. He conjured the evil spirit with abundance of prayers offered up by the monks, but the devil does not suffer himself to be easily dispossessed from a place in which he has fixed his garrison. In proportion as they redoubled the exorcisms, he redoubled the temptations, so that day and night the bell was ringing full swing, announcing the extreme desire for mortification which the penitent experienced. The monks had no longer an instant of repose. By day they did nothing but ascend and descend the steps which led to the chapel. At night, in addition to complines and matins, they were further obliged to leap twenty times out of their beds, and prostrate themselves on the floor of their cells. It is not known whether it was the devil who gave way, or the monks who grew tired, but within three months the penitent reappeared in the world with the reputation of being the most terrible possessed that ever existed. On leaving the convent, he entered into the magistracy, became president on the place of his uncle, embraced the cardinal's party, which did not prove want of sagacity, became chancellor, served his eminence with zeal in his hatred against the queen mother and his vengeance against Anne of Austria, stimulated the judges in the affair of Calais, encouraged the attempts of Monsieur de Laufemas, chief gamekeeper of France, and then at length invested with the entire confidence of the cardinal, a confidence which he had so well earned, he received the singular commission for the execution of which he presented himself in the queen's apartments. The queen was still standing when he entered, but scarcely had she perceived him than she reseated herself in her armchair, and made a sign to her women to resume their cushions and stools, and with an air of supreme hauteur, said, What do you desire, monsieur? And with what object do you present yourself here? To make, madame, in the name of the king, and without prejudice to the respect which I have the honour to owe to your majesty, a close examination into all your papers. How, monsieur? An investigation of my papers? Mine? Truly, this is an indignity. Be kind enough to pardon me, madame, but in this circumstance I am but the instrument which the king employs. Has not his majesty just left you, and has he not himself asked you to prepare for this visit? Search, then, monsieur. I am a criminal, as it appears. Estefania, give up the keys of my drawers and my desks. For form's sake, the chancellor paid a visit to the pieces of furniture named, but he knew well that it was not in a piece of furniture that the queen would place the important letter she had written that day. When the Chancellor had opened and shut twenty times the drawers of the secretaries, it became necessary, whatever hesitation he might experience, it became necessary, I say, to come to the conclusion of the affair, that is to say, to search the Queen herself. The Chancellor advanced, therefore, toward Anne of Austria, and said with a very perplexed and embarrassed air, "'And now it remains for me to make the principal examination.' "'What is that?' asked the Queen, who did not understand, or rather, who was not willing to understand." His Majesty is certain that a letter has been written by you during the day. He knows that it has not yet been sent to its address. This letter is not in your table, nor in your secretary, and yet this letter must be somewhere. Would you dare to lift your hand to your queen? said Anne of Austria, drawing herself up to her full height, and fixing her eyes upon the Chancellor with an expression almost threatening. I am a faithful subject of the King, madame, and all that His Majesty commands I shall do. Well, it is true, said Anne of Austria. And the spies of the cardinal have served him faithfully. I have written a letter to-day. The letter is not yet gone. The letter is here. And the queen laid her beautiful hand on her bosom. Then give me that letter, madame, said the chancellor. I will give it to none but the king, monsieur, said Anne. If the king had desired that the letter should be given to him, madame, he would have demanded it of you himself. But I repeat to you, I am charged with reclaiming it, and if you do not give it up, well... He has then charged me to take it from you. How? What do you say? That my orders go far, madame, and that I am authorized to seek for the suspected paper, even on the person of your majesty. What horror! cried the queen. Be kind enough, then, madame, to act more compliantly. 
The conduct is infamously violent. Do you know that, monsieur? The king commands it, madame. Excuse me. I will not suffer it. I would rather die, cried the queen, in whom the imperious blood of Spain and Austria began to rise. The chancellor made a profound reverence. Then, with the intention quite patent of not drawing back a foot from the accomplishment of the commission with which he was charged, and as the attendant of an executioner might have done in the chamber of torture, he approached Anne of Austria, for whose eyes at the same instant sprang tears of rage. The queen was, as we have said, of great beauty. The commission might well be called delicate, and the king had reached, in his jealousy of Buckingham, the point of not being jealous of any one else. Without doubt the Chancellor, Segur, looking about at that moment for the rope of the famous bell, but not finding it, he summoned his resolution, and stretched forth his hands to the place where the Queen had acknowledged the paper was to be found. Anne of Austria took one step back, became so pale that it might be said she was dying, and leaning with her left hand upon a table behind her to keep herself from falling, she with her right hand drew the paper from her bosom, and held it out to the keeper of the seals. "'There, monsieur, there is that letter.' cried the queen, with a broken and trembling voice. Take it, and deliver me from your odious presence. The chancellor, who, on his part, trembled with an emotion easily to be conceived, took the letter, bowed to the ground, and retired. The door was scarcely closed in upon him when the queen sank, half-fainting, into the arms of her women. The chancellor carried the letter to the king without having read a single word of it. The king took it with a trembling hand, looked for the address which was wanting, became very pale, opened it slowly, then seeing by the first words that it was addressed to the King of Spain, he read it rapidly. It was nothing but a plan of attack against the Cardinal. The Queen pressed her brother and the Emperor of Austria to appear to be wounded, as if they really were, by the policy of Richelieu, the eternal object of which was the abasement of the House of Austria, to declare war against France, and as a condition of peace, to insist upon the dismissal of the Cardinal. But as to love, there was not a single word about it in all the letter. The king, quite delighted, inquired if the cardinal was still at the Louvre. He was told that his eminence awaited the orders of his majesty in the business cabinet. The king went straight to him. "'There, duke,' said he, "'you were right, and I was wrong. The whole intrigue is political, and there is not the least question of love in this letter. But on the other hand, there is abundant question of you.' The cardinal took the letter, and read it with the greatest attention. Then, when he had arrived at the end of it, he read it a second time. "'Well, your majesty,' said he, "'you see how far my enemies go. "'They menace you with two wars if you do not dismiss me. "'In your place, in truth, sire, I should yield to such powerful instance, "'and on my part it would be a real happiness to withdraw from public affairs.' "'What say you, duke?' "'I say, sire, that my health is sinking under these excessive struggles "'and these never-ending labours. "'I say that according to all probability I shall not be able to undergo the fatigues of the siege of La Rochelle, and that it would be far better that you should appoint there either Monsieur de Conne, Monsieur de Bassopierre, or some valiant gentleman whose business is war, and not me, who am a churchman, and who am constantly turned aside for my real vocation to look after matters for which I have no aptitude. You would be the happier for it at home, sire, and I do not doubt you would be the greater for it abroad. Monsieur le Duc, said the king, I understand you. Be satisfied. All who are named in that letter shall be punished as they deserve, even the queen herself. What do you say, sire? God forbid that the queen should suffer the least inconvenience or uneasiness on my account. She has always believed me, sire, to be her enemy, although your majesty can bear witness that I have always taken her part warmly, even against you. If she betrayed your majesty on the side of your honour, it would be quite another thing, and I should be the first to say, No grace, sire, no grace for the guilty. Happily there is nothing of the kind, and your majesty has just acquired a new proof of it. That is true, Monsieur Cardinal, said the king, and you were right, as you always are, but the queen, none the less, deserves all my anger. It is you, sire, who have now incurred hers, and even if she were to be seriously offended, I could well understand it. Your majesty has treated her with a severity. It is thus I will always treat my enemy and yours, duke, however high they may be placed, and whatever peril I may incur in acting severely toward them. The queen is my enemy, but is not yours, sire. On the contrary, she is a devoted, submissive, and irreproachable wife. Allow me, then, sire, to intercede for her with your majesty. Let her humble herself, then, and come to me first. On the contrary, sire, set the example. You have committed the first wrong, since it was you who suspected the queen. What? I make the first advances, said the king. Never. Sire, I entreat you to do so. Besides, in what manner can I make advances first? 
by doing a thing which you know will be agreeable to her. What is that? Give a ball. You know how much the queen loves dancing. I will answer for it. Her resentment will not hold out against such an attention. Monsieur Cardinal, you know that I do not like worldly pleasures. The queen will only be the more grateful to you, as she knows your antipathy for that amusement. Besides, it will be an opportunity for her to wear those beautiful diamonds which you gave her recently on her birthday, and with which she has since had no occasion to adorn herself. We shall see, Monsieur Cardinal, we shall see, said the king, who, in his joy at finding the queen guilty of a crime which he cared little about, and innocent of a fault of which he had great dread, was ready to make up all differences with her. We shall see, but upon my honour you are too indulgent with her. Sire, said the cardinal, leave severity to your ministers. Clemency is a royal virtue. Employ it, and you will find that you derive advantage therein. Thereupon the cardinal, hearing the clock strike eleven, bowed low, asking permission of the king to retire, and supplicating him to come to a good understanding with the queen. Anne of Austria, who in consequence of the seizure of her letter expected reproaches, was much astonished the next day to see the king make some attempts at reconciliation with her. Her first movement was repellent. Her womanly pride and her queenly dignity had both been so cruelly offended that she could not come round at the first advance, but over-persuaded by the advice of her women, she at last had the appearance of beginning to forget. The king took advantage of this favourable moment to tell her that he had the intention of shortly giving a fete. A fete was so rare a thing for poor Anne of Austria that at this announcement, as the cardinal had predicted, the last trace of her resentment disappeared, if not from her heart, at least from her countenance. She asked upon what day this fete would take place, but the king replied that he must consult the cardinal on that head. Indeed, every day the king asked the cardinal when this fete should take place, and every day the cardinal, under some pretext, deferred fixing it. Ten days passed away thus. On the eighth day after the scene we have described, the cardinal received a letter with the London stamp which contained only these lines. I have them, but I am unable to leave London for want of money. Send me five hundred pistoles, and four or five days after I have received them, I shall be in Paris. On the same day, the cardinal received this letter. The king put his customary question to him. Richelieu counted on his fingers, and said to himself, She will arrive, she says, four or five days after having received the money. It will require four or five days for the transmission of the money, four or five days for her to return. That makes ten days. Now, allowing for contrary winds, accidents, and a woman's weakness, there are twelve days. Well, Monsieur le Duc, said the king, have you made your calculations? Yes, sire. Today is the twentieth of September. The aldermen of the city will give a fete on the third of October. That will fall in wonderfully well. You will not appear to have gone out of your way to please the queen. Then the cardinal added, A propos, sire, do not forget to tell Her Majesty the evening before the fete that you should like to see how her diamond studs become her. End of chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 17 Bonacieux at Home it was the second time the cardinal had mentioned these diamond studs to the king. Louis the Thirteenth was struck with this insistence, and began to fancy that this recommendation concealed some mystery. More than once the king had been humiliated by the cardinal, whose police, without having yet attained the perfection of the modern police, were excellent, being better informed than himself even upon what was going on in his own household. He hoped then, in a conversation with Anne of Austria, to obtain some information from that conversation, and afterward to come upon his eminence with some secret which the cardinal either knew or did not know, but which in either case would raise him infinitely in the eyes of his minister. He went then to the queen, and according to custom accosted her with fresh menaces against those who surrounded her. Anne of Austria lowered her head, allowing the torrent to flow on without replying, hoping that it would cease of itself. But this was not what Louis the Thirteenth meant. Louis the Thirteenth wanted a discussion from which some light or other might break, convinced as he was that the cardinal had some afterthought, and was preparing him for one of those terrible surprises which his eminence was so skilful in getting up. He arrived at this end by his persistence in accusation. But, cried Anne of Austria, tired of these vague attacks, sire, you do not tell me all that you have in your heart. What have I done, then? Let me know what crime I have committed. 
"'It is impossible that your majesty can make all this ado about a letter written to my brother.' The king, attacked in a manner so direct, did not know what to answer, and he thought that this was the moment for expressing the desire which he was not going to have made until the evening before the fete. "'Madame,' said he with dignity, "'there will shortly be a ball at the Hotel de Ville. "'I wish, in order to honour our worthy alderman, "'you should appear in ceremonial costume, "'and, above all, ornamented with the diamond studs "'which I gave you on your birthday. "'That is my answer.' "'The answer was terrible. "'Anne of Austria believed that Louis the Thirteenth knew all, "'and that the cardinal had persuaded him "'to employ this long dissimulation of seven or eight days, "'which likewise was characteristic.' She became excessively pale, leaned her beautiful hand upon a console, which hand appeared then like one of wax, and looking at the king with terror in her eyes, she was unable to reply by a single syllable. "'You hear, madame,' said the king, who enjoyed the embarrassment to its full extent, but without guessing the cause. "'You hear, madame?' "'Yes, sire, I hear,' stammered the queen. "'You will appear at this ball?' "'Yes.' "'With those studs?' "'Yes.' The queen's paleness, if possible, increased. The king perceived it, and enjoyed it with that cold cruelty which was one of the worst sides of his character. "'Then that is agreed,' said the king, "'and that is all I had to say to you.' "'But on what day will this ball take place?' asked Anne of Austria. Louis the Thirteenth felt instinctively that he ought not to reply to this question, the queen having put it in an almost dying voice." "'Oh, very shortly, madame,' said he, "'but I do not precisely recollect the date of the day. "'I will ask the cardinal.' "'It was the cardinal, then, who informed you of this fete?' "'Yes, madame,' replied the astonished king. "'But why do you ask that?' "'It was he who told you to invite me to appear with these studs?' "'That is to say, madame, it was he, sire, it was he. "'Well, and what does it signify whether it was he or I? "'Is there any crime in this request?' "'No, sire.' "'Then you will appear?' "'Yes, sire.' "'That is well,' said the king, retiring. "'That is well. I count upon it.' The queen made a curtsy, less from etiquette than because her knees were sinking under her. The king went away enchanted. "'I am lost,' murmured the queen. "'Lost, for the cardinal knows all, and it is he who urges on the king, who as yet knows nothing, but will soon know everything. I am lost. My God, my God!' She knelt upon a cushion and prayed, with her head buried between her palpitating arms. In fact, her position was terrible. Buckingham had returned to London. Madame Chevreau was at Tours. More closely watched than ever, the Queen felt certain, without knowing how to tell which, that one of her women had betrayed her. Laporte could not leave the Louvre. She had not a soul in the world in whom she could confide. Thus, while contemplating the misfortune which threatened her, and the abandonment in which she was left, she broke out into sobs and tears. "'Can I be of service to your majesty?' said all at once, a voice full of sweetness and pity. The queen turned sharply round, for there could be no deception in the expression of that voice. It was a friend who spoke thus. In fact, at one of the doors which opened into the queen's apartment appeared the pretty Madame Bonacieux. She had been engaged in arranging the dresses and linen in a closet when the king entered. She could not get out, and had heard all. The queen uttered a piercing cry at finding herself surprised, for in her trouble, for in her trouble, she did not at first recognize the young woman who had been given to her by Laporte. "'Oh, fear nothing, madame,' said the young woman, clasping her hands and weeping herself at the queen's sorrows. "'I am your majesty's body and soul, and however far I may be from you, however inferior may be my position, I believe I have discovered a means of extricating your majesty from your trouble.' "'You! Oh, heavens, you!' cried the queen. "'But look me in the face. I am betrayed on all sides. Can I trust in you?' "'Oh, madame!' cried the young woman, falling on her knees. "'Upon my soul I am ready to die for your majesty.' This expression sprang from the very bottom of the heart, and like the first there was no mistaking it. "'Yes,' continued madame Bonacieux, "'there are traitors here, but by the holy name of the Virgin I swear that no one is more devoted to your majesty than I am. Those studs which the king speaks of, you gave them to the Duke of Buckingham, did you not? Those studs were enclosed in a little rosewood box which he held under his arm. Am I deceived? Is it not so, madame? Oh, my God! murmured the queen, whose teeth chattered with fright. Well, those studs, continued madame Bonacieux, we must have them back again. Without a doubt it is necessary, cried the queen. 
But how am I to act? How can it be effected? Someone must be sent to the Duke. But who? In whom can I trust? Place confidence in me, madame. Do me that honour, my queen, and I will find a messenger. But I must write. Oh, yes, that is indispensable. Two words from the hand of your majesty, and your private seal. But those two words would bring out my condemnation, divorce, exile. Yes, if they fell into infamous hands. But I will answer for these two words being delivered to their address. I must then place my life, my honour, my reputation in your hands? Yes, madame, you must, and I will save them all. But how? Tell me at least the means. My husband had been at liberty these two or three days. I have not yet had time to see him again. He is a worthy, honest man, who entertains neither love nor hatred for anybody. He will do anything I wish. He will set out upon receiving an order from me, without knowing what he carries, and he will carry your majesty's letter, without even knowing it is from your majesty, to the address which is on it. The queen took the two hands of the young woman with a burst of emotion, gazed at her, as if to read her very heart, and seeing nothing but sincerity in the beautiful eyes, embraced her tenderly. Do that, cried she, and you will have saved my honour, you will have saved my life. Do not exaggerate the service I have the happiness to render your majesty. I have nothing to save for your majesty. You are only the victim of perfidious plots. That is true, that is true, my child, said the queen. You are right. Give me then that letter, madame. Time presses. The queen ran to a little table, on which were ink, paper, and pens. She wrote two lines, sealed the letter with her private seal, and gave it to Madame Bonacieux. And now, said the queen, we are forgetting one very necessary thing. What is that, madame? Money. Madame Bonacieux blushed. That is true, said she, and I will confess to your majesty that my husband— Your husband has none. Is that what you would say? He has some, but he is very avaricious. That is his fault. Nevertheless, let not your majesty be uneasy. We will find means. And I have none either, said the queen. Those who have read the memoirs of Madame de Montville will not be astonished at this reply. But wait a minute. Anne of Austria ran to her jewel case. Here, said she, here is a ring of great value, as I have been assured. It came from my brother, the King of Spain. It is mine, and I am at liberty to dispose of it. Take this ring, raise money with it, and let your husband set out. In an hour you shall be obeyed. You see the address, said the queen, speaking so low that Madame Bonacieux could hardly hear what she said. To my lord Duke of Buckingham, London. The letter shall be given to himself. Generous girl, cried Anne of Austria. Madame Bonacieux kissed the hands of the queen, concealed the paper in the bosom of her dress, and disappeared with the lightness of a bird. Ten minutes afterward she was at home. As she told the queen, she had not seen her husband since his liberation. She was ignorant of the change that had taken place in him with respect to the cardinal, a change which had since been strengthened by two or three visits from the Comte de Rochefort, who had become the best friend of Bonacieux, and had persuaded him, without much trouble, was putting his house in order, the furniture of which he had found mostly broken, and his closets nearly empty, justice not being one of the three things which King Solomon names as leaving no trace of their passage. As to the servant, she had run away at the moment of her master's arrest. Terror had had such an effect on the poor girl, that she had never ceased walking from Paris, till she reached Burgundy, her native place. The worthy mercer had, immediately upon re-entering his house, informed his wife of his happy return, and his wife had replied by congratulating him, and telling him that the first moment she could steal from her duties should be devoted to paying him a visit. This first moment had been delayed five days, which, under any other circumstances, might have appeared rather long to M. Bonacieux. But he had, in the visit he had made to the cardinal, and in the visits Rochefort had made him, ample subjects for reflection, and, as everybody knows, nothing makes time pass more quickly than reflection. This was the more so, because Bonacieux's reflections were all rose-coloured. Rochefort called him his friend, his dear Bonacieux, and never ceased telling him that the cardinal had a great respect for him. The mercer fancied himself already on the high road to honours and fortune. On her side, Madame Bonacieux had also reflected, but it must be admitted, on something widely different from ambition. In spite of herself, her thoughts constantly reverted to that handsome young man who was so brave, and appeared to be so much in love. Married at eighteen to Monsieur Bonacieux, having always lived among her husband's friends, 
people little capable of inspiring any sentiment whatever in a young woman whose heart was above her position, Madame Bonacieux had remained insensible to vulgar seductions. But at this period the title of gentleman had great influence with the citizen class, and D'Artagnan was a gentleman. Besides, he wore the uniform of the guards, which next to the musketeers was most admired by the ladies. He was, we repeat, handsome, young, and bold. He spoke of love like a man who did love, and was anxious to be loved in return. There was certainly enough in all this to turn a head only twenty-three years old, and Madame Bonacieux had just attained that happy period of life. The couple, then, although they had not seen each other for eight days, and during that time serious events had taken place in which both were concerned, accosted each other with a degree of preoccupation. Nevertheless, Bonacieux manifested real joy, and advanced toward his wife with open arms. Madame Bonacieux presented her cheek to him. "'Let us talk a little,' said she. "'How?' said Bonacieux, astonished. "'Yes, I have something of the highest importance to tell you.' "'True,' said he, "'and I have some questions sufficiently serious to put to you. "'Describe to me your abduction, I pray you.' "'Oh, that's of no consequence just now,' said Madame Bonacieux. "'And what does it concern, then, my captivity?' "'I heard of it the day it happened. "'But as you were not guilty of any crime, "'as you were not guilty of any intrigue, "'as you, in short, knew nothing that could compromise yourself or anybody else, "'I attached no more importance to that event than it merited.' "'You speak very much at your ease, madame,' said Bonacieux, hurt at the little interest his wife showed in him. "'Do you know that I was plunged during a day and a night in a dungeon of the Bastille? "'Oh, a day and a night soon pass away. "'Let us return to the object that brings me here. "'What, that which brings you home to me? "'Is it not the desire of seeing a husband again from whom you have been separated for a week?' "'asked the mercer, piqued to the quick. "'Yes, that first, and other things afterward.' speak. It is a thing of the highest interest, and upon which our future fortune perhaps depends. The complexion of our fortune has changed very much since I saw you, Madame Bonacieux, and I should not be astonished if in the course of a few months it were to excite the envy of many folks. Yes, particularly if you follow the instructions I am about to give you. Me? Yes, you. There is good and holy action to be performed, Monsieur, and much money to be gained at the same time. Madame Bonacieux knew that in talking of money to her husband she took him on his weak side. But a man, were he even a mercer, when he had talked for ten minutes with Cardinal Richelieu, is no longer the same man. "'Much money to be gained?' said Bonacieux, protruding his lip. "'Yes, much.' "'About how much?' "'A thousand pistoles, perhaps.' "'What you demand of me is serious, then?' "'It is indeed.' "'What must be done?' You must go away immediately. I will give you a paper which you must not part with on any account, and which you will deliver into the proper hands. And whither am I to go? To London. I go to London? You jest. I have no business in London. But others wish that you should go there. Who are these others? I warn you that I will never again work in the dark, and that I will know not only to what I expose myself, but also for whom I expose myself. An illustrious person sends you, an illustrious person who awaits you. The recompense will exceed your expectations. That is all I promise you. More intrigues, nothing but intrigues. Thank you, madame, I am aware of them now. Monsieur Cardinal has enlightened me on that head. The Cardinal? cried Madame Bonacieux. Have you seen the Cardinal? He sent for me, answered the mercer proudly. And you responded to his bidding, you imprudent man. Well, I can't say I had much choice of going or not going, for I was taken to him between two guards. It is true also that as I did not then know his eminence, if I had been able to dispense with the visit, I should have been enchanted. He ill-treated you, then. He threatened you. He gave me his hand and called me his friend. His friend! Do you hear that, madame? I am the friend of the great cardinal. Of the great cardinal! Perhaps you would contest his right to that title, madame? I would contest nothing, but I tell you that the favour of a minister is ephemeral, and that a man must be mad to attach himself to a minister. There are powers above his which do not depend on a man or the issue of an event. It is to these powers we should rally. I am sorry for it, madame, but I acknowledge not her power, but that of the great man whom I have the honour to serve. You serve the cardinal? Yes, madame, and as his servant, 
I will not allow you to be concerned in plots against the safety of the state, or to serve the intrigues of a woman who is not French, and who has a Spanish heart. Fortunately, we have the great cardinal. His vigilant eye watches over and penetrates to the bottom of the heart. Bonacieux was repeating, word for word, a sentence which he had heard from the Comte de Rochefort. But the poor wife, who had reckoned on her husband, and in that hope had answered for him to the queen, did not tremble the less, both at the danger into which she had nearly cast herself, and at the helpless state to which she was reduced. Nevertheless, knowing the weakness of her husband, and more particularly his cupidity, she did not despair of bringing him round to her purpose. "'Ah, you are a cardinalist, then, monsieur, are you?' cried she. "'And you serve the party of those who maltreat your wife and insult your queen?' "'Private interests are nothing before the interests of all. "'I am for those who save the state,' said Bonacieux emphatically. "'And what do you know about the state you talk of?' said Madame Bonacieux, shrugging her shoulders. "'Be satisfied with being a plain, straightforward citizen, "'and turn to that side which offers the most advantages.' "'Eh!' said Bonacieux, slapping a plump round bag which returned a sound of money. "'What do you think of this, Madame Preacher?' "'Whence comes that money?' "'You do not guess?' from the cardinal from him and from my friend the comte de rochefort the comte de rochefort why it was he who carried me off that may be madame and you receive silver from that man have you not said that the abduction was entirely political yes but that abduction had for its object the betrayal of my mistress to draw from me by torture confessions that might compromise the honour and perhaps the life of my august mistress Madame, replied Bonacieux, your august mistress is a perfidious Spaniard, and what the cardinal does is well done. Monsieur, said the young woman, I know you to be cowardly, avaricious, and foolish, but until now I never believed you infamous. Madame, said Bonacieux, who had never seen his wife in a passion, and who recoiled before this conjugal anger, Madame, what do you say? I say you are a miserable creature, continued Madame Bonacieux who saw she was regaining some little influence over her husband. You meddle with politics, do you? And still more with cardinalist politics. You sell yourself body and soul to the demon, the devil, for money. No, to the cardinal. It's the same thing, cried the young woman. Who calls Richelieu calls Satan. Hold your tongue, hold your tongue, madame. You may be overheard. You are right. I should be ashamed for any one to know your baseness. But what do you require of me, then? Let us see. I have told you. You must depart instantly, monsieur. You must accomplish loyally the commission with which I deign to charge you, and on that condition I pardon everything. I forget everything, and what is more, and she held out her hand to him, I restore my love. Bonacieux was cowardly and avaricious, but he loved his wife. He was softened. A man of fifty cannot long bear malice with a woman of twenty-three. Madame Bonacieux saw that he hesitated. Come, have you decided? said she. But, my dear love, reflect a very little upon what you require of me. London is far from Paris, very far, and perhaps the commission with which you charge me is not without dangers. What matters it if you avoid them? Hold, Madame Bonacieux, said the mercer, hold. I positively refuse. Intrigues terrify me. I have seen the Bastille. My, that's a frightful place, the Bastille. Only to think of it makes my flesh crawl. They threatened me with torture. Do you know what torture is? Wooden points that they stick in between your legs till your bones stick out. No, positively, I will not go. And, Morbleu, why do you not go yourself? For, in truth, I think I have been hitherto deceived in you. I really believe you are a man, and a violent one, too. And you, you are a woman, a miserable woman, stupid and brutal. You are afraid, are you? Well, if you do not go this very instant, I will have you arrested by the Queen's orders, and I will have you placed in the Bastille, which you dread so much. Bonacieux fell into a profound reflection. He weighed the two angers in his brain, that of the Cardinal and that of the Queen. That of the Cardinal predominated enormously. Have me arrested on the part of the Queen, said he, and I, I will appeal to his eminence. At once Madame Bonacieux saw she had gone too far, and she was terrified at having communicated so much. She for a moment contemplated with fright that stupid countenance, impressed with the invincible resolution of a fool that is overcome by fear. "'Well, so be it,' said she. "'Perhaps, when all is considered, you are right. 
in the long run, a man knows more about politics than a woman, particularly such as, like you, Monsieur Bonacieux, have conversed with the cardinal. And yet it is very hard, added she, that a man upon whose affection I thought I might depend treats me thus unkindly, and will not comply with any of my fancies. That is because your fancies go too far, replied the triumphant Bonacieux, and I mistrust them. Well, I will give it up, then, said the young woman, sighing. It is well as it is. Say no more about it. At least you should tell me what I should have to do in London, replied Bonacieux, who remembered, a little too late, that Rochefort had desired him to endeavour to obtain his wife's secrets. It is of no use for you to know anything about it, said the young woman, whom an instinctive mistrust now impelled to draw back. It was about one of those purchases that interest women, a purchase by which much might have been gained. But the more the young woman excused herself, the more important Bonacieux thought the secret which she declined to confide in him. He resolved then to hasten immediately to the residence of the Comte de Rochefort, and tell him that the Queen was seeking for a messenger to send to London. "'Pardon me for quitting you, my dear Madame Bonacieux,' said he. "'But not knowing you would come to see me, I had made an engagement with a friend. I shall return, and if you will wait only a few minutes for me, as soon as I have concluded my business with that friend, as it is growing late, I will come back and reconduct you to the Louvre.' "'Thank you, monsieur. You are not brave enough to be of any use to me, whatever,' replied Madame Bonacieux. "'I shall return very safely to the Louvre all alone.' "'As you please, Madame Bonacieux,' said the ex-mercer. "'Shall I see you again soon?' "'Next week I hope my duties will afford me a little liberty, and I will take advantage of it to come and put things in order here, as they must necessarily be much deranged.' "'Very well. I shall expect you. You are not angry with me?' not the least in the world. Till then. Till then. Bonacieux kissed his wife's hand, and set off at a quick pace. Well, said Madame Bonacieux, when her husband had shut the street door and she found herself alone, that imbecile lacked but one thing to become a cardinalist, and I, who have answered for him to the Queen, I, who have promised my poor mistress, ah, my God, she will take me for one of those wretches with whom the palace swarms, and who are placed about as her spies. Monsieur Bonacieux, I never did love you much, but now it is worse than ever. I hate you, and on my word you shall pay for this. At the moment she spoke these words, a rap on the ceiling made her raise her head, and a voice which reached her through the ceiling cried, Dear Madame Bonacieux, open for me the little door on the alley, and I will come down to you. End of chapter 17 This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 18. Lover and Husband. Ah, madame, said D'Artagnan, entering by the door which the young woman opened for him. Allow me to tell you that you have a bad sort of husband. You have, then, overheard our conversation? asked Madame Bonacieux, eagerly and looking at D'Artagnan with disquiet. The whole. But how, my God? By a mode of proceeding known to myself, and by which I likewise overheard the more animated conversation which he had with the Cardinal's police. And what did you understand by what we said? A thousand things. In the first place, that, unfortunately, your husband is a simpleton and a fool. In the next place, you are in trouble, of which I am very glad, as it gives me an opportunity of placing myself at your service, and God knows I am ready to throw myself into the fire for you. Finally, that the Queen wants a brave, intelligent, devoted man to take a journey to London for her. I have at least two of the three qualities you stand in need of, and here I am. Madame Bonacieux made no reply, but her heart beat with joy and secret hope shone in her eyes. "'And what guarantee will you give me?' asked she, "'if I consent to confide this message to you.' "'My love for you. Speak, command. What is to be done?' "'My God, my God,' murmured the young woman, "'ought I to confide such a secret to you, monsieur? You are almost a boy.' 
I see that you require someone to answer for me. I admit that would reassure me greatly. Do you know Athos? No. Porthos? No. Aramis? No. Who are these gentlemen? Three of the king's musketeers. Do you know Monsieur de Treville, their captain? Oh, yes, him. I know him. Not personally, but from having heard the queen speak of him more than once as a brave and loyal gentleman. You do not fear lest he should betray you to the cardinal? Oh, no, certainly not. Well, reveal your secret to him, and ask him whether, however important, however valuable, however terrible it may be, you may not confide it to me. But the secret is not mine, and I cannot reveal it in this manner. You were about to confide it to Monsieur Bonacieux, said D'Artagnan with chagrin. As one confides a letter to the hollow of a tree, to the wing of a pigeon, to the collar of a dog. And yet me, you see plainly that I love you. You say so. I am an honorable man. You say so. I am a gallant fellow. I believe it. I am brave. Oh, I am sure of that. Then put me to the proof. Madame Bonacieux, restrained for a minute by a last hesitation, but there was such an ardor in his eyes, such persuasion in his voice, that she felt herself constrained to confide in him. Besides, she found herself in circumstances where everything must be risked for the sake of everything. The queen might be as much injured by too much reticence as by too much confidence, and, let us admit it, the involuntary sentiment which she felt for her young protector decided her to speak. Listen, said she, I yield to your protestations, I yield to your assurances, but I swear to you, before God who hears us, that if you betray me, and my enemies pardon me, I will kill myself while accusing you of my death. And I, I swear to you before God, madame, said D'Artagnan, that if I am taken while accomplishing the orders you give me, I will die sooner than do anything that may compromise any one. Then the young woman confided in him the terrible secret of which chance had already communicated to him a part in front of the Samaritaine. This was their mutual declaration of love. D'Artagnan was radiant with joy and pride. This secret which he possessed, this woman whom he loved, confidence and love made him a giant. I go, said he, I go at once. How you will go, said Madame Bonacieux, and your regiment, your captain. By my soul, you had made me forget all that, dear Constance. Yes, you are right, a furlough is needful. Still another obstacle, murmured Madame Bonacieux, sorrowfully. As to that, cried D'Artagnan, after a moment of reflection, I shall surmount it, be assured. How so? I will go this very evening to Treville, whom I will request to ask this favour for me, of his brother-in-law, Monsieur de Cessard. But another thing. What? asked D'Artagnan, seeing that Madame Bonacieux hesitated to continue. You have, perhaps, no money? Perhaps is too much, said D'Artagnan, smiling. Then, replied Madame Bonacieux, opening a cupboard and taking from it the very bag which a half-hour before her husband had caressed so affectionately. Take this bag. The cardinals! cried D'Artagnan, breaking into a loud laugh. He having heard, as may be remembered, thanks to the broken boards, every syllable of the conversation between the mercer and his wife. The cardinals! replied Madame Bonacieux. You see, it makes a very respectable appearance. Pardieu, cried D'Artagnan, it will be a double amusing affair to save the queen with the cardinal's money. You are an amiable and charming young man, said Madame Bonacieux. Be assured you will not find Her Majesty ungrateful. Oh, I am already grandly recompensed, cried D'Artagnan. I love you. You permit me to tell you that I do. That is already more happiness than I dared to hope. Silence, said Madame Bonacieux, starting. 
What? Someone is talking in the street. It is the voice of, Of my husband. Yes, I recognize it. D'Artagnan ran to the door and pushed the bolt. He shall not come in before I am gone, said he, and when I am gone you can open to him. But I ought to be gone too, and the disappearance of his money. How am I to justify it if I am here? You are right. We must go out. Go out? How? He will see us if we go out. Then you must come up into my room. Ah, said Madame Bonacieux, you speak that in a tone that frightens me. Madame Bonacieux pronounced these words with tears in her eyes. D'Artagnan saw those tears, and, much disturbed, softened, he threw himself at her feet. With me you will be as safe as in a temple. I give you my word of a gentleman. Let us go, said she. I place full confidence in you, my friend. D'Artagnan drew back the bolt with precaution, and both light as shadows glided through the interior door into the passage, ascended the stairs as quietly as possible, and entered D'Artagnan's chambers. Once there, for greater security, the young man barricaded the door. They both approached the window, and through a slit in the shutter they saw Bonacieux talking with a man in a cloak. At sight of this man, D'Artagnan started, and half drawing his sword, sprang toward the door. It was the man of Mion. "'What are you going to do?' cried Madame Bonacieux. "'He will ruin us all.' "'But I have sworn to kill that man,' said D'Artagnan. "'Your life is devoted from this moment, and does not belong to you. In the name of the Queen, I forbid you to throw yourself into any peril which is foreign to that of your journey.' "'And do you command nothing in your own name?' "'In my name,' said Madame Bonacieux, with great emotion, "'in my name I beg you. "'But listen, they appear to be speaking of me.' D'Artagnan drew near the window and lent his ear. Monsieur Bonacieux had opened his door, and, seeing the apartment, had returned to the man in the cloak, whom he had left alone for an instant. "'She is gone,' said he. She must have returned to the Louvre. You are sure, replied the stranger, that she did not suspect the intentions with which you went out? No, replied Bonacieux, with a self-sufficient air. She is too superficial a woman. Is the young guardsman at home? I do not think he is, as you see his shutter is closed, and you can see no light shine through the chinks of the shutters. All the same, it is well to be certain— how so? By knocking at his door. Go. I will ask his servant. Bonacieux re-entered the house, passed through the same door that had afforded a passage for the two fugitives, went up to D'Artagnan's door and knocked. No one answered. Porthos, in order to make a greater display, had that evening borrowed Planchet. As to D'Artagnan, he took care not to give the least sign of existence. The moment the hand of Bonacieux sounded on the door, the two young people felt their hearts bound within them. "'There is nobody within,' said Bonacieux. "'Never mind. Let us return to your apartment. We shall be safer there than in the doorway.' "'Ah, oh, my God!' whispered Madame Bonacieux. "'We shall hear no more.' "'On the contrary,' said D'Artagnan, "'we shall hear better.' D'Artagnan raised the three or four boards which made his chamber another ear of Dionysius, spread a carpet on the floor, went upon his knees and made a sign to Madame Bonacieux to stoop as he did toward the opening. "'You are sure there is nobody there?' said the stranger. "'I will answer for it,' said Bonacieux. "'And you think that your wife has returned to the Louvre? "'Without speaking to anyone but yourself? "'I am sure of it.' "'That is an important point, you do understand. "'Then the news I brought you is of value? "'The greatest, my dear Bonacieux. "'I don't conceal this from you. "'Then the cardinal will be pleased with me? "'I have no doubt of it. "'The great cardinal. "'Are you sure, in her conversation with you, "'that your wife mentioned no names? "'I think not. "'She did not name Madame de Chevreuse, the Duke of Buckingham, 
or Madame de Verney? No, she only told me she wished to send me to London to serve the interests of an illustrious personage. The traitor, murmured Madame Bonacieux. Silence, said D'Artagnan, taking her hand, which, without thinking of it, she abandoned to him. Never mind, continued the man in the cloak. You were a fool not to have pretended to accept the mission. You would then be in present possession of the letter. The state which is now threatened would be safe, and you, and I, well, you, the cardinal would have given you letters of nobility. Did he tell you so? Yes, I know that he meant to afford you that agreeable surprise. Be satisfied, replied Bonacieux. My wife adores me, and there is yet time. The ninny, murmured Madame Bonacieux. Silence, said D'Artagnan, pressing her hand more closely. How is there still time? asked the man in the cloak. I go to the Louvre. I ask for Madame Bonacieux. I say that I have reflected. I renew the affair. I obtain the letter, and I run directly to the cardinal. Well, go quickly. I will return soon to learn the result of your trip. The stranger went out. Infamous, said Madame Bonacieux, addressing this epithet to her husband. Silence, said D'Artagnan, pressing her hand still more warmly. A terrible howling interrupted these reflections of D'Artagnan and Madame Bonacieux. It was her husband, who had discovered the disappearance of the money-bag, and was crying, Thieves! Oh, my God! cried Madame Bonacieux. He will rouse the whole quarter. Bonacieux called a long time, but as such cries, on account of their frequency, brought nobody to the Rue de Fossoyeur, and as lately the mercer's house had a bad name, finding that nobody came, he went out, continuing to call, his voice being heard fainter and fainter as he went in the direction of the Rue du Bac. Now he is gone, it is your turn to get out, said Madame Bonacieux. Courage, my friend, but above all, prudence, and think what you owe to the Queen. To her and to you, cried D'Artagnan. Be satisfied, beautiful Constance. I shall become worthy of her gratitude, but shall I likewise return worthy of your love? The young woman only replied by the beautiful glow which mounted to her cheeks. A few seconds afterward, D'Artagnan also went out, enveloped in a large cloak, which ill-concealed the sheath of a long sword. Madame Bonacieux followed him with her eyes, with that long, fond look with which she had turned the angle of the street. She fell on her knees, and clasping her hands, "'Oh, my God!' cried she. "'Protect the Queen! Protect me!' End of chapter 18「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 19 Plan of Campaign D'Artagnan went straight to Monsieur de Trevines. He had reflected that in a few minutes the cardinal would be warned by this cursed stranger, who appeared to be his agent, and he judged with reason he had not a moment to lose. The heart of the young man overflowed with joy. An opportunity presented itself to him in which there would be, at the same time, glory to be acquired and money to be gained, and as a far higher encouragement it brought him into close intimacy with a woman he adored. This chance did, then, for him, at once more than he would have dared to ask of Providence. M. de Treville was in his salon with his habitual court of gentlemen. D'Artagnan, who was known as a familiar of the house, went straight to his office, and sent word that he wished to see him on something of importance. D'Artagnan had been there scarcely five minutes when M. de Treville entered. At the first glance, and by the joy which was painted on his countenance, the worthy captain plainly perceived that something new was afoot. All the way along D'Artagnan had been consulting with himself whether he should place confidence in M. de Treville, or whether he should only ask him to give him carte blanche for some secret affair. But M. de Treville had always been so thoroughly his friend, had always been so devoted to the king and queen, and hated the cardinal so cordially, that the young man resolved to tell him everything. 
"'Did you ask for me, my good friend?' said Monsieur de Treville. "'Yes, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, lowering his voice. "'And you will pardon me, I hope, for having disturbed you when you know the importance of my business. "'Speak, then. I am all attention.' "'It concerns nothing less,' said D'Artagnan, "'than the honour, perhaps the life, of the Queen.' "'What did you say?' asked Monsieur de Treville glancing round to see if they were surely alone, and then fixing his questioning look upon D'Artagnan. "'I say, monsieur, that chance has rendered me master of a secret, which you will guard, I hope, young man, with your life, but which I must impart to you, monsieur, for you alone can assist me in the mission I have just received from Her Majesty.' "'Is the secret your own?' "'No, monsieur, it is Her Majesty's. Are you authorized by Her Majesty to communicate it to me?' "'No, monsieur.' for on the contrary I am desired to preserve the profoundest mystery. Why, then, are you about to betray it to me? Because, as I said, without you I can do nothing, and I am afraid you will refuse me the favour I come to ask if you do not know to what end I ask it. Keep your secret, young man, and tell me what you wish. I wish you to obtain for me from M. de Cesar leave of absence for fifteen days. When? This very night. You leave Paris? I am going on a mission. "'May you tell me whither?' "'To London. "'Has any one an interest in preventing your arrival there? "'The Cardinal, I believe, would give the world to prevent my success. "'And you are going alone?' "'I am going alone. "'In that case you will not get beyond Bondy. "'I tell you so by the faith of de Treville. "'How so? "'You will be assassinated. "'And I shall die in the performance of my duty. "'But your mission will not be accomplished.' "'That is true,' replied D'Artagnan. Believe me, continued Treville, in enterprises of this kind, in order that one may arrive, four must set out. Ah, you are right, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, but you know Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, and you know if I can dispose of them, without confiding to them the secret which I am not willing to know. We are sworn once for all to implicit confidence and devotedness against all proof. Besides, you can tell them that you have full confidence in me, and they will not be more incredulous than you. I can send to them leave of absence for fifteen days, that is all, to Athos, whose wound still makes him suffer, to go to the waters of Forget, to Porthos and Aramis to accompany their friend, whom they are not willing to abandon in such a painful condition. Sending their leave of absence will be proof enough that I authorize their journey. Thanks, monsieur, you are a hundred times too good. Be gone, then. Find them instantly, and let all be done to-night. But first, write your request to Dessessart. Perhaps you had a spy at your heels, and your visit, if it should ever be known to the cardinal, will thus seem legitimate. D'Artagnan drew up his request, and M. de Treville, on receiving it, assured him that by two o'clock in the morning the four leaves of absence should be at the respective domiciles of the travellers. "'Have the goodness to send mine to Athos's residence. I should dread some disagreeable encounter if I were to go home. Be easy. Adieu, and a prosperous voyage. A propos said M. de Treville, calling him back. D'Artagnan returned. "'Have you any money?' D'Artagnan tapped the bag he had in his pocket. "'Enough?' asked M. de Treville. Three hundred pistoles.' "'Oh, plenty. That would carry you to the end of the world. Be gone, then.' D'Artagnan saluted M. de Treville, who held out his hand to him. D'Artagnan pressed it with a respect mixed with gratitude. Since his first arrival at Paris, he had had constant occasion to honour this excellent man, whom he had always found worthy, loyal, and great. His first visit was to Aramis, at whose residence he had not been since the famous evening on which he had followed Madame Bonacieux. Still further, he had seldom seen the young musketeer, but every time he had seen him he had remarked a deep sadness imprinted on his countenance. This evening especially, Aramis was melancholy and thoughtful. D'Artagnan asked him some questions about this prolonged melancholy. Aramis pleaded as his excuse a commentary upon the eighteenth chapter of St. Augustine, which he was forced to write in Latin for the following week, and which preoccupied him a good deal. After the two friends had been chatting a few moments, a servant from Monsieur de Treville entered, bringing a sealed packet. "'What is that?' asked Aramis. "'The leave of absence Monsieur has asked for,' replied the lackey. "'For me?' I have asked for no leave of absence. Hold your tongue and take it, said D'Artagnan. And you, my friend, there is a demi-pistole for your trouble. You will tell Monsieur de Treville that Monsieur Aramis is very much obliged to him. Go. 
the lackey bowed to the ground and departed. "'What does all this mean?' asked Aramis. "'Pack up all you want for a journey of a fortnight, and follow me.' "'But I cannot leave Paris just now without knowing—' Aramis stopped. "'What has become of her, I suppose you mean?' continued D'Artagnan. "'Become of whom?' replied Aramis. "'The woman who was here, the woman with the embroidered handkerchief. "'Who told you there was a woman here?' replied Aramis, becoming pale as death. "'I saw her. "'And you know who she is?' "'I believe I can guess, at least.' "'Listen,' said Aramis, "'since you appear to know so many things, "'can you tell me what has become of that woman?' "'I presume that she has returned to Tours.' "'To Tours?' "'Yes, that may be. "'You evidently know her. "'But why did she return to Tours without telling me anything?' "'Because she was in fear of being arrested. "'Why has she not written to me, then?' "'Because she was afraid of compromising you.' "'D'Artagnan, you restore me to life,' cried Aramis. "'I fancied myself despised, betrayed. "'I was so delighted to see her again. "'I could not have believed she would risk her liberty for me, "'and yet for what other cause could she have returned to Paris?' "'For the cause which to-day takes us to England.' "'And what is this cause?' "'Oh, you'll know it some day, Aramis. "'But at present I must imitate the discretion of the doctor's niece.' Aramis smiled, as he remembered the tale he had told his friends on a certain evening. "'Well, then, since she has left Paris, and you are sure of it, D'Artagnan, nothing prevents me, and I am ready to follow you. You say we are going to see Athos now, and if you will come thither, I beg you to make haste, for we have lost much time already. A propos, inform Bazin.' "'Will Bazin go with us?' asked Aramis. "'Perhaps so. At all events, it is best that he should follow us to Athos.' Aramis called Bazin, and after having ordered him to join them at Athos's residence, said, Let us go then, at the same time taking his cloak, sword, and three pistols, opening uselessly two or three drawers to see if he could not find stray coin. When well assured this search was superfluous, he followed D'Artagnan, wondering to himself how this young guardsman should know so well who the lady was to whom he had given hospitality, and that he should know better than himself what had become of her. Only as they went out, Aramis placed his hand upon the arm of D'Artagnan, and looking at him earnestly, "'You have not spoken of this lady,' said he. "'To nobody in the world. Not even to Athos or Porthos. I have not breathed a syllable to them. Good enough.' Tranquil on this important point, Aramis continued his way with D'Artagnan, and both soon arrived at Athos's dwelling. They found him holding his leave of absence in one hand, and Monsieur de Treville's note in the other. "'Can you explain to me what signify this leave of absence and this letter, which I have just received?' said the astonished Athos. "'My dear Athos, I wish, as your health absolutely requires it, that you should rest for a fortnight. Go then and take the waters of Forget, or any that may be more agreeable to you, and recuperate yourself as quickly as possible. Yours affectionate, de Treville.' "'Well, this leave of absence and that letter mean that you must follow me, Athos. "'To the waters of Forget?' there or elsewhere in the king's service either the king's or the queen's are we not their majesty's servants at that moment porthos entered pardieu said he here is a strange thing since when i wonder in the musketeers did they grant men leave of absence without their asking for it since said d'artagnan they have friends who ask it for them aha said porthos it appears there's something fresh here "'Yes, we are going,' said Aramis. "'To what country?' demanded Porthos. "'My faith! I don't know much about it,' said Athos. "'Ask D'Artagnan.' "'To London, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan. "'To London?' cried Porthos. "'And what the devil are we going to do in London?' "'That is what I am not at liberty to tell you, gentlemen. "'You must trust to me.' "'But in order to go to London,' added Porthos, "'money is needed, and I have none.' "'Nor I,' said Aramis. "'Nor I,' said Athos. "'I have,' replied D'Artagnan, pulling out his treasure from his pocket, and placing it on the table. "'There are in this bag three hundred pistoles. Let us each take seventy-five. That is enough to take us to London and back. Besides, make yourselves easy. We shall not all arrive at London.' "'Why so?' "'Because in all probability some one of us will be left on the road. "'Is this, then, a campaign which we are now entering?' one of a most dangerous kind, I give you notice. "'Ah, but if we risk being killed,' said Porthos, 
At least I should like to know what for. You would be all the wiser, said Athos. And yet, said Aramis, I am somewhat of Porthos' opinion. Is the king accustomed to give you such reasons? No. He says to you, jauntily, Gentlemen, there is fighting going on in Gascony or in Flanders. Go and fight. And you go there. Why? You need give yourselves no more uneasiness about this. D'Artagnan is right, said Athos. Here are our three leaves of absence which came from Monsieur de Treville, and here are three hundred pistoles which came from I don't know where. So let us go and get killed where we are told to go. Is life worth the trouble of so many questions? D'Artagnan, I am ready to follow you. And I also, said Porthos. And I also, said Aramis. And indeed I am not sorry to quit Paris. I had need of distraction. Well, you will have distractions enough, gentlemen, be assured, said D'Artagnan. And now when are we to go? asked Athos. Immediately, replied D'Artagnan. We have not a minute to lose. Hello, Grimaud, Planchet, Mousqueton, Bazin, cried the four young men, calling their lackeys. Clean my boots, and fetch the horses from the hotel. Each musketeer was accustomed to leave at the general hotel, as at a barrack, his own horse and that of his lackey. Planchet, Grimaud, Mousqueton, and Bazin set off at full speed. Now let us lay down the plan of campaign, said Porthos. Where do we go first? To Calais, said D'Artagnan. That is the most direct line to London. Well, said Porthos, this is my advice. Speak. Four men travelling together would be suspected. D'Artagnan will give each of us his instructions. I will go by the way of Boulogne to clear the way. Athos will set out two hours after by that of Amiens. Aramis will follow us by that of Noyon. As to D'Artagnan, he will go by what route he thinks is best, in Planchette's clothes, while Planchette will follow us like D'Artagnan, in the uniform of the guards. Gentlemen, said Athos, my opinion is that it is not proper to allow lackeys to have anything to do in such an affair. A secret may by chance be betrayed by gentlemen, but it is almost always sold by lackeys. Porthos' plan appears to me to be impracticable, said D'Artagnan inasmuch as I am myself ignorant of what instructions I can give you. I am the bearer of a letter, that is all. I have not, and I cannot make, three copies of that letter, because it is sealed. We must then, as it appears to me, travel in company. This letter is here, in this pocket, and he pointed to the pocket which contained the letter. If I should be killed, one of you must take it, and continue the route. If he be killed, it will be another's turn, and so on, Provided a single one arrives, that is all that is required. "'Bravo, D'Artagnan! Your opinion is mine,' cried Athos. "'Besides, we must be consistent. I am going to take the waters. You will accompany me. Instead of taking the waters at Forget, I go and take sea-waters. I am free to do so. If any one wishes to stop us, I will show Monsieur de Treville's letter, and you will show your leaves of absence. If we are attacked, we will defend ourselves. If we are tried, we will stoutly maintain that we were only anxious to dip ourselves a certain number of times in the sea. They would have an easy bargain of four isolated men, whereas four men together make a troop. We will arm our four lackeys with pistols and musketoons. If they send an army out against us, we will give battle, and the survivor, as D'Artagnan says, will carry the letter. "'Well said,' cried Aramis. "'You don't often speak, Athos, but when you do speak it is like St. John of the Golden Mouth. I agree to Athos's plan.' And you, Porthos? I agree to it too, said Porthos, if D'Artagnan approves of it. D'Artagnan, being the bearer of the letter, is naturally the head of the enterprise. Let him decide, and we will execute. Well, said D'Artagnan, I decide that we should adopt Athos's plan, and that we set off in half an hour. Agreed, shouted the three musketeers in chorus. Each one, stretching out his hand to the bag, took his seventy-five pistoles, and made his preparations to set out at the time appointed. End of chapter 19 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 20 The Journey At two o'clock in the morning, our four adventurers left Paris by the Barrière Saint-Denis, as long as it was dark, they remained silent. In spite of themselves, they submitted to the influence of obscurity, and apprehended ambushes on every side. With the first rays of day, their tongues were loosened. With the sun, gaiety revived. It was like the eve of a battle. The heart beat, the eyes laughed, 
and they felt that the life they were perhaps going to lose was, after all, a good thing. Besides, the appearance of the caravan was formidable. The black horses of the musketeers, their martial carriage, with the regimental step of these noble companions of the soldier, would have betrayed the most strict incognito. The lackeys followed, armed to the teeth. All went well till they arrived in Chantilly, which they reached about eight o'clock in the morning. They needed breakfast, and alighted at the door of an auberge, recommended by a sign representing St. Martin giving half his cloak to a poor man. They ordered the lackeys not to unsaddle the horses, and to hold themselves in readiness to set off again immediately. They entered the common hall, and placed themselves at table. A gentleman, who had just arrived by the roof of Damatine, was seated at the same table, and was breakfasting. He opened the conversation about rain and fine weather. The travellers replied. He drank to their good health, and the travellers returned his politeness. But at the moment Mousqueton came to announce that the horses were ready, and they were arising from table, the stranger proposed to Porthos to drink the health of the cardinal. Porthos replied that he asked no better if the stranger, in his turn, would drink the health of the king. The stranger cried that he acknowledged no other king but his eminence. Porthos called him drunk, and the stranger drew his sword. "'You have committed a piece of folly,' said Athos, "'but it can't be helped. There is no drawing back. Kill the fellow, and rejoin us just as soon as you can.' All three remounted their horses, and set out at a good pace, while Porthos was promising his adversary to perforate him with all the thrusts known in the fencing-schools. "'There goes one,' cried Athos, at the end of five hundred paces. "'But why did that man attack Porthos rather than any one of us?' "'Because, as Porthos was talking louder than the rest of us, he took him for the chief,' said D'Artagnan. "'I always said that this cadet from Gascony was a well of wisdom,' murmured Athos, and the travellers continued their route. At Beauvais they stopped for two hours, as well to breathe their horses a little as to wait for Porthos. At the end of two hours, as Porthos did not come, not any news of him, they resumed their journey. At a league from Beauvais, where the road was confined between two high banks, they fell in with eight or ten men, who, taking advantage of the road being unpaved in this spot, appeared to be employed in digging holes and filling up the ruts with mud. Aramis, not liking to soil his boots with this artificial mortar, apostrophized them rather sharply. Athos wished to restrain him, but it was too late. The laborers began to jeer the travellers, and by their insolence disturbed the equanimity even of the cool Athos, who urged on his horse against one of them. Then each of these men retreated as far as the ditch, from which each took a concealed musket. The result was that our seven travellers were outnumbered in weapons. Aramis received a ball which passed through his shoulder, and Mousqueton another ball which lodged in the fleshy part which prolongs the lower portion of the loins. Therefore Mousqueton alone fell from his horse, not because he was severely wounded, but not being able to see the wound, he judged it to be more serious than it really was. "'It was an ambuscade,' shouted D'Artagnan. "'Don't waste a charge. Forward!' Aramis, wounded as he was, seized the mane of his horse, which carried him on with the others. Mousqueton's horse rejoined them, and galloped by the side of his companions. "'That will serve us for a relay,' said Athos. "'I would rather have had a hat,' said D'Artagnan. "'Mine was carried away by a ball. "'By my faith, it is very fortunate that the letter was not in it.' "'They'll kill poor Porthos when he comes up,' said Aramis. "'If Porthos were on his legs, he would have rejoined us by this time,' said Athos. "'My opinion is that on the ground the drunken man was not intoxicated.' They continued at their best speed for two hours, although the horses were so fatigued that it was to be feared they would soon refuse service. The travellers had chosen cross-roads, in the hope that they might meet with less interruption, but at Crevecourt Aramis declared that he could proceed no further. In fact, it required all the courage which he concealed beneath his elegant form and polished manners to bear him so far. He grew more pale every minute, and they were obliged to support him on his horse. They lifted him off at the door of a cabaret, left Bazin with him, who, besides, in a skirmish was more embarrassing than useful, and set forward again, in the hope of sleeping at Amiens. Morbleu, said Athos, as they were again in motion, reduced to two masters and Grimaud and Planchet. Morbleu, I won't be their dupe, I will answer for it. I will neither open my mouth nor draw my sword between this and Calais. I swear by— "'Don't waste time in swearing,' said D'Artagnan. "'Let us gallop if our horses will consent.' 
and the travellers buried their rowels in their horses' flanks, who thus vigorously stimulated recovered their energies. They arrived at Amiens at midnight, and alighted at the auberge of the Golden Lily. The host had the appearance of as honest a man as any on earth. He received the travellers with his candlestick in one hand, and his cotton nightcap in the other. He wished to lodge the two travellers each in a charming chamber, but unfortunately these charming chambers were at the opposite extremities of the hotel. D'Artagnan and Athos refused them. The host replied that he had no other worthy of their excellencies, but the travellers declared they would sleep in the common chamber, each on a mattress which might be thrown upon the ground. The host insisted, but the travellers were firm and he was obliged to do as they wished. They had just prepared their beds and barricaded their doors within, when some one knocked at the yard's shutter. They demanded who was there, and recognizing the voices of their lackeys, opened the shutter. It was indeed Planchette and Grimaud. "'Grimaud can take care of the horses,' said Planchette. "'If you are willing, gentlemen, I will sleep across your doorway, and then you will be certain that nobody can reach you.' "'And on what will you sleep?' said D'Artagnan. "'Here is my bed,' replied Planchette producing a bundle of straw. "'Come, then,' said D'Artagnan, "'you are right. Mine host's face does not please me at all. It is too gracious.' "'Nor me either,' said Athos. Planchette mounted by the window, and installed himself across the doorway, while Grimaud went and shut himself up in the stable, undertaking that by five o'clock in the morning he and the four horses should be ready. The night was quiet enough. Toward two o'clock in the morning somebody endeavoured to open the door. But as Planchette awoke in an instant and cried, "'Who goes there?' somebody replied that he was mistaken, and went away. At four o'clock in the morning they heard a terrible riot in the stables. Grimaud had tried to waken the stable-boys, and the stable-boys had beaten him. When they opened the window they saw the poor lad lying senseless, with his head split by a blow with a pitchfork. Planchette went down into the yard, and wished to saddle the horses, but the horses were all used up. Mousqueton's horse, which had travelled for five or six hours without a rider the day before, might have been able to pursue the journey, but by an inconceivable error the veterinary surgeon, who had been sent for, as it appeared, to bleed one of the host's horses, had bled Mousqueton's. This began to be annoying. All these successive accidents were perhaps the result of chance, but they might be the fruits of a plot. Athos and D'Artagnan went out, while Planchette was sent to inquire if there were not three horses for sale in the neighbourhood. At the door stood two horses, fresh, strong, and fully equipped. These would just have suited them. He asked where their masters were, and was informed that they had passed the night in the inn, and were then settling their bill with the host. Athos went down to pay the reckoning, while D'Artagnan and Planchette stood at the street door. The host was in a lower and back room, to which Athos was requested to go. Athos entered without the least mistrust, and took out two pistoles to pay the bill. The host was alone, seated before his desk, one of the drawers of which was partly open. He took the money which Athos offered to him, and after turning and turning it over and over in his hands, suddenly cried out that it was bad, and that he would have him and his companions arrested as forgers. "'You blackguard!' cried Athos, going toward him. "'I'll cut your ears off!' At the same instant, four men, armed to the teeth, entered by side doors, and rushed upon Athos. "'I am taken!' shouted Athos, with all the power of his lungs. "'Go on, D'Artagnan! Spur! Spur!' And he fired two pistols. D'Artagnan and Planchette did not require twice bidding. They unfastened the two horses that were waiting at the door, leaped upon them, buried their spurs in their sides, and set off at full gallop. "'Do you know what has become of Athos?' asked D'Artagnan of Planchette, as they galloped on. "'Ah, oh, monsieur,' said Planchette, I saw one fall at each of his two shots, and he appeared to me, through the glass door, to be fighting with his sword with the others. "'Brave Athos,' murmured D'Artagnan, "'and to think that we are compelled to leave him. Maybe the same fate awaits us two paces hence. Forward, Planchette, forward! You are a brave fellow.' "'As I told you, monsieur,' replied Planchette, "'Picards are found out by being used. Besides, I am here in my own country, and that excites me. And both, with free use of the spur, arrived at Saint-Omer without drawing bit. At Saint-Omer they breathed their horses with the bridles passed under their arms for fear of accident, and ate a morsel from their hands on the stones of the street, after they departed again. At a hundred paces from the gates of Calais, D'Artagnan's horse gave out, and could not be made by any means to get up again, the blood flowing from his eyes and his nose. 
there still remained Planchette's horse, but he stopped short and could not be made to move a step. Fortunately, as we have said, they were within a hundred paces of the city. They left their two nags upon the high road, and ran toward the quay. Planchette called his master's attention to a gentleman who had just arrived with his lackey, and only preceded them by about fifty paces. They made all speed to come up to this gentleman, who appeared to be in great haste. His boots were covered with dust, and he inquired if he could not instantly cross over to England. "'Nothing would be more easy,' said the captain of a vessel ready to set sail. But this morning came an order to let no one leave without express permission from the cardinal. "'I have that permission,' said the gentleman, drawing the paper from his pocket. "'Here it is.' "'Have it examined by the governor of the port,' said the shipmaster, "'and give me the preference. "'Where shall I find the governor?' "'At his country house.' "'And that is situated?' "'At a quarter of a league from the city. "'Look, you may see it from here, "'at the foot of that little hill, that slated roof.' "'Very well,' said the gentleman, and with his lackey he took the road to the governor's country house. D'Artagnan and Planchette followed the gentleman at a distance of five hundred paces. Once outside the city, D'Artagnan overtook the gentleman as he was entering a little wood. "'Monsieur, you appear to be in great haste.' "'No one can be more so, monsieur.' "'I am sorry for that,' said D'Artagnan, "'for as I am in great haste likewise, I wish to beg you to render me a service.' "'What?' to let me sail first. "'That's impossible,' said the gentleman. "'I have travelled sixty leagues in forty hours, and by to-morrow at midday I must be in London. "'I have performed that same distance in forty hours, and by ten o'clock in the morning I must be in London. "'Very sorry, monsieur, but I was here first, and I will not sail second. "'I am sorry, too, monsieur, but I arrived second and must sail first. "'The King's service,' said the gentleman." "'My own service,' said D'Artagnan. "'But this is a needless quarrel you seek with me, as it seems to be.' "'Parbleu! What do you desire it to be?' "'What do you want? Would you like to know?' "'Certainly.' "'Well, then, I wish that order of which you are bearer, seeing that I have not one of my own, and must have one.' "'You jest, I presume?' "'I never jest.' "'Let me pass.' "'You shall not pass.' "'My brave young man, I will blow out your brains. "'Hola, Lupin, my pistols!' "'Planchette,' called out D'Artagnan, "'take care of the lackey. "'I will manage the master.' "'Planchette, emboldened by the first exploit, "'sprang upon Lupin, "'and being strong and vigorous, "'he soon got him on the broad of his back "'and placed his knee upon his breast. "'Go on with your affair, monsieur,' cried Planchette. "'I have finished mine.' "'Seeing this, the gentleman drew his sword "'and sprang upon D'Artagnan.' but he had too strong an adversary. In three seconds D'Artagnan had wounded him three times, exclaiming at each thrust, one for Athos, one for Porthos, and one for Aramis. At the third hit the gentleman fell like a log. D'Artagnan believed him to be dead, or at least insensible, and went toward him for the purpose of taking the order. But the moment he extended his hand to search for it, the wounded man, who had not dropped his sword, plunged the point into D'Artagnan's breast, crying, "'One for you!' "'And one for me, the best for last!' cried D'Artagnan, furious, nailing him to the earth with a fourth thrust through his body. This time the gentleman closed his eyes and fainted. D'Artagnan searched his pockets, and took from one of them the order for the passage. It was in the name of the Comte de Ward. Then, casting a glance on the handsome young man, who was scarcely twenty-five years of age, and whom he was leaving in his gore, deprived of sense and perhaps dead, he gave a sigh for that unaccountable destiny which leads men to destroy each other for the interests of people who are strangers to them, and who often do not even know they exist. But he was soon aroused from those reflections by Lubin, who uttered loud cries and screamed for help with all his might. Planchette grasped him by the throat, and pressed as hard as he could. "'Monsieur,' said he, "'as long as I hold him in this manner he can't cry, I'll be bound, but as soon as I let go he will howl again. I know him for a Norman, and Normans are obstinate. In fact, tightly held as he was, Lubin endeavoured still to cry out. Stay, said D'Artagnan, and taking out his handkerchief, he gagged him. Now, said Planchette, let us bind him to a tree. This being properly done, they drew the Comte de Wards close to his servant, and as night was approaching, and the wounded man and the bound man were at some little distance within the wood, it was evident they were likely to remain there till the next day. 
"'And now,' said D'Artagnan, "'to the governors. "'But you are wounded, it seems,' said Planchet. "'Oh, that's nothing. "'Let us attend to what is more pressing first, "'and then we will attend to my wound. "'Besides, it does not seem very dangerous.' "'And they both set forward as fast as they could "'toward the country-house of the worthy functionary. "'The Comte de Wards was announced, "'and D'Artagnan was introduced. "'You have an order signed by the cardinal?' said the governor. "'Yes, monsieur,' replied D'Artagnan. "'Here it is.' "'Ah, it is quite regular and explicit,' said the governor. "'Most likely,' said D'Artagnan. "'I am one of his most faithful servants.' "'It appears that his eminence is anxious to prevent someone from crossing to England.' "'Yes. A certain D'Artagnan, a Bernays gentleman, who left Paris in company with three of his friends, with the intention of going to London.' "'Do you know him personally?' asked the governor. "'Whom?' "'This D'Artagnan.' "'Perfectly well.' "'Describe him to me, then.' nothing more easy. And D'Artagnan gave, feature for feature, a description of the Comte de Ward. Is he accompanied? Yes, by a lackey named Lubin. We will keep a sharp lookout for them, and if we lay hands on them, his eminence may be assured they will be reconducted to Paris under a good escort. And by doing so, Monsieur the Governor, said D'Artagnan, you will deserve well of the Cardinal. Shall you see him on your return, Monsieur Count? Without a doubt. "'Tell him, I beg you, that I am his humble servant. "'I will not fail.' "'Delighted with this assurance, "'the governor countersigned the passport "'and delivered it to D'Artagnan. "'D'Artagnan lost no time in useless compliments. "'He thanked the governor, bowed, and departed. "'Once outside, he and Planchet set off as fast as they could, "'and by making a long detour, "'avoided the wood and re-entered the city by another gate. "'The vessel was quite ready to sail, "'and the captain was waiting on the wharf.' Well, said he, on perceiving D'Artagnan, here is my pass countersigned, said the latter. And that other gentleman? He will not go to-day, said D'Artagnan, but here, I'll pay you for us two. In that case, let us go, said the shipmaster. Let us go, repeated D'Artagnan. He leaped with Planchette into the boat, and five minutes after they were on board. It was time, for they had scarcely sailed half a league when D'Artagnan saw a flash and heard a detonation. It was the cannon which announced the closing of the port. He had now leisure to look to his wound. Fortunately, as D'Artagnan had thought, it was not dangerous. The point of the sword had touched a rib, and glanced along the bone. Still further, his shirt had stuck to the wound, and he had lost only a few drops of blood. D'Artagnan was worn out with fatigue. A mattress was laid upon the deck for him. He threw himself upon it, and fell asleep. On the morrow, at break of day, they were still three or four leagues from the coast of England. The breeze had been so light all night they had made but little progress. At ten o'clock the vessel cast anchor in the harbour of Dover, and at half-past ten D'Artagnan placed his foot on English land, crying, "'Here I am at last!' But that was not all. They must get to London. In England the post was well served. D'Artagnan and Planchette took each a post-horse, and a postillion rode before them. In a few hours they were in the capital. D'Artagnan did not know London. He did not know a word of English. But he wrote the name of Buckingham on a piece of paper, and every one pointed out to him the way to the Duke's hotel. The Duke was at Windsor hunting with the King. D'Artagnan inquired for the confidential valet of the Duke, who, having accompanied him in all his voyages, spoke French perfectly well. He told him that he came from Paris on an affair of life and death, and that he must speak with his master instantly. The confidence with which D'Artagnan spoke convinced Patrick, which was the name of this minister of the minister. He ordered two horses to be saddled, and himself went as guide to the young guardsman. As for Planchette, he had been lifted from his horse as stiff as a rush. The poor lad's strength was almost exhausted. D'Artagnan seemed iron. On their arrival at the castle they learned that Buckingham and the king were hawking in the marshes two or three leagues away. In twenty minutes they were on the spot named. Patrick soon caught the sound of his master's voice calling his falcon. "'Whom must I announce to my lord duke?' asked Patrick. "'The young man who one evening sought a quarrel with him on the Pot Neuf, opposite the Samaritaine. "'A singular introduction. You will find that it is as good as another.' Patrick galloped off, reached the duke, and announced to him in the terms directed that a messenger awaited him. Buckingham at once remembered the circumstance, and suspecting that something was going on in France of which it was necessary he should be informed, he only took the time to inquire where the messenger was, and recognizing from afar the uniform of the guards, he put his horse into a gallop, and rode straight up to D'Artagnan. 
Patrick discreetly kept in the background. "'No misfortune has happened to the Queen,' cried Buckingham, the instant he came up, throwing all his fear and love into the question. "'I believe not. Nevertheless, I believe she runs some great peril from which your grace alone can extricate her.' "'I?' cried Buckingham. "'What is it? I should be too happy to be of any service to her. Speak, speak.' "'Take this letter,' said D'Artagnan. "'This letter? From whom comes this letter?' "'From Her Majesty, as I think.' "'From Her Majesty?' said Buckingham, becoming so pale that D'Artagnan feared he would faint as he broke the seal. "'What is this rent?' said he, showing D'Artagnan a place where it had been pierced through. "'Ah!' said D'Artagnan, "'I did not see that. It was the sword of the Comte de Wards which made that hole, when he gave me a good thrust in the breast.' "'You are wounded?' asked Buckingham, as he opened the letter. "'Nothing but a scratch,' said D'Artagnan. "'Just heaven! What have I read?' cried the Duke. "'Patrick, remain here, or rather join the King, wherever he may be, and tell His Majesty that I humbly beg him to excuse me, but an affair of the greatest importance recalls me to London. Come, monsieur, come!' And both set off towards the capital at full gallop. End of chapter 20This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Clark Bell, Tucson, Arizona. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, Chapter 21, The Countess de Winter. As they rode along, the duke endeavored to draw from D'Artagnan not all that had happened, but what D'Artagnan himself knew. By adding all that he heard from the mouth of this young man, to his own remembrances, he was enabled to form a pretty exact idea of a position of the seriousness of which, for the rest, the Queen's letter, short but explicit, gave him the clue. But that which astonished him the most was that the cardinal, so deeply interested in preventing this young man from setting his foot in England, had not succeeded in arresting him on the road. It was then, upon the manifestation of this astonishment, that D'Artagnan related to him the precaution taken, and how, thanks to the devotion of his three friends, whom he had left scattered and bleeding on the road, he had succeeded in coming off with a single sword-thrust, which had pierced the Queen's letter and for which he had repaid M. de Wardes with such terrible coin. While he was listening to this recital, delivered with the greatest simplicity, the Duke looked from time to time at the young man with astonishment, as if he could not comprehend how so much prudence, courage, and devotedness could be allied with a countenance which indicated not more than twenty years. The horses went like the wind, and in a few minutes they were at the gates of London, D'Artagnan imagined that on arriving in town the Duke would slacken his pace, but it was not so. He kept on his way at the same rate, heedless about upsetting those whom he met on the road. In fact, in crossing the city two or three accidents of this kind happened, but Buckingham did not even turn his head to see what became of those he had knocked down. D'Artagnan followed him amid cries which strongly resembled curses. On entering the court of his hotel, Buckingham sprang from his horse, and without thinking what became of the animal, threw the bridle on his neck, and sprang toward the vestibule. D'Artagnan did the same, with a little more concern, however, for the noble creatures whose merits he fully appreciated. But he had the satisfaction of seeing three or four grooms run from the kitchens and the stables and busy themselves with the steeds. The duke walked so fast that D'Artagnan had some trouble in keeping up with him. He passed through several apartments, of an elegance of which even the greatest nobles of France had not even an idea, and arrived at length in a bedchamber, which was at once a miracle of taste and of richness. In the alcove of this chamber was a door, concealed in the tapestry, which the duke opened with a little gold key which he wore suspended from his neck by a chain of the same metal. With discretion D'Artagnan remained behind, but at the moment when Buckingham crossed the threshold he turned round, and seeing the hesitation of the young man, "'Come in,' cried he, "'and if you have the good fortune to be admitted to Her Majesty's presence, tell her what you have seen.' Encouraged by this invitation, D'Artagnan followed the Duke, 
who closed the door after them. The two found themselves in a small chapel, covered with a tapestry of Persian silk, worked with gold, and brilliantly lighted with a vast number of candles. Over a species of altar, and beneath a canopy of blue velvet, surmounted by white and red plumes, was a full-length portrait of Anne of Austria. So perfect in its resemblance, that D'Artagnan uttered a cry of surprise on beholding it. One might believe the queen was about to speak. On the altar, and beneath the portrait, was the casket containing the diamond studs. The duke approached the altar, knelt as a priest might have done before a crucifix, and opened the casket. There, said he, drawing from the casket a large bow of blue ribbon all sparkling with diamonds, there are the precious studs which I have taken an oath should be buried with me. The queen gave them to me. The queen requires them again. Her will be done like that of God in all things. Then he began to kiss, one after another, those dear studs with which he was about to part. All at once he uttered a terrible cry. "'What is the matter?' exclaimed D'Artagnan anxiously. "'What has happened to you, my lord?' "'All is lost,' cried Buckingham, becoming as pale as a corpse. Two of the studs are wanting. There are only ten. "'Can you have lost them, my lord? Or do you think they have been stolen?' They have been stolen, replied the duke, and it is the cardinal who has dealt this blow. Hold, see, the ribbons which held them have been cut with scissors. If my lord suspects they have been stolen, perhaps the person who stole them still has them in his hands. Wait, wait, said the duke. The only time I have worn these studs was at a ball given by the king eight days ago at Windsor. The countess de Winter, with whom I had quarreled, became reconciled to me at that ball. That reconciliation was nothing but the vengeance of a jealous woman. I have never seen her from that day. The woman is an agent of the cardinal. He has agents, then, throughout the world, cried D'Artagnan. Oh, yes, said Buckingham, grating his teeth with rage. Yes, he is a terrible antagonist. But when is this ball to take place? Monday next. Monday next. Still five days before us. That's more time than we want. "'Patrick!' cried the Duke, opening the door to the chapel. "'Patrick!' his confidential valet appeared. "'My jeweller and my secretary!' The valet went out with a mute promptitude which showed him accustomed to obey blindly and without reply. But although the jeweller had been mentioned first, it was the secretary who first made his appearance. That was simply because he lived in the hotel. He found Buckingham seated at a table in his bedchamber, writing orders with his own hand. Mr. Jackson, said he, go instantly to the Lord Chancellor, and tell him that I charge him with the execution of these orders. I wish them to be promulgated immediately. But, my Lord, if the Lord Chancellor interrogates me upon the motives which may have led your grace to adopt such an extraordinary measure, what shall I reply? That such is my pleasure, and that I will answer for my will to no man. Will that be the answer, replied the secretary, smiling, which he must transmit to his majesty, if by chance his majesty should have the curiosity to know why no vessel is to leave any of the ports of Great Britain? You are right, Mr. Jackson, replied Buckingham. He will say in that case to the king that I am determined on war, and that this measure is my first act of hostility against France. The secretary bowed and retired. "'We are safe on that side,' said Buckingham, turning toward D'Artagnan. "'If the studs are not yet gone to Paris, they will not arrive till after you.' "'How so?' "'I have just placed an embargo on all vessels at present in His Majesty's ports, and without particular permission not one dare lift an anchor.' D'Artagnan looked with stupefaction at a man who thus employed the unlimited power with which he was clothed by the confidence of a king in the prosecution of his intrigues. Buckingham saw by the expression of the young man's face what was passing in his mind, and he smiled. Yes, said he, yes, Anne of Austria is my true queen. Upon a word from her I would betray my country. I would betray my king. I would betray my God. She asked me not to send the Protestants of La Rochelle the assistance I promised them. 
I have not done so. I broke my word, it is true, but what signifies that? I obeyed my love. And have I not been richly paid for that obedience? It was to that obedience I owe her portrait. D'Artagnan was amazed to note by what fragile and unknown threads the destinies of nations and the lives of men are suspended. He was lost in these reflections when the goldsmith entered. He was an Irishman, one of the most skillful of his craft, and who himself confessed that he gained a hundred thousand livres a year by the Duke of Buckingham. Mr. O'Reilly, said the Duke, leading him into the chapel, look at these diamond studs and tell me what they are worth apiece. The goldsmith cast a glance at the elegant manner in which they were set, calculated one with another what the diamonds were worth, and without hesitation said, Fifteen hundred pistolas each, my lord. How many days would it require to make two studs exactly like them? You see there are two wanting. Eight days, my lord. I will give you three thousand pistolas apiece if I can have them by the day after tomorrow. My lord, they shall be yours. You are a jewel of a man, Mr. O'Reilly, but that is not all. These studs cannot be trusted to anybody. It must be done in the palace. Uh, impossible, my lord. There is no one but myself can so execute them that one cannot tell the new from the old. Therefore, my dear Mr. O'Reilly, you are my prisoner, and if you wish ever to leave my palace, you cannot. So make the best of it. Name to me such of your workmen as you need, and point out the tools they must bring. The goldsmith knew the duke. He knew all objection would be useless, and instantly determined how to act. "'May I be permitted to inform my wife?' said he. "'Oh, you may even see her, if you like, my dear Mr. O'Reilly. Your captivity shall be mild, be assured, and as every inconvenience deserves its indemnification, here is, in addition to the price of the studs, an order for a thousand pistolas to make you forget the annoyance I cause you. D'Artagnan could not get over the surprise created in him by this minister, who thus open-handed sported with men and millions. As to the goldsmith, he wrote to his wife, sending her the order for the thousand pistolas, and charged her to send him, in exchange, his most skillful apprentice, an assortment of diamonds, of which he gave the names and the weights, and the necessary tools. Buckingham conducted the goldsmith to the chamber destined for him, and which at the end of a half-hour was transformed into a workshop. Then he placed a sentinel at each door with an order to admit nobody upon any pretense but his valet de chambre, Patrick. We need not add that the goldsmith, O'Reilly, and his assistant were prohibited from going out under any pretext. This point settled, the duke turned to D'Artagnan. Now, my young friend, said he, England is all our own. What do you wish for? What do you desire? A bed, my lord, replied D'Artagnan. At present, I confess, that is the thing I stand most in need of. Buckingham gave D'Artagnan a chamber adjoining his own. He wished to have the young man at hand, not that he at all mistrusted him, but for the sake of having someone to whom he could constantly talk of the queen. In one hour after, the ordinance was published in London that no vessel bound for France should leave port, not even the packet-boat with letters. In the eyes of everyone, this was a declaration of war between the two kingdoms. On the day after the morrow, by eleven o'clock, the two diamond studs were finished, and they were so completely imitated, so perfectly alike, that Buckingham could not tell the new ones from the old ones, and experts in such matters would have been deceived as he was. He immediately called D'Artagnan. Here, said he to him, are the diamond studs that you came to bring, and be my witness that I have done all that human power could do. Be satisfied, my lord. I will tell all that I have seen. But does your grace mean to give me the studs without the casket? The casket would encumber you. Besides, the casket is the more precious from being all that is left to me. You will say that I keep it. I will perform your commission, word for word, my lord. And now, resumed Buckingham, looking earnestly at the young man, how shall I ever acquit myself of the debt I owe you? D'Artagnan blushed up to the whites of his eyes. 
he saw that the duke was searching for a means of making him accept something, and the idea that the blood of his friends and himself was about to be paid for with English gold was strangely repugnant to him. "'Let us understand each other, my lord,' replied D'Artagnan, "'and let us make things clear beforehand, in order that there may be no mistake. "'I am in the service of the King and Queen of France, "'and form part of the company of Monsieur de Cessart, "'who, as well as his brother-in-law, Monsieur de Treville, "'is particularly attached to their majesties. "'What I have done, then, has been for the Queen, "'and not at all for your grace.' And still further, it is very probable I should not have done anything of this if it had not been to make myself agreeable to someone who is my lady, as the queen is yours. Yes, said the duke, smiling, and I even believe that I know that other person. It is— My lord, I have not named her, interrupted the young man warmly. That is true, said the duke, and it is to this person I am bound to discharge my debt of gratitude. You have said, my lord, for truly at this moment, when there is question of war, I confess to you that I see nothing in your grace but an Englishman, and consequently an enemy, whom I should have much greater pleasure in meeting on the field of battle than in the park at Windsor or the corridors of the Louvre, all which, however, will not prevent me from executing, to the very point, my commission, or from laying down my life, if there be need of it, to accomplish it. But I repeat it to your grace, without your having personally on that account more to thank me for in this second interview than for what I did for you in the first. We say, proud as a Scotsman, murmured the Duke of Buckingham. And we say, proud as a Gascon, replied D'Artagnan. The Gascons are the Scots of France. D'Artagnan bowed to the Duke and was retiring. Well, are you going away in that manner? Where? And how? That's true. For gad, these Frenchmen have no consideration. I had forgotten that England was an island and that you were the king of it. Go to the riverside. Ask for the brig Sund, and give this letter to your captain. He will convey you to a little port where certainly you are not expected, and which is ordinarily only frequented by fishermen. The name of that port? St. Valery. But listen, when you have arrived there, you will go to a mean tavern, without a name and without a sign, a mere fisherman's hut. You cannot be mistaken, there is but one. Afterward? You will ask for the host, and will repeat to him the word, Forward. Which means? In French, en avant. It is the password. He will give you a horse, all saddled, and will point out to you the road you ought to take. You will find, in the same way, four relays on your route. If you will give at each of these relays your address in Paris, the four horses will follow you thither. You already know two of them, and you appeared to appreciate them like a judge. They were those we rode on and you may rely upon me for the others not being inferior to them. These horses are equipped for the field. However proud you may be, you will not refuse to accept one of them, and to request your three companions to accept the others. That is, in order to make war against us. Besides, the end justifies the means, as you Frenchmen say, does it not? Yes, my lord, I accept them, said D'Artagnan. And if it please God, we will make good use of your presence. Well, now your hand, young man. Perhaps we shall soon meet on the field of battle. But in the meantime, we shall part good friends, I hope. Yes, my lord, but with the hope of soon becoming enemies. Be satisfied. I promise you that. I depend upon your word, my lord. D'Artagnan bowed to the duke and made his way as quickly as possible to the riverside. Opposite the Tower of London he found the vessel that had been named to him, delivered his letter to the captain, who, after having it examined by the governor of the port, made immediate preparations to sail. Fifty vessels were waiting to set out, 
Passing alongside one of them, D'Artagnan fancied he perceived on board it the woman of Meung, the same whom the unknown gentleman had called Milady, and whom D'Artagnan had thought so handsome. But thanks to the current of the stream and a fair wind, his vessel passed so quickly that he had little more than a glimpse of her. The next day, about nine o'clock in the morning, he landed at St. Valery. D'Artagnan went instantly in search of the inn, and easily discovered it by the riotous noise which resounded from it. War between England and France was talked of as near, and certain, and the jolly sailors were having a carousal. D'Artagnan made his way through the crowd, advanced toward the host, and pronounced the word, Forward. The host instantly made him a sign to follow, went out with him by a door which opened into a yard, led him to the stable where a saddled horse awaited him, and asked him if he stood in need of anything else. "'I want to know the route I am to follow,' said D'Artagnan. "'Go from hence to Blangy, and from Blangy to Neuchâtel. At Neuchâtel go to the tavern of the Golden Harrow. Give the password to the landlord, and you will find, as you have here, a horse ready saddled.' "'Have I anything to pay?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'Everything is paid,' replied the host, and liberally. "'Be gone, and may God guide you.' "'Amen!' cried the young man, and set off at full gallop. Four hours later he was in Neufchatel. He strictly followed the instructions he had received. At Neufchatel, as at St. Valery, he found a horse quite ready and awaiting him. He was about to remove the pistols from the saddle he had quit to the one he was about to fill, but he found the holsters furnished with similar pistols. Your address at Paris? Hotel of the Guards, Company of Dessessart. Enough, replied the questioner. Which route must I take? demanded D'Artagnan in his turn. That of Rouen, but you will leave the city on your right. You must stop at the little village of Equi, in which there is but one tavern, the Shield of France. Don't condemn it from appearances. You will find a horse in the stables quite as good as this. The same password? Exactly. Adieu, master. A good journey, gentlemen. Do you want anything? D'Artagnan shook his head and set off at full speed. At Equi the same scene was repeated. He found as provident a host and a fresh horse. He left his address as he had done before and set off again at the same pace for Pontoise. At Pontoise he changed his horse for the last time and at nine o'clock galloped into the yard of Treville's hotel. He had made nearly sixty leagues in little more than twelve hours. Monsieur de Treville received him as if he had seen him that same morning, only, when pressing his hand a little more warmly than usual, he informed him that the company of Dessessart was on duty at the Louvre, and that he might repair at once to his post. End of chapter 21